Section 14 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Yearsley. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition, by Catherine Routledge. Chapter 13. Prehistoric Remains, Ahu, or Burial Places. In many places it is possible, in the light of great monuments, to reconstruct the past. In Easter Island the past is the present. It is impossible to escape from it. The inhabitants of today are less real than the men who have gone. The shadows of the departed builders still possess the land. Voluntarily or involuntarily, the sojourner must hold commune with those old workers, for the whole air vibrates with a vast purpose and energy, which has been and is no more. What was it? Why was it? The great works are now in ruins. Of many, comparatively little remains, but the impression infinitely exceeded anything which had been anticipated, and every day, as the power to see increased, brought with it a greater sense of wonder and marvel. "'If we were to tell people at home these things,' said our sailing-master, after being shown the prostrate images on the great burial-place of Tongariki, they would not believe us. The present natives take little interest in the remains. The statues are to them facts of everyday life in much the same way as stones or banana trees. "'Have you no moai?' as they are termed, in England, was asked by one boy, in a tone in which surprise was slightly mingled with contempt. To ask for the history of the great works is as successful as to try to get from an old woman selling bootlaces at Westminster the story of Cromwell, or of the frock-coated worthies in Parliament Square. The information given in reply to questions is generally wildly mythical, and any real knowledge crops up only indirectly. Anyone who is able to go to the British Museum can see a typical specimen of an Easter Island statue in the large image which greets the approaching visitor from under the portico. The general form is unvarying, and with one exception, which will be alluded to hereafter, all appear to be the work of skilled hands, which suggests that the design was well known and evolved under other conditions. It represents a half-length figure, at the bottom of which the hands nearly meet in front of the body. The most remarkable features are the ears, of which the lobe is depicted to represent a fleshy rope, while in a few cases the disc which was worn in it is also indicated. The fashion of piercing and distending the lobe of the ear is found among various primitive races. The tallest statues are over thirty feet, a few are only six feet, and even smaller specimens exist. Those which stood on the burial places, now to be described, are usually from twelve to twenty feet in height, and were surmounted with a form of hat. Position and Number of Ahu In Easter Island the problem of the disposal of the dead was solved by neither earth burial nor cremation but by means of the omnipresent stones, which were built up to make a last resting place for the departed. Such burial places are known as Ahu, and the name will henceforth be used, for it signifies a definite thing, or rather type of thing, for which we have no equivalent. They number in all some two hundred and sixty, and are principally found near the coast, but some thirty exist inland sufficient to show that their erection on the seaboard was a matter of convenience, not of principle. With the exception of the great eastern and western headlands, where they are scarce, it is probably safe to say that in riding round the island it is impossible to go anywhere for more than a few hundred yards without coming across one of these abodes of the dead. They cluster most thickly on the little coves and their enclosing promontories which were the principal centres of population. Some are two or three hundred yards away from the edge of the cliff, others stand on the verge. In the lower land they are but little above the sea level, while on the precipitous part of the coast the ocean breaks hundreds of feet below. 
It was these burial places, on which the images were then standing, which so strongly impressed the early voyagers, and whose age and origin have remained an unsolved problem. During the whole of our time on the island we worked on the Ahu as way opened. Those which happened to lie near to either of our camps were naturally easy of access, but to reach the more distant ones, notably those on the north shore, involved a long expedition. Such a day began with perhaps an hour's ride. At noon there was an interval for luncheon, when, in hot weather, the neighbourhood was scoured for miles to find the smallest atom of shade, and the day ended with a journey home of not less than two hours, during which an anxious eye was kept on the sinking sun. The usual method, as each ahu was reached, was for S to dismount, measure it, and describe it, while I sat on my pony and scribbled down notes. But in some manner or other, every part of the coast was, by one or both of us, ridden over several times, and a written statement made of the size, kind, condition, and name of each monument. Unfortunately, there is in existence no large-scale plan of the coast, a need we had to supply as best we could. Map of Easter Island there is none, only the crude chart. The efforts of our own surveyor were limited, by the time at his disposal, to making detailed plans of a few of the principal spots. The want is to be regretted geographically, but it does not materially affect the archaeological result. We were always accompanied by native guides in order to learn local names and traditions, and it was soon found necessary to make a point of these being old men, owing to the concentration of the remains of the population in one district. All names elsewhere, except those of the most important places, are speedily being forgotten. The memories of even the older men were sometimes shaky, and to get reasonably complete and accurate information, the whole of a district had, in more than one case, to be gone over again with a second ancient, who turned out to have lived in the neighbourhood in his youth, and hence to be a better authority. Original Design and Construction of Image Ahu The burial places are not all of one type, nor all constructed to carry statues. Some, also, are known to have been built comparatively recently, and will therefore be described under a later section. The image ahu are, however, all prehistoric. They number just under a hundred, or over one-third of the whole. The figures connected with them, of which traces still remain, were counted as 231, but as many are in fragments, this number is uncertain. A typical image ahu is composed of a long wall running parallel with the sea, which in a large specimen is as much as fifteen feet in height and three hundred feet in length. It is buttressed on the land side with a great slope of masonry. The wall is in three divisions. The main or central portion projects in the form of a terrace on which the images stood with their backs to the sea. It is therefore broad enough to carry their oval bed plates. These measure up to about ten feet in length by eight feet or nine feet in width and are flush with the top of the wall. On the great ahu of Tongariki there have been fifteen statues, but sometimes an ahu has carried one figure only. The wall which forms the landward side of the terrace is continued on either hand in a straight line, thus adding a wing at each end of the central portion, which stands somewhat farther back from the sea. Images were sometimes placed on the wings, but it was not usual. From this continuous wall the masonry slopes steeply till it reaches a containing wall some three feet high, formed of finely wrought slabs of great size and of peculiar shape. The workmanship put into this wall is usually the most highly finished of any part of the Ahu. Extending inland from the foot of this low wall is a large, raised and smoothly paved expanse. The upper surface of this, too, has an appreciable fall or slope inland, though it is almost horizontal when compared with the glacis. 
By the method of construction of this area, vault accommodation is obtained between its surface pavement and the sheet of volcanic rock below, on which the hole rests. In the largest specimen, the whole slope of masonry, measured, that is, from either the sea wall of the wing or from the landward wall of the terrace to its farthest extent, is about 250 feet. Beyond this, the ground is sometimes levelled for another 50 or 60 yards, forming a smooth sward which much enhanced the appearance of the ahu. In two cases, the ahu is approached by a strip of narrow pavement formed of water-worn boulders laid flat and bordered with the same kind of stone set on end. One of these pavements is 220 feet in length by 12 feet in width. The other is somewhat smaller. The general principle on which the sea or main walls are constructed is usually the same, though the various ahu differ greatly in appearance. First comes a row of foundation blocks, on which have been set upright the largest stones that could be found. The upper part of the wall is composed of smaller stones, and it is finished with a coping. The variety in effect is due to the difference in material used. In some cases, as at Tongariki, the most convenient stone available has consisted of basalt, which has cooled in fairly regular cubes, and the rows are there comparatively uniform in size. In other instances, as at Ahu Tepe, on the west coast, the handiest material has been sheets of lava, which have hardened as strata, and when these have been used, the first tier of the wall is composed of huge slabs up to nine feet in height. Irregularities in the shape and size of the big stones are rectified by fitting in small pieces and surmounting the shorter slabs with additional stones until the whole is brought to a uniform level. On the top of this now even tier, horizontal blocks are laid till the whole is the desired height. The amount of finish put into the work varies greatly. In many ahu, the walls are all constructed of rough material. In others, while the slabs are untouched, the stones which bring them to the level and the cubes on the top are well wrought. In a very few instances, of which Vinapu is the best example, the whole is composed of beautifully finished work. Occasionally, as at Oroi, natural outcrops of rock have been adapted to carry statues. The study of the Ahu is simplified by the fact that they were being used in living memory for the purpose for which they were doubtless originally built. They have been termed burial places, but burial in its usual sense was not the only, nor in most cases their principal, object. On death, the corpse was wrapped in a tapa blanket and enclosed in its mattress of reeds. Fish hooks, chisels, and other objects were sometimes included. It was then bound into a bundle and carried on staves to the ahu, where it was exposed on an oblong framework. This consisted of four corner uprights set up in the ground, the upper extremities of which were Y-shaped. Two transverse bars rested in the bifurcated ends, one at the head, the other at the foot, and on these transverse bars were placed the extremities of the bundle which wrapped the corpse. The description and sketch are based on a model framework, and a wrapped-up figure, one of the wooden images of the island, prepared by the natives to amplify their verbal description. At times, instead of the four supports, two stones were used with a hole in each, into which a Y-shaped stick was placed. While the corpse remained on the ahu, the district was marked off by the pera, or taboo, for the dead. No fishing was allowed near, and fires and cooking were forbidden within certain marks. The smoke, at any rate, must be hidden or smothered with grass. Watch was kept by four relatives, and anyone breaking the regulations was liable to be brained. The mourning might last one, two, or even three years, by which time the whole thing had, of course, fallen to pieces. The bones were either left on the ahu, or collected and put into vaults of oblong shape, which were kept for the family, or they might be buried elsewhere. The end of the morning was celebrated by a great feast, after which ceremony, as one recorder cheerfully concluded, Papa was finished.
Looked at from the landward side, we may therefore conceive an ahu as a vast theatre stage, of which the floor runs gradually upwards from the footlights. The back of the stage, which is thus the highest part, is occupied by a great terrace, on which are set up in line the great images, each one well separated from his neighbour, and all facing the spectator. Irrespective of where he stands, he will ever see them towering above him, clear cut out against a turquoise sky. In front of them are the remains of the departed. Unseen on the farther side of the terrace is the sea. The stone giants and the faithful dead over whom they watch are never without music, as countless waves launch their strength against the pebbled shore, showering on the figures a cloud of mist and spray. Reconstruction and Transformation Those which have been described are ideal image ahu, but not one now remains in its original condition. It is by no means unusual to find, even in the oldest parts now existing, that is, in walls erected to carry statues, pieces of still older images built into the stonework. In one case, a whole statue has been used as a slab for the sea wall, showing that alteration has taken place even when the cult was alive. Again, a considerable number of ahu, some thirteen in all, after being destroyed, and terminating their career as image terraces, have been rebuilt after the fashion of others, constructed originally on a different plan. This is a type for which no name was found. It is, in form, that of a semi-pyramid, and there are between fifty and sixty on the island, in addition to those which have been in the first place, image ahu. A few are comparatively well made, but most are very rough. They resemble a pyramid cut in two, so that the section forms a triangle. This triangle is the sea wall. The flanking buttress on the land side is made of stones, and is widest at the apex or highest point, gradually diminishing to the angles or extremities. The greatest height, in the centre, varies from about five feet to twelve feet, and a large specimen may extend in length from one hundred feet to one hundred and sixty feet. They contain vaults. In a few instances, they are ornamented by broken pieces of image stone, and occasionally by a row of small cairns along the top, which recall the position of the statues on the image platform. For these, no very certain reason was forthcoming. They were varyingly reported to be signs of pera, or as marking the respective right of families on the ahu. As image terraces may be found reconstructed as pyramid ahu, the latter form of building must have been carried on longer than the former, and probably till recent times. But there is nothing to show whether or not the earliest specimens of pyramid ahu are contemporary with the great works, or even earlier. Overthrow of the Images and Destruction of the Ahu The only piece of a statue which still remains on its bed plate is the fragment already alluded to at Tongariki. In the best preserved specimens, the figures lie on their faces like a row of huge nine-pins. Some are intact, but many are broken, the cleavage having generally occurred when the falling image has come into contact with the containing wall at the lower level. The curious way in which the heads have not infrequently turned a somersault while falling, and now lie face uppermost, is shown in the eighth figure from the western end on Tongariki Ahu. No one now living remembers a statue standing on an Ahu, and legend, though not of a very impressive character, has already arisen to account for the fall of some of them. An old man arrived, it is said, in the neighbourhood of Tongariki, and as he was unable to speak, he made known by means of signs that he wished for chicken heads to eat. These were not forthcoming. He slept, however, in one of the houses there, and during the night his hosts were aroused by a great noise, which he gave it to be understood was made by his feet tapping against the stone foundations of the house. In the morning it was found that the statues on the great Ahu had all fallen. It was the revenge of the old man. 
such law is however mixed up with more tangible statements to the effect that the figures were overthrown in tribal warfare by means of a rope or by taking away the small stones from underneath the bed plates and thus causing them to fall forward that the latter method had been used had been concluded independently by studying the remains themselves it will be seen later that other statues which have been set up in earth were deliberately dug out and it seems unnecessary to look as some have done to an earthquake to account for their collapse moreover the conclusion that the images owed their fall to deliberate vandalism during internecine warfare is confirmed by knowledge which still survives connected with the destruction of the last one this image stood alone on an ahu on the north coast called paro and is the tallest known to have been put up on a terrace being thirty-two feet in height the events occurred just before living memory and like most stories in east island it is connected with cannibalism a woman of the western clans was eaten by men of the eastern her son managed to trap thirty of the enemy in a cave and consumed them in revenge and during the ensuing struggle this image was thrown down the oldest man living when we were on the island said that he was an infant at the time and another a few years younger stated that his father as a boy helped his grandfather in the fight it is not after all only in easter island that pleasure has been taken during wartime in destroying the architectural treasures of the enemy while therefore the date of the erection of the earliest image ahu is lost in the mists of antiquity nor are we yet in a position to say when the building stopped we can give approximately the time of the overthrow of the images we know from the accounts of the early voyagers that the statues or the greater number of them were still in place in the eighteenth century by the early part of the middle of the nineteenth century not one was standing the destruction of the ahu has continued in more modern days a manager whose sheep had found the fresh water springs below high water thinking they were injuring themselves by drinking from the sea erected a wall round a large part of the coast to keep them from it for this wall the ahu came in of course most conveniently it was run through a great number and their material used for its construction one wing of tongariki has been pulled down to form an enclosure for the livestock in addition to the damage wrought by man the ocean is ever encroaching in some cases part of an ahu has already fallen into the sea and more is preparing to follow statues may be found lying on their backs in process of descending into the waves one row of images on the extreme western edge of the crater of rano kao which were visible although inaccessible at the time of the visit of the u s a ship mohican in eighteen eighty six are now lying on the shore a thousand feet below as the result of these various causes the burial places of easter island are as has been seen all in ruins and many are scarcely recognizable only their huge stones and prostrate figures show what they must once have been End of section 14section fifteen of the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by peter yearsley the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition by catherine routledge prehistoric remains statues and crowns part one strange as it may appear it is by no means easy to obtain a complete view of a statue on the island most of the images which were formerly on the ahu lie on their faces many are broken and detail has largely been destroyed by weather happily we are not dependent for our knowledge of the images on such information as we can gather from the ruins on the ahu but are able to trace them to their origin 
though even here excavation is necessary to see the entire figure. Ranu Raraku is, as has already been explained, a volcanic cone containing a crater lake. It resembles, to use an unromantic simile, one of the china drinking vessels dedicated to the use of dogs, whose base is larger than their brim. Its sides are, for the most part, smooth and sloping, and several carriages could drive abreast on the northern rim of the crater. But towards the southeast it rises in height, and from this aspect it looks as if the circular mass had been sliced down with a giant knife, forming it into a precipitous cliff. The cliff is lowest where the imaginary knife has come nearest to the central lake, thus causing the two ends to stand out as the peaks already mentioned. The mountain is composed of compressed volcanic ash, which has been found in certain places to be particularly suitable for quarrying. It has been worked on the southern exterior slope, and also inside the crater on both the south and southeastern sides. With perhaps a dozen exceptions, the whole of the images in the island have been made from it, and they have been dragged from this point uphill and down dale to adorn the terraces round the coastline of the island. Even the images on the Ahu, which have fallen into the sea on the further extremity of the western volcano, are said to have been of the same stone. It is conspicuous in being a reddish-brown colour, of which the smallest chips can be easily recognised. It is composite in character, and embedded in the ash are numerous lapilli of metamorphic rock. Owing to the nature of this rock, the earliest European visitors came to the conclusion that the material was factitious, and that the statues were built of clay and stones. It was curious to find that the marooned prisoners of war of our own time fell into the same mistake of thinking that the figures were made up. The workable belt, generally speaking, forms a horizontal section about halfway up the side of the mountain. Below it, both on the exterior and within the crater, are banks of detritus, and on these statues have been set up. Most of them are still in place, but they have been buried in greater or less degree by the descent of earth from above. Mr. Ritchie made a survey of the mountain with the adjacent coast, but it was found impossible to record the results of our work without some sort of plan or diagram which was large enough to show every individual image. This was accomplished by first studying each quarry, notebook in hand, and then, with the aid of field glasses, amalgamating the results from below, the standing statues being inserted in their relation to the quarries above. It was a lengthy but enjoyable undertaking. Part of the diagram of the exterior has been redrawn with the help of photographs. The plan of the inside of the crater is shown in what is practically its original form. Quarries of Rano Raruku Leaving on one side for the moment the figures on the lower slope, let us in imagination scramble up the grassy side, a steep climb of some one or two hundred feet, to where the rock has been hewn away into a series of chambers and ledges. Here, images lie by the score in all stages of evolution, just as they were left when, for some unknown reason, the workmen laid down their tools for the last time, and the busy scene was still. Here, as elsewhere, the wonder of the place can only be appreciated as the eye becomes trained to see. In the majority of cases, the statues still form part of the rock, and are frequently covered with lichen or overgrown with grass and ferns, and even in the illustrations, for which prominent figures have naturally been chosen, the reader may find that he has to look more than once in order to recognize the form. A conspicuous one first strikes the beholder. As he gazes, he finds with surprise that the walls on either hand are themselves being wrought into figures, and that, resting in a niche above him, is another giant. He looks down, and realizes with a start that his foot is resting on a mighty face. To the end of our visit, we occasionally found a figure which had escaped observation. The workings on the exterior of Raraku first attract attention. 
Here, their size, and incidentally that of many of the statues, has largely been determined by fissures in the hillside, which run vertically and at distances of perhaps forty feet. The quarries have been worked differently, and each has a character of its own. In some of them, the principal figures lie in steps, with their length parallel to the hill's horizontal axis. One of this type is reached through a narrow opening in the rock, and recalls the side chapel of some old cathedral, save that nature's blue sky forms the only roof. Immediately opposite the doorway there lies, on a base of rock, in quiet majesty, a great recumbent figure. So like is it to some ancient effigy that the awed spectator involuntarily catches his breath as if suddenly brought face to face with a tomb of the mighty dead. Once, on a visit to this spot, a rather quaint little touch of nature supervened. Going there early in the morning, with the sunlight still sparkling on the floor of dewy grass, a wild cat, startled by our approach, rushed away from the rock above, and the natives, clambering up, found nestling beneath a statue at a high level a little family of blind kittens. In other instances, the images have been carved lying not horizontally but vertically with sometimes the head and sometimes the base towards the summit of the hill but no exact system has been followed the figures are found in all places and all positions when there was a suitable piece of rock it has been carved into a statue without any special regard to surroundings or direction interspersed with embryo and completed images are empty niches from which others have already been removed, and finished statues must, in some cases, have been passed out over the top of those still in course of construction. From all the outside quarries is seen the same wonderful panorama. Immediately beneath are the statues which stand on the lower slopes. Farther still lie the prostrate ones beside the approach, while beyond is the whole stretch of the southern plain with its white line of breaking surf ending in the western mountains of Rano Kao. The quarries within the crater are on the same lines as those without, save that those on the southeastern side form a more continuous whole. Here the most striking position is on the top of the seaward cliff, in the centre of which is a large finished image. On one side the ground falls away more or less steeply to the crater lake, on the other, a stone thrown down would reach the foot of the precipice. The view extends from sea to sea. Over all, the most absolute stillness reigns. The statues in the quarries number altogether over 150. Amongst this mass of material, there is no difficulty in tracing the course of the work. The surface of the rock, which will form the figure, has generally been laid bare before work upon it began, but occasionally the image was wrought lying partially under a canopy. In a few cases the stone has been roughed out into preliminary blocks, but this procedure is not universal, and seems to have been followed only when there was some doubt as to the quality of the material. When this was not the case, the face and anterior aspect of the statue were first carved, and the block gradually became isolated as the material was removed in forming the head, base, and sides. A gutter or alleyway was thus made round the image, in which the niches where each man had stood or squatted to his work can be clearly seen. It is therefore possible to count how many were at work at each side of a figure. When the front and sides were completed, down to every detail of the hands, the undercutting commenced. The rock beneath was chipped away by degrees till the statue rested only on a narrow strip of stone running along the spine. Those which have been left at this stage resemble precisely a boat on its keel, the back being curved in the same way as a ship's bottom. In the next stage shown, the figure is completely detached from the rock and chocked up by stones, looking as if an inadvertent touch would send it sliding down the hill into the plain below. In one instance the moving has evidently begun. 
the image having been shifted out of the strait. In another very interesting case, the work has been abandoned when the statue was in the middle of its descent. It has been carved in a horizontal position in the highest part of the quarry, where its empty niche is visible. It has then been slewed round, and was being launched, base forward, across some other empty niches at a lower level. The bottom now rests on the floor of the quarry, and the figure, which has broken in half, is supported in a standing fashion against the outer edge of the vacated shelves. The first impression was that it had met with an accident in transit and been abandoned, but it is at least equally possible that for the purpose of bringing it down a bank or causeway of earth had been built up to level the inequalities of the descent, and that it was resting on this when the work came to an end. The soil would then in time be washed away, and the figure fracture through loss of support. In the quarry which is shown in figure 54, the finished head can be seen lying across the opening. The body is missing, presumably broken off and buried. The bottom of the keel on which the figure at one time rested can be clearly traced in a projecting line of rock down the middle of its old bed. Also, the different sections where the various men employed have chipped away the stone in undermining the statue. In the quarry wall, the niches occupied by the sculptors are also visible at more than one level, the higher ones being discarded when the upper portion of the work was finished and a lower station needed. The hand of the standing boy in figure 51 rests on a small platform similarly abandoned. The tools were found with which the work has been done. One type of these can be seen lying about in great abundance. They are of the same material as the lipilli in the statues and made by flaking. Some specimens are pointed at both ends, others have one end more or less rounded. It is unlikely that they were hafted, and they were probably held in the hand when in use. They were apparently discarded as soon as the point became damaged. There is another tool much more carefully made, an adze blade, with the lower end beveled off to form the cutting edge. In the specimen shown, the top is much abraded, apparently from hammering, with a maul or mallet. These are rarely found, the probability being that they were too precious to leave, and were taken home by the workmen. The whole process was not necessarily very lengthy. A calculation of the number of men who could work at the stone at the same time, and the amount each could accomplish, gave the rather surprising result that a statue might be roughed out within the space of fifteen days. The most notable part of the work was the skill which kept the figure so perfect in design and balance that it was subsequently able to maintain its equilibrium in a standing position. To this it is difficult to pay too high a tribute. It remains to account for the vast number of images to be found in the quarry. A certain number have, no doubt, been abandoned prior to the general cessation of the work. In some cases a flaw has been found in the rock, and the original plan has had to be given up. In this case, part of the stone is sometimes used for either a smaller image, or one cut at a different angle. In other instances, the sculptors have been unlucky enough to come across, at important points, one or more of the hard nodules with which their tools could not deal and as the work could not go down to posterity with a large wart on its nose or excrescence on its chin it has had to be stopped but when all these instances have been subtracted the amount of figures remaining in the quarries is still startlingly large when compared with the number which have been taken out of it and must have necessitated if they were all in hand at once a number of workers out of all proportion to any population which the island has ever been likely to have maintained. The theory naturally suggests itself that some were merely rock carvings, and not intended to be removed. It is one which needs to be adopted with caution, for more than once, where every appearance has pointed to its being correct, a similar neighbour has been found which was actually being removed. On the whole, however, there can be little doubt that it is, at any rate, a partial solution of the problem. 
some of the images are little more than embossed carvings on the face of the rock without surrounding alleyways in one instance inside the crater a piece of rock which has been left standing on the very summit of the cliff has been utilized in such a way that the figure lies on its side while its back is formed by the outward precipice this is contrary to all usual methods and it seems improbable that it was intended to make it into a standing statue perhaps the strongest evidence is afforded by the size of some of the statues the largest is sixty-six feet in length whereas thirty-six feet is the extreme ever found outside the quarry tradition it is true points out the ahu on the south coast for which this monster was designed but it is difficult to believe it was ever intended to move such a mass if this theory is correct it would be interesting to know whether the stage of carving came first and that of removal followed as the workmen became more expert or whether it was the result of decadence when labor may have become scarce it is of course possible that the two methods proceeded concurrently rock carvings being within the means of those who could not procure the labour necessary to move the statue legendary law throws no light on these matters nor on the reasons which led to the desertion of this labyrinth of work it has invented a story which entirely satisfies the native mind and is repeated on every occasion there was a certain old woman who lived at the southern corner of the mountain and filled the position of cook to the image-makers she was the most important person of the establishment and moved the images by supernatural power mana ordering them about at her will one day when she was away the workers obtained a fine lobster which had been caught on the west coast and ate it up leaving none for her unfortunately they forgot to conceal the remains and when the cook returned and found how she had been treated she arose in her wrath told all the images to fall down and thus brought the work to a standstill standing statues of rano raraku descending from the quarries we turn to the figures below a few at the foot of the mountain have obviously been thrown down one of these was wrecked in the same conflict as the one on ahuparo and one is shown where an attempt has been made to cut off the head another series of images have originally stood round the base on level ground extending from the exterior of the entrance to the crater to the southern corner these are all prostrate on the slopes there are a few horizontal statues but the great majority both inside the crater and without are still erect outside some forty figures stand in an irregular belt reaching from the corner nearest the sea to about halfway to the gap leading into the crater the bottom of the mountain is here diversified by little hillocks and depressions these hillocks would have made commanding situations but rather curiously the statues while erected quite close to them and even on their sides are never on the top inside the crater where some twenty statues are still erect the arrangement is rather more regular but on the whole they are put up in no apparent order all stood with their backs to the mountain they vary very considerably in size the tallest which could be measured from its base was thirty-two feet three inches while the others are not much above eleven feet every statue is buried in greater or less degree but while some are exposed as far as the elbow in others only a portion of the top of the head can be seen above the surface others no doubt are covered entirely the number visible must vary from time to time as by the movement of the earth some are buried and others disclosed an old man whose testimony was generally reliable stated when speaking of the figures on the outside of the mountain that while those nearer the sea were in the same condition as he always remembered them those farther from it were now more deeply buried than in his youth various old people were brought out from the village at hangaroa to pay visits to the camp but the information forthcoming was never of great extent one elderly gentleman in particular took much more interest in roaming round the mountain 
recalling various scenes of his youth than in anything connected with the statues. A few names are still remembered in connection with the individual figures, and are said to be those of the makers of the images, and some proof is afforded of the reality of the tradition by the fact that the clans of the persons named are consistently given. Another class of names is, however, obviously derived merely from local circumstances. One in the quarry, under a drip from above, is known by the equivalent for dropping water, while a series inside the crater are called after the birds which frequent the cliffside, kia kia flying, kia kia sitting, and so forth. A solitary legend relates to an unique figure resembling rather a block than an image, which lies on the surface on the outside of the mountain. It is the single exception to the rule mentioned above that no evolution can be traced in the statues on the island. The usual conception is there, and the hands are shown, but the head seems to melt into the body, and the ear and arm to have become confused. It is said to have been the first image made, and is known as Tiahareatua, which tradition says was the name of the maker. He found himself unable to fashion it properly, and went over to the other side of the island to consult with a man who lived near Hangaroa, named Rawai Ika. He stayed the night there, but the expert remained silent, and he was retiring disappointed in the morning, when he was followed by his host, who called him back. "'Make your image,' said he, "'like me,' that is, in the form of a man. On our first visit to the mountain, Overcome by the wonder of the scene, we turned to our Fernandez boy and asked him what he thought of the statues. Like the classical curate, when the bishop inquired as to the character of his egg, he struggled manfully between the desire to please and a sense of truth. Like the curate, he took refuge in compromise. Some of them, he said doubtfully, he thought, w were very nice. If the figures at first strike even the cultured observer as crude and archaic, it must be remembered that not only are they the work of stone tools, but to be rightly seen should not be scrutinized near at hand. Hoa Haka Nanaya, for instance, is wholly and dismally out of place under a smoky portico, but on the slopes of a mountain gazing in impenetrable calm over sea and land, the simplicity of outline is soon found to be marvellously impressive. The longer the acquaintance, the more this feeling strengthens, there is always the sense of quiet dignity, of suggestion and of mystery. While the scene on Raraku always arouses a species of awe, it is particularly inspiring at sunset, when, as the light fades, the images gradually become outlined as stupendous black figures against the gorgeous colouring of the west. The most striking sight witnessed on the island was a fire on the hillside. In order to see our work more clearly, we set alight the long dry grass, always a virtuous act on Easter Island, that the livestock may have the benefit of fresh shoots. In a moment the whole was ablaze. The mountain, wreathed in masses of driving smoke, grew to portentous size. The quarries loomed down from above as dark giant masses, and in the whirl of flame below the great statues stood out calmly, with a quiet smile, like stoical souls in Hades. The questions which arise are obvious. Do these buried statues differ in any way from those in the workings above? from those on the Ahu, or from one another, were they put up on any foundation, and above all, what is the history of the mountain, and the raison d'etre of the figures? In the hope of throwing some light on these problems, we started to dig them out. It had originally been thought that the excavation of one or two would give all the information which it was possible to obtain, but each case was found to have unique and instructive features, and we finally unearthed in this way, wholly or in part, some twenty or thirty statues. 
it was usually easy to trace the stages by which the figures had been gradually covered on the top was a layer of surface soil from three to eight inches in depth then came debris which had descended from the quarry above in the form of rubble it contained large numbers of chisels some forty of which have been found in digging out one statue below this was the substance in which a hole had been dug to erect the image it sometimes consisted of clay and occasionally in part of rock not unfrequently the successive descents of earth could be traced by the thin lines of charcoal which marked the old surfaces obviously the result of grass or brushwood fires the few statues which are in a horizontal position are always on the surface and at first give the impression that they have been abandoned in the course of being brought down from the quarries as they are frequently found close to standing images of which only the head is visible it follows that if this is the correct solution the work must still have been proceeding when the earlier statues were already largely submerged the juxtaposition however occurs so often that it seems on the whole more probable that the rush of earth which covered some upset the foundations of others and either threw them down where they stood or carried them with it on top of the flood these various landslips allow of no approximate deductions as to the date in the manner which is possible with successively deposited layers of earth to get absolutely below the base of an image was not altogether easy the first we attempted to dig out was one of the farther ones within the crater it was found that while the back of the hole into which it had been dropped was excavated in the soft volcanic ash the front and remaining sides were of hard rock this rock was cut to the curvature of the figure at a distance of some three inches from it and as the chisel marks were horizontal from right to left the workman must have stood in the cup while preparing it in clearing out the alluvium between the wall of the cup and the figure six stone implements were found the hands which were about one foot below the level of the rim were perfectly formed the next statue chosen for excavation was also inside the crater it was most easily attacked from the side and this time it was possible to get low enough to see that it stood on no foundation and that the base instead of expanding as with those which stood on the ahu contracted in such a manner as to give a peg-shaped appearance this confirmed the impression made by the previous excavation that the image was intended to remain in its hole and was not as some have stated merely awaiting removal to an ahu the story was shown not only in the sections of the excavation but in the degrees of weathering on the figure itself the lowest part of the image to above the elbow exhibited by the sharpness of its outlines and frequently of the chisel cuts also that it had never been exposed the other portions being worn in relative degrees traces of the smoothness of the original surface can still be seen above ground in the more protected portions of some of the statues such as in the orbit and under the chin but a much clearer impression is of course gained of the finish and detail of the image when the unweathered surface is exposed the polish is often very beautiful and pieces of pumice called punga are found with which the figures are said to have been rubbed down the fingers taper and the excessive length of the thumb joint and nail are remarkable the nipples are in some cases so pronounced that the natives often characterized them as feminine but in no case which we came across did the statues represent other than the nude male figure the navel is indicated by a raised disc on the statue with the contracting base which is one of the best the surface modelling of the elbow joint is clearly shown the orbital cavity in the figures on raraku is rather differently modelled from those on the ahu in the statues on the mountain the position of the eyeball is always indicated by a straight line below the brow the orbit has no lower border on the terraces the socket is constantly hollowed out as in the figure at the british museum the eye is the only point in which the two sets vary 
with the important exception that some on the mountain have a type of back which never appears on the ahu this question of back proved to be of special interest in some images it remained exactly as when the figure left the quarry the hole was convex giving it a thick and archaic appearance particularly as regards the neck in other instances the posterior was beautifully modelled after the same fashion as those on the terraces the stone had been carefully chipped away till the ears stood out from the back of the head the neck assumed definite form and the spine instead of standing out as a sharp ridge was represented by an incised line this second type when excavated proved to our surprise to possess a well-carved design in the form of a girdle shown by three raised bands this was surmounted by one or sometimes by two rings and immediately beneath it was another design somewhat in the shape of an m the whole was new not only to us but to the natives who greatly admired it later when we knew what to look for traces of the girdle could be seen also on the figures of the ahu where the arm had protected it from the weather it was afterwards realized with amusement that the discovery of this design might have been made before leaving england by merely passing the barrier and walking behind the statues in the bloomsbury portico one case was found a statue at anacana where a ring was visible not only on the back but also on each of the buttocks and in view of subsequent information these lower rings became of special importance the girdle in this case consisted of one line only the detail of the carving had doubtless been preserved by being buried in the sand the two forms of back unmodelled and modelled stand side by side on the mountain End of section 15。section 16 of the mystery of Easter Island。the story of an expedition。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。read by Peter Yearsley。the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition by catherine routledge prehistoric remains statues and crowns part two the next step was to discover where and when the modelling was done certainly not in the original place in the quarry where it would be impossible from the position in which the image was evolved generally speaking there was no trace of such work and it was not until many months later that new light was thrown on the matter then it was remarked that in one of the standing statues on the outside of the hill which was buried up to the neck while the right ear was most carefully modelled showing a disc the left ear was as yet quite plain and that the back of the head also was not symmetrical excavations made clear that the whole back was in course of transformation from the boat shaped to the modelled type each workman apparently chipping away where it seemed to him good two or three similar cases were then found on which work was proceeding but on the other hand some of the simpler backs were excavated to the foot and others a considerable distance and there was no indication that any alteration was intended there are three possible explanations for these erect and partially moulded statues firstly it may have been the regular method for the back to be completed after the statue was set up in which case some kind of staging must have been used one of our guides had made a remark noted but not taken very seriously at the moment that the statues were set up to be finished some knowledge or tradition of such work therefore appeared to linger secondly the convex back may be the older form and those on which work was being done were being modelled to bring them up to date alteration did at times take place a certain small image presented a very curious appearance both from the proportion of the body which was singularly narrow from back to front and because it was difficult to see how it remained in place as it was apparently exposed to the base 
it turned out that the figure had been carved out of the head of an older statue of which the body was buried below thirdly these particular figures may have been erected and left in an unfinished condition if so their deficiencies were high up and would be obvious scamping did not often occur and when it did so it was in the concealed portions in one case the left hand was correctly modelled but the right was not even indicated beyond the wrist the statue shown in the frontispiece which rejoices in the name of piro piro meaning bad odour stands at the foot of the slope and appears to remain as it was set up without further burial it is a well-made figure probably one of the most recent and the upper part of the back is carefully moulded but on digging it out it was found that the bottom had not been finished but left in the form of a rough excrescence of stone there was no ring but a girdle had been carved on the protruding portion so that this was not intended to be removed in another instance a large head had fallen on a slope at such an angle that it was impossible to locate the position of the body curiosity led to investigation when it was found that the thing was a fraud the magnificent head being attached to a little dwarf trunk which must have been buried originally nearly to the neck to keep the top upright these instances of jerry building confirm our impression that at any rate a large number of the statues were intended to remain in situ indications were found of two different methods of erection and the mode may have been determined by the nature of the ground by the first procedure the statue seems to have been placed on its face in the desired spot and a hole to have been dug beneath the base the other method was to undermine the base with the statue lying face uppermost in several instances a number of large stones were found behind the back of the figure evidently having been used to wedge it while it was dragged to the vertical the upright position had sometimes been only partially attained one statue was still in a slanting attitude corresponding exactly to the slope of a hard clay wall behind it the interval between the two varying from three yards to eighteen inches had been packed with sub-angular boulders which weighed about one hundredweight or as much as a man could lift a few of the figures bear incised markings rudely and apparently promiscuously carved this was first noted in the case of one of two statues which stand together nearest to the entrance of the crater here it has been found possible to work the rock at a low level and in the empty quarry from which they no doubt have been taken two images have been set up one slightly in front of the other six still unfinished figures lie in close proximity the standing figure nearest to the lake bore a rough design on the face and when it was dug out the back was found to be covered with similar incised marks the natives were much excited and convinced that we should receive a large sum of money in england when the photograph of these was produced for nothing ever dispelled the illusion that the expedition was a financial speculation it was these carvings more especially that we ourselves hastily endeavoured to cover up when on the arrival of admiral von spee's squadron we daily expected a visit from the officers on board the markings have certainly not been made by the same practised hand as the raised girdle and rings and appear to be comparatively recent other statues were excavated where similar marks were noticed but except in this case digging led practically always to disappointment it was the part above the surface only which had been used as a block on which to scrawl design from the same impulse presumably as impels the schoolboy of to-day to make marks with chalk on a hoarding on one ahu the top of the head of a statue has been decorated with rough faces the carving evidently having been done after the statue had fallen in digging out the image with the tattooed back we came across the one and only burial which was found in connection with these figures it was close to it and at the level of the rings the long bones the patella and base of the skull were identified 
they lay in wet soil crushed and intermixed with large stones so the attitude could not be determined beyond the fact that the head was to the right of the image and the long bones to the left these bones had become of the consistency of moist clay and could only be identified by making transverse sections of them with a knife after first cleaning portions longitudinally by careful scraping in several other instances human bones were discovered near the statues but like the carvings they appeared to be of later date than the images one skull was found beneath a figure which was lying face downwards on the surface another fragment must have been placed behind the base after the statue had fallen forward the natives stated that in the epidemics which ravaged the island the statues afforded a natural mark for depositing remains in the same way a head near an ahu which was at first thought to be that of a standing statue turned out to be broken from the trunk and put up pathetically to mark the grave of a little child there is a roughly constructed ahu on the outside of rano raraku at the corner nearest to the sea of which more will be said hereafter and a quarried block of rock on the very top of the westerly peak was also said to be used for the exposure of the dead close to this block there are some very curious circular pits cut in the rock one examined was five feet six inches in depth and three feet six inches in diameter it is possible they were used as vaults but if so the shape is quite different from those of the ahu the conclusion arrived at was that the statues themselves were not directly connected with burials there seems also no reason to believe that they are put up in any order or method they appear to have been erected on any spot handy to the quarries where there was sufficient earth or even as has been seen in the quarry itself when circumstances permitted the southeastern side of rano raraku is a problem in itself the great wall formed by the cliff is like the ramparts of some giant castle rent by vertical fissures the greatest height the top of the peak is about five hundred feet of which the cliff forms perhaps half the lower part being a steep but comparatively smooth bank of detritus over the grassy surface of this bank are scattered numerous fragments of rock weighing from a few pounds to many tons which have fallen down from above the kitchen tent in our camp at the foot had a narrow escape from being demolished by one of these stones which nearly carried it away in the impetus of its descent it has never been suggested that this face of the mountain was being worked nevertheless it was subsequently difficult to understand how we lived so long below it gazing at it daily before we appreciated the fact that here also although in much lesser degree were both finished and embryo images at least one stone was definitely seen to be in the form of a head and excavation showed it to be an erected and buried statue a few other figures were found standing and prostrate and some unfinished images these last however were in no case being hewn out of solid rock but wrought into shape out of detached stones on the whole it is not probable that this portion was ever a quarry in the same way as the western side and the interior of the crater it is of course impossible to say what may be hidden beneath the detritus but the lower part of the cliff is too soft a rock to be satisfactorily hewn and the workmen appear simply to have seized on fragments which have fallen from above here they seem to have said is a good stone let us turn it into a statue one day when making a more thorough examination of the slope our attention was excited by a small level plateau about half way up from which protruded two similar pieces of stone next to one another they were obviously giant noses of which the nostrils faced the cliff digging was bound to follow but it proved a long business as the figures it revealed were particularly massive and corpulent their position was horizontal side by side and the effect more particularly when looked down at them from the cliff above 
was of two great bodies lying in their graves the thing was a mystery they were certainly not in a quarry but if they had once been erect why had they faced the mountain instead of conforming to the rule of having their back to it orientation could not account for it as other statues on the same slope were differently placed then again if they had once stood and then fallen and in proof of this one head was broken off from the trunk how did it come about that they were lying horizontally on a sloping hillside the upper part of the bodies had suffered somewhat from weather and a small round basin such as natives use for domestic purposes had been hollowed out in one abdomen but the hands were quite sharp and unweathered we used to scramble up at off moments and stand gazing down at them trying to read their history it became at last obvious they had once been set up with the lower part inserted in the ground to the usual level and later been intentionally thrown down for this purpose a level trench must have been cut through the sloping side of the hill at a depth corresponding to the base of the standing images and into this the figures had fallen while they lay in the trench with the upper part of the bodies exposed one had been found a nice smooth stone for household use a charcoal soil level showed clearly where the surface had been at this epoch which must have been comparatively recent as an iron nail was found in it finally a descent of earth had covered all but the noses leaving them in the condition in which we found them this though a satisfactory explanation as far as it went did not account for the fact that the figures were facing the mountain and here for once tradition came to our help these images had it was said marked a boundary the line of demarcation led between them from the fissure in the cliff above right down to the middle statue in the great tongariki terrace to cross it was death but as to what the boundary connoted no information was forthcoming there seemed no great tribal division the same clans ranged over the whole of the district when however the line is followed through the crevice into the crater it is found to form on both sides the boundary where the image-making ceased and was probably the line of taboo which preserved the rights of the image-makers i was later given the cheering information that a certain devil frequented the site of my house which was just on the image side of the boundary who particularly resented the presence of strangers and was given to strangling them in the night the spirits who inhabit the crater are still so unpleasant that my kanaka maid objected to taking clothes there to wash even in daylight till assured that our party would be working within call isolated statues the finished statues as distinct from those in the quarries have so far been spoken of under two heads those which once adorned the ahu and those still standing on the slope of raraku there is however another class to consider which for want of a better name will be termed the isolated statues it has already been stated that as raraku is approached a number of figures lie by the side of the modern track others are round the base of the mountain and yet other isolated specimens are scattered about the island all these images are prostrate and lie on the surface of the ground some on their backs and some on their faces these were the ones which according to legend were being moved from the quarries to the ahu by the old lady when she stopped the work in her wrath or according to another account quoted by a visitor before our day they walked and some fell by the way there must we felt have been roads along which they were taken but for long we kept a lookout for such without success at last a lazy sunday afternoon ride with no particular object took one of us to the top of a small hill some two miles to the west of raraku the level rays of the sinking sun showed up the inequalities of the ground and looking towards the sea along the level plain of the south coast the old track was clearly seen it was slightly raised over lower ground 
and depressed somewhat through higher and along it every few hundred yards lay a statue detailed study confirmed this first impression at times over hard stony ground the trail was lost but its main drift was indisputable it was about nine feet or ten feet in width the embankments were in places two feet above the surrounding ground and the cuttings three feet deep the road can be traced from the southwestern corner of the mountain with one or two gaps nearly to the foot of rano Kao, but the succession of statues continues only about half the distance it generally runs some few hundred yards further inland than the present road but a branch with a statue leads down to the ahu of teatenga on the coast and another portion either a branch or a detour of the main road also with a statue goes to the cove of akahanga with its two large image ahu there are on this road twenty-seven statues in all covering a distance of some four miles but fourteen of them including two groups of three are in the first mile their heights are from fifteen feet to over thirty feet but generally over twenty feet as a clue had now been obtained it was comparatively simple to trace two other roads from raraku one leads from the crater and connects it with the western district of the island it commences at the gap in the mountain wall in the centre of which an image lies on its face with weird effect as if descending head foremost into the plain and runs for a while roughly parallel to the first road but about a mile further inland it is not quite so regular as the south road and is marked for a somewhat less distance by a sequence of images some fourteen in number which in the same way grow further apart as the distance from the mountain increases when the succession of statues ceases the road divides one track turns to the northwest and reaches the seaboard through a small pass in the western line of cones the other continues as far as a more southerly pass in the same succession of heights in each pass there is a statue the third road which runs from raraku in a northerly direction is much shorter than those to the south and west it has only four statues covering a distance of perhaps a mile and it then disappears if however the figures round the base of the mountain belonged to it and they lie in the same direction it started from the southern corner of the mountain led in front of the standing statues and across the trail from the crater before taking its northward route up the eastern plain the furthest of the images is the largest which has been moved it lies on its back badly broken but the total of the fragments gives a height of thirty-six feet four inches in addition to these three avenues there are indications that some of the statues on the southeastern side of raraku may have been on a fourth road along that side beneath the cliff so far the matter was sufficiently clear but another problem was still unsolved if the images were really being moved to their respective ahu all round the coast how was it that with very few exceptions they were all found in the neighbourhood of raraku if also they were being moved what was the method pursued for some lay on their backs and some on their faces with the hope of elucidating this great question of the means of transport we dug under and near one or two of the single figures without achieving our end nothing was found but the close study which the work necessitated called attention to the fact that on one of them the lines of weathering could not have been made with the figure in its present horizontal attitude the rain had evidently collected on the head and run down the back it must therefore have stood for a considerable time in a vertical position it was again a noticeable fact that though some single figures are lying unbroken others like the large one on the north road proved to be so shattered that no amount of normal disintegration or shifting of soil could account for their condition they had obviously fallen so 
wedded however were we at this time to the theory that they were in course of transport that it was seriously considered whether they could have been moved in an upright position the point was settled by finding one day by the side of the track some two miles from the mountain a partially buried head this was excavated and a statue found that had been originally set up in a hole and later undermined causing it to fall forward this was the only instance of an isolated figure where the burial had been to any depth but in various other cases it was then seen that soil had been removed from the base and one or two more of the figures had not quite fallen when the whole number of the statues on the roads were in imagination re-erected it was found that they had all originally stood with their backs to the hill rano raraku was therefore approached by at least three magnificent avenues on each of which the pilgrim was greeted at intervals by a stone giant guarding the way to the sacred mountain one of the ahu on the south coast hanga paukura has been approached by a similar avenue of five statues facing the visitor these five images when first seen were a great puzzle as some of them are so embedded in the earth that their backs are even with the levelled sward in front of the ahu later there seemed little doubt that like the two giants on the southeast side of roraku trenches had been dug into which they had fallen subsequently a sixth statue was discovered the other side of a modern wall weathered and worn away but of raraku stone and still upright this is the only instance of an erect figure to be found elsewhere than on the mountain in addition to the images which have stood in these processional roads there are excluding one or two figures near the mountain whose raison d'etre is somewhat doubtful fourteen isolated statues in various parts of the island for whose position no certain reason could be found some of these may have belonged to inland ahu which have disappeared or they may be solitary memorials to mark some particular spots but the greater number appear to have stood near tracks of some sort some of these last may have been boundary stones and in this class may perhaps fall the smaller statue now at the british museum which is a very inferior specimen according to local information it stood almost halfway on the track leading from vinapu to mataveri along the bottom of rano Kao. the hole from which it was dug was pointed out and our informant declared that he remembered it standing and that the people used to dance round it the larger figure at the british museum was in a unique position which will be spoken of later no statues were therefore found of which it could be said that they were in process of being removed and the mode of transport remains a mystery an image could be moved down from the quarry by means of banks of earth and though requiring labour and skill the process is not inconceivable similarly the figures may have been and probably were erected on the terraces in the same way being hauled up on an embankment of earth made higher than the pedestals and then dropped on them near paro the ahu where the last statue was overthrown there is a hillock and tradition says that a causeway was made from it to the head of the tall figure which stood upon the ahu and along this the hat was rolled a piece of law which seems hardly likely to have been invented by a race having no connection with the statues but the problem remains how was the transport carried out along the level the weight of some amounted to as much as forty or fifty tons it would simplify matters very much if there were any reason to suppose that the images were moved as was the case with the hats before being wrought merely as cylinders of stone in which case it would be possible to pass a rope under and over it thus parbuckling the stone or rolling it along but the evidence is all to the contrary there is no trace whatever of an unfinished image 
on or near an ahu, while, as we have seen, they are found at all stages in the quarry. Presumably rollers were employed, but there appears never to have been much wood or material for cordage in the island, and it is not easy to see how sufficient men could bring strength to bear on the block. Even if the ceremonial roads were used when possible, these fragile figures have been taken to many distant ahu, up hill and down dale, over rough and stony ground where there is no trace of any road at all. The natives are sometimes prepared to state that the statues were thrown down by human means. They never have any doubt that they were moved by supernatural power. We were once inspecting an ahu built on a natural eminence. One side was sheer cliff, the other was a slope of twenty-nine feet, as steep as a house roof. Near the top a statue was lying. The most intelligent of our guides turned to me significantly. "'Do you mean to tell me,' he said, "'that that was not done by mana?' The darkness is not rendered less tantalizing by the reflection that could centuries roll away, and the old scenes be again enacted before us, the workers would doubtless exclaim in bewildered surprise at our ignorance, but how could you do it any other way? Besides the ceremonial roads and their continuations, there are traces of an altogether different track, which is said to run round the whole seaboard of the island. It is considered to be supernatural work, and is known as Ara Mahaiva, Ara meaning road, and Mahaiva being the name of the spirit or deity who made it. On the southern side it has been obliterated in making the present track. It was there termed the path for carrying fish, but on the northern and western coasts, where for much of the way it runs on the top of high cliffs, such a use is out of the question. It can be frequently seen there like a long persistent furrow, and where its course has been interrupted by erosion, no fresh track had been made further inland. It terminates suddenly on the broken edge, and resumes its course on the other side. It is best seen in certain lights running up both the western and southern edges of Rano Kao. Its extent and regularity appeared to preclude the idea of landslip. There is no reason to suppose that it is due to the imported livestock, and it has no connection with Ahu, or the old native centres of population. Yet, to have been so worn by naked feet, it must constantly have been used. This silent witness to a forgotten past is one of the most mysterious and impressive things on the island. Stone Crowns of the Images Mention must finally be made of the crowns or hats which adorned the figures on the ahu. Their full designation is said to be hau, hats, hitarau, moai, but they are always alluded to merely as hitarau or hitirau. These coverings for the head were cylindrical in form, the bottom being slightly hollowed out into an oval depression in order to fit on the head of the image. The depression was not in the centre, but left a larger margin in front, so that the brim projected over the eyes of the figure, a fashion common in native headdresses. They are said by the present inhabitants to have been kept in place by being wedged with white stones. The top was worked into a boss or knot. The material is a red volcanic tuff, found in a small crater on the side of a larger volcano, generally known as Puna Pau not far from Cook's Bay. In the crater itself are the old quarries. A few half-buried hats may be seen there, and the path up to it, and for some hundreds of yards from the foot of the mountain, is strewn with them. They are at this stage simply large cylinders, from four feet to eight feet high, from six feet to nine feet across, and they were obviously conveyed to the ahu in this form, and there carved into shape. An unwrought cylinder is still lying at a hundred yards from the ahu of Anakena. The finished hats 
are not more than three feet ten inches to six feet in height with addition of six inches to two feet for the knob the measurement across the crown is from about five feet six inches to eight feet the stone is more easily broken and cut than that of the statues and while many crowns survive many more have been smashed in falling or used as building materials it is a noteworthy fact that the images on raraku never had hats nor have any of the isolated statues they were confined to those on the ahu end of section 16「Section 15 of the Mystery of Easter Island – The Story of an Expedition – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in March 2023. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge Chapter 15, Native Culture in Pre-Christian Times, Part 1 Sources of Information, History, Recent Remains, Living Memory, Mode of Life, Habitations, Food, Dress and Ornament, Social Life, Divisions, Wars, Marriages, Burial Customs, Social Functions it has been seen that any knowledge which exists on the island with regard to the origin of the monuments is of the most vague description and it is therefore necessary in the attempt to solve the problem to rely principally on indirect evidence it becomes in particular essential to collect all possible information about the present people not only for its intrinsic anthropological interest but in order to find if any links connect them with the great builders or if we must look for an earlier race as a first step in the search the scientist naturally turns to the most ancient accounts which he can find describing the island its inhabitants and remains these are not yet two hundred years old the first european to see it was a dutch admiral named ragavin who came upon it on easter day seventeen twenty two during his search for another and mysterious island known as davis or david's island he concluded that it was not the place for which he was looking christened it easter island and went further afield his ship lay off the north side of the island for a week but only on one day did landing take place and one or two of the party have left us short descriptions there were they say no big trees but it had a rich soil and a good climate there were sugar cane bananas potatoes and figs and the natives brought them a number of fowls estimated varyingly from sixty to five hundred one of the voyagers goes so far as to say that all the country was under cultivation as for the inhabitants they were they tell us of all shades of color yellow white and brown and wore clothes made of a field product evidently tapa they were painted which apparently signifies tattooed and it was the habit to distend the lobes of their ears so that they hung to the shoulders and large discs were worn in them when these indians wrote rogovin go about any job which might set their ear-plugs wagging and bid fair to do them any hurt they take them out and hitch the rim of the lobe up over the top of the ear which gives them a quaint and laughable appearance the natives were extraordinarily thievish stealing the caps from the seamen's heads while one actually climbed into the porthole of the cabin and took the cloth off the table these habits gave rise to an unfortunate incident as when the visitors came on shore a scuffle took place over the sanctity of property and the natives began throwing stones on which a petty official gave the order to fire ten or twelve natives being killed the occurrence however was duly explained and did not terminate amicable relations we learn that at this time the great statues of which this is of course the first report were then as has already been noted standing and in place 
the dutchman described them as remarkable tall stone figures a good thirty feet in height and notice that they have crowns on their heads a clear space was they said reserved round them by laying stones they have no doubt that the figures are objects of worship the natives kindle fires in front of them and thereafter squatting on their heels with heads bowed down they bring the palms of their hands together and alternately raise and lower them another observer adds in connection with this worship that they prostrated themselves towards the rising sun a great step would have been gained towards the solution of the problem if we could feel assured that these last remarks were justified and were not merely the result of imperfect observation for fifty years darkness once more descends on the history of the island then within a period of sixteen years it was visited by three expeditions spanish english and french respectively the spanish were under the command of gonzales they too were searching for david's island when in seventeen seventy they touched at easter and they also came to the conclusion that it was not their goal they took however formal possession of it and named it san carlos their ships lay at anchor in the same place as had those of rogovin the bay on the north coast now called after la perouse from this anchorage three curious hillocks on the northern slope of the great eastern volcano form striking objects on each of these they planted a cross and proclaimed the king of spain with banners flying beating of drums and artillery salutes the natives appear to have thoroughly enjoyed the proceedings and confirmed them according to the solemn statements of the spaniards by marking the official document with their own script this is the first that we hear of a form of native writing the expedition sent a boat round the island which made a very creditable map of it four years later cook cast anchor on the west side in the bay which is known by his name he was there three days and did not himself explore inland but his officers did so including the elder forster the botanist of the expedition and his account of what they saw was published by his son in seventeen eighty la perouse anchored in the same place and also sent some of his men inland who covered partly but not entirely the same districts as those of cook as these expeditions were so nearly of the same date their remarks may fairly be compared and contrasted with those made by rogovin half a century earlier all three give very similar descriptions of the people their appearance and dwellings which also resemble the accounts of the dutch cook is very much impressed with the long ears though la perouse does not refer to them there is the same story of the native powers of appropriating the goods of the strangers cook says that they were as expert thieves as any we had yet met with and perouse whose own hat they stole while helping him down one of the image platforms is particularly aggrieved at such conduct considering that he has given them sheep goats pigs and other valuable presents peace was only kept between the crew and the natives by official compensation being given the seamen for their lost property here however the resemblance of these accounts with that of rogovin ends the descriptions which are given by these later expeditions of the state of the country and its facilities as a port of call are very different from those of the dutchmen the spaniards speak of it as being uncultivated save for some small plots of ground the englishmen are the reverse of enthusiastic forster calls it a poor land and cook says that no nation need contend for the honor of discovery of this island as there can be few places which afford less convenience for shipping poultry now consists of only a few tame fowls later still we find that only one is produced perouse although he is not so depressed as cook tells us that only one-tenth of the land is cultivated with regard to the population rogovin gives no number and probably was not in a position to do so the estimates made by the spanish and english are very similar gonzales puts it at nine hundred to one thousand cook at seven hundred both of them however state that the number of women seen seemed to be disproportionately small 
La Perouse, writing, of course, some years later, speaks of the number as 2,000, and has seen many women and children. Both English and French are interested in finding that the language is similar to that spoken elsewhere in the Pacific. Again, in dealing with the state of the monuments and the way in which they were regarded, the impressions of the later observers differ greatly from those of Rogovine. The Spaniards do not tell us very much. They saw from the sea what they thought were bushes, symmetrically put up on the beach and dotted about inland. Later they found that they were in reality statues, and they wondered particularly how their crowns, which they observed were of a different material, were raised into place. It was one of the Spanish officers who states, as recorded at the beginning of this book, that the seashore was lined with stone idols, from which it may be gathered that the great majority were still erect. The figures were, they tell us, all set up on small stones. The burying places were in front. It is interesting, in view of what we know of the prohibition of smoke near the Ahu, to find one of the Spanish writing, They could not bear us to smoke cigars. They begged our sailors to extinguish them, and they did so. I asked one of them the reason, and he made signs that the smoke went upwards, but I do not know what this meant. Cook's people observed that the natives disliked these burying places being walked over, but whereas Rogavine was convinced, whether rightly or wrongly, that the cult of the statues was what we should call a going concern, Cook, fifty years later, is equally certain that it is a thing of the past. Some of the figures are still standing, but some are fallen down, and the inhabitants do not even trouble to repair the foundations of those which are going to decay. The giant statues, he says, are not, in my opinion, looked upon as idols by the present inhabitants, whatever they may have been in the days of the Dutch. Forster also remarks that, quote, they are so disproportionate to the strength of the nation, it is most reasonable to look upon them as the remains of better times, end quote. La Perouse does not agree with this last sentiment. He admits that at present the monuments are not respected, but he sees no reason why they should not still be made, even under existing conditions. He thinks that a hundred people would be sufficient to put one of the statues in place. The objection, he sees, is that the people have no chief great enough to secure such a memorial. It is unfortunate that the mountain of Rano Raraku is so far removed from both the north and west anchorages that none of the voyagers discovered it, although Cook's men were very near that from which the crowns were obtained. In the 19th century, we have a few accounts from passing voyagers. Lysiansky, in 1804, found no people with long ears, but in 1825, Beechey in H.M.S. Blossom says that there were still a few to be seen. With regard to the statues, the process of demolition has gone so far that Beechey declares, quote, the existence of any busts is doubtful. It is amusing to find a hundred years after Rogovine's similar experience that the Blossom has an affray with natives over the stealing of caps. While attention has been drawn to the importance of these early narratives, it must be remembered that all the visits were of very short duration, and that the old voyagers were not trained observers. The Dutchmen, for instance, deliberately tell us that the statues have no arms. The accounts frequently give the impression of being written up afterwards from somewhat vague recollection, and in most cases the narrators have read those of their predecessors and go prepared to see certain things. One navigator who never landed assures us that the houses are the same as in the days of La Perouse. On the other hand, with regard to the stores available, they are, so to speak, on their own quarter deck, and their remarks can be accepted without question. In the sixties of the last century, the great series of changes took place which brought Easter Island into touch with the modern world. The first of these largely broke those chains with the past, which the archaeologist now seeks to reconstruct. Labor was needed by the exploiters of the Peruvian guano fields, and an attempt which was made to introduce it from China having failed, slave raids were organized in the South Sea Islands. As early as 1805, Easter had suffered similarly 
at the hands of american sealers and it was amongst the principal islands to be laid under contribution in december eighteen sixty two it is pathetic even now to hear the old men describe the scenes which they witnessed in their youth illustrating by action how the raiders threw down on the ground gifts which they thought likely to attract the inhabitants and when the islanders were on their knees scrambling for them tied their hands behind their backs and carried them off to the waiting ship the natives say that one thousand in all were so removed from the island and unfortunately there were amongst them some of the principal men including many of the most learned and the last of the ariki or chiefs representations were made by the french minister at lima and a certain number were put on board to be returned to their home smallpox however had been contracted by them and out of one hundred who were to be repatriated only fifteen survived these on their return to the island brought the disease with them which spread rapidly with most fatal results to the population meantime shortly before the raid the attention of the roman catholic congregation of the sacred heart of jesus and mary in valparaiso had been drawn to the island by the account received from a passing ship and they determined to inaugurate a mission three of the community left for easter island their route taking them by way of haiti finally only one continued eugene Aro, who landed on the island in january eighteen sixty four Aro was a lay brother in the order having been a merchant in south america he devoted his life to the call to take the gospel to easter and the accounts of his work which are extraordinarily interesting leave a great impression of his courage and devotion he was alone on the island for eight or nine months and was at the mercy of the natives who stole his belongings even to the clothes he was wearing and compelled him to make a boat for them in march eighteen sixty six Hero, after a visit to chile returned with another missionary father roussel and the two were for a while blockaded in a house which they had put up but the tide now turned either roussel was a man of greater determination than Hero, or with increased numbers a firmer attitude was possible surgeon palmer of h m s topaz tells us that when one of the natives took up a stone with a menacing gesture roussel quietly felled him with his stick and went on his way after which there was no further trouble the missionaries were joined later in the year by two more of their number and became a power in the land erod on his return from chile was suffering from phthisis of which he died in august eighteen sixty eight when he was nearing his end he asked roussel if there still remained any heathen in the island to which the father replied not one the last seven had been baptized on the feast of the assumption it seemed natural to connect with erod's illness the fact that there was at the same time a severe epidemic of phthisis in the island so little was the need of precaution understood at that date that even surgeon palmer writing of the inroads made by consumption remarks quote, which they the natives believe infectious end quote. the ravages of this disease following on those of smallpox reduced the population which at the time of the arrival of the mission had stood at twelve hundred by about one-fourth the remarks of the missionaries on native customs particularly those dealing with their ceremonies reflect credit on the observers at the time when such things were too often thought beneath notice they will be referred to later their ethnological work was however limited by more pressing exigencies by the difficulties of locomotion on the island and by the language Roussel compiled a vocabulary which is useful to students, though not free from the mode of thought found in a well-known missionary dictionary, which translates handsome cab into the Swahili language. It is a curious fact that so completely were the terraces now ruined that the fathers never allude to the statues, and seem scarcely to have realized their existence. But it is through them that we first hear of the wooden tablets carved with figures— the body of professors acquainted with this art of writing perished either in peru or by epidemic 
and this in connection with the introduction of christianity led to great destruction of the existing specimens of this most interesting script the natives said that they burnt the tablets in compliance with the orders of the missionaries though such suggestion would hardly be needed in a country where wood is scarce the fathers on the contrary state that it was due to them that any were preserved some certainly were saved by their means and through the interest shown in them by bishop jawson of tahiti while two or three found their way to museums after the natives became aware of their value but some or all of these existing tablets are merely fragments of the original the natives told us that an expert living on the south coast whose house had been full of such glyphs abandoned them at the call of the missionaries on which a man named nairi being of a practical mind got hold of the discarded tablets and made a boat of them wherein he caught much fish when the sewing came out he stowed the wood into a cave at the ahu near hangaroa to be made later into a new vessel there Pacariti, an islander now living found a piece and it was acquired by the u s a ship mohican side by side with the establishment of the religious power the secular had come into being the master of the ship who had brought the last two missionaries was a certain captain dutro bournier he had been attracted by the place and having made financial arrangements with the mercantile house of brander in tahiti settled himself on the island and proceeded to exploit it commercially title deeds were obtained from the natives in exchange for gifts of woven material the remaining population was gathered together into one settlement at hangaroa the native name for the shore of cook's bay this was the state of things when the h m s topaz touched in eighteen sixty eight and carried off the two statues now at the british museum Dutro Bournier had at first spoken enthusiastically of the work of the missionaries. Later, however, the not unknown struggle arose between the religious and secular powers. According to the accounts of the missionaries, they protested against the actions of Bournier in taking over 200 natives, practically by force, and shipping them to Tahiti to work on the Brander plantations. Bournier retaliated by rendering their position impossible, and the fathers ultimately received orders to transfer their labors to the Grambier Islands. Jawson tells us that their converts desired to accompany them, and that almost the whole population went on board with them. The captain, however, instigated by Bournier, refused to carry so many, and 175 were sent back to the shore. This, therefore, was the whole population in 1871. We have not Bournier's account of the quarrel, but there seems to have been some justification for the attitude of the missionaries toward him, as five years later he was murdered by the natives, and if current stories are to be believed, his end was well merited. Subsequently, one of the branders lived at Mataveri, and Mr. Alexander Salmon, to whom the missionaries sold their interests, at Vaihu on the south coast. The Salmon family had intermarried with the royal family of Tahiti, and the new resident was well aware of the value of the antiquities. According to native accounts, he organized a band to search the caves and hiding places for the articles of interest. They also state that he employed skilled natives to produce wooden objects connected with their older culture for sale to passing ships. He spoke the language of the island, and when the USS Mohican arrived in 1886, he was the source of much of the information which they subsequently published. It is an important but difficult matter to know how far the material thus gleaned 30 years ago was carefully obtained and reproduced. One or two of the folk tales are still told very much as retailed by Salmon, but he appears to have taken little interest in the surviving customs and failed to understand them. The report of the Mohican made by Paymaster Thompson has been the only account of the island in existence with any pretension to scientific value. The Mohican was there eleven days, and Thompson went rapidly round the island with a party from the ship. 
the amount of ground covered and work done is remarkable although his statements are naturally not free from the errors inseparable from such rapid observation in eighteen eighty eight the chilean government formally took possession in eighteen ninety seven m merlet of valparaiso purchased from the representatives of brander bornier and salmon their interest in easter island with the exception of a tract of land containing the village of hangaroa which the chilean government acquired from the missionaries and retained in the interest of the inhabitants this land covers a far larger space than the natives are able to utilize the population is again increasing as will have been seen from the fact that during our visit they numbered two hundred and fifty m merlet subsequently sold his holding to a company of which he became chairman easter island has had many names that given by the dutchmen has become generally accepted but the spaniards christened it san carlos and in some maps it is termed wahoo a name of a part of the island erroneously understood as applying to the whole a native name is t pitote henua henua means usually earth or pito navel thompson says it was ascribed to the first comers elsewhere in the pacific pito also means end churchill holds the name signified simply land's end and was applied to all these angles of the island which was itself without a name rapa nui or great rapa is another native name for which various explanations are offered the island of rapa sometimes known as rapa iti lies some two thousand miles to the westward thompson states that the name rapa nui only dates from the time when the men kidnapped by the peruvians were being returned to their homes the easter islanders finding no one knew the name to pito tehanua and that some comrades in distress from the other rapa managed to make their place of origin understood called their own home rapa nui a story which sounds hardly probable but was presumably obtained from salmon according to the report of h m s topaz the islanders of their day believed that rapa was their original home others state the name was given by a visitor from that island the brief accounts which have been referred to are all that is known from external evidence of the original life of the present people and but little hope was held out for us in england as those fragments could still be supplemented there were found however to be still in existence two possible sources of information namely the memories of old inhabitants and the actual traces which still remain of the life led by the people previous to the peruvian raid and the coming of christianity the great ahu which have so far been described are only a part although the most imposing portion of the stone remains of the island it is fortunate for the student that when civilization appeared the natives were gathered into one settlement for they left behind them sprinkled over the island various erections connected with their original domestic life these buildings were certainly being used in recent times and are treated from this point of view but for all we know they may have been and very possibly were contemporary with the great works the study of the remains on the island from the greatest to the least is by no means so simple as may hitherto have appeared our earliest attempts at descriptions although conscientious were almost ludicrous in the light of subsequent knowledge and captain beechey's error on the subject of the busts is at least comprehensible easter it must be remembered is a mass of disintegrating rocks when in an idle moment the expedition amused itself by inventing an heraldic design for the island it was universally agreed that the main emblem must undoubtedly be a stone and as supporters suggested one frivolous member two cockroaches rampant the most correct representation would be a stone vertical on a stone horizontal every individual who has lived even temporarily in the place has collected stones and put them up according to taste 
and every succeeding generation also needing stones has as in the instance of the manager's wall found them most readily in ruining or converting the work of their predecessors even when a building is comparatively intact the original design and purpose can only be grasped by experience and matters become distinctly complicated when the walls of an ahu have been made into a garden enclosure and a chicken house turned into an ossuary it must be remembered also that rough stone buildings bear in themselves no marks of age the cairns put up by us to mark the distances for rifle fire from the camp were indistinguishable from those of prehistoric nature made for a very different purpose the result is that the tumble-down remains of yesterday and the scenes of unknown antiquity blend together in a confusing whole in which it is not always easy to distinguish even the works of nature from those of man the other source of information which was open to us was the memory of the old people if but little was known of the great works it was possible that there might still linger knowledge of customs or folklore which would throw indirect light on origins this field proved to be astonishingly large but it was even more difficult to collect facts from brains than out of stones on our arrival there were still a few old people who were sufficiently grown up in the sixties to recall something of the old life with the great majority of these about a dozen in number we gradually got in touch beginning with those who worked for mr edmonds and hearing from them of others it was momentous work for the eleventh hour was striking day by day they were dropping off it was a matter of anxious consideration whose testimony should first be recorded for fear that meanwhile others should be gathered to their fathers and their store of knowledge lost for ever against the longer recollection of extreme old age had to be put the fact that the memories of those a little younger were generally more clear and accurate the feeling of responsibility from a scientific point of view was very great ten years ago more could have been done ten years hence little or nothing will remain of this source of knowledge most happily these authorities were in almost every case willing and ready to talk and our debt to them is great they came with us as has been seen on our explorations of the island but the greater part of the work was done when we were living near the village some of them took pleasure in coming up to mataveri and talking in the veranda enjoying still more no doubt the practical outcome of their subsequent visits to bailey's domain the kitchen others were more at ease in their own surroundings and then we went down to the village and discussed old days in their little banana plots while interested neighbors came in to join the fray sometimes a man did better by himself but on other occasions to get two or three together stimulated conversation unfortunately some of the old men who knew most were confined to the leper settlement some three miles north of hangaroa and the infectious power of leprosy was not a subject which we had got up before leaving england the captain of the kill dalton feared lest even the distance of the settlement from the manager's house might not suffice to prevent the plague being carried there by insects and told a gruesome tale within his knowledge of two white men who had gone for a visit to a pacific island one of whom on their return to an american port had been immediately sent back to a leper colony but how could one allow the last vestige of knowledge in easter island to die out without an effort so i went disinfected my clothes on return studied must it be confessed my fingers and toes and hoped for the best it would not be easy for a foreigner to reconstruct english society fifty years ago even from the descriptions of well-educated old men it is particularly difficult to arrive at the truth from the untutored mind even when the natives knew well what they were talking about they would forget to mention some part of the story which to them was self-evident but at which the humble european could not be expected to guess the bird story for example had for many months been wrestled with before it transpired precisely what was meant by the first egg 
deliberate invention was rare but when memory was a little vague there was a constant tendency to glide from what was remembered to what was imagined scientific work of this nature really ought to qualify for a high position at the bar the witness had to be heard and discreetly cross-examined without any doubt being thrown on his story which would at once have given offence then allowed to forget and again re-examined his story being compared with that of others who had been heard meanwhile counsel had also to be judge and act as reporter and at the same time keep the witness amused and to prevent the interpreter from being bored or the court would promptly have broken up though great care has been exercised it must be remembered when a particular account is quoted as for example that of tihaha regarding the annual inspection of the tablets while it is believed to rest on fact its absolute accuracy cannot be guaranteed the language question naturally added to the difficulty on landing two courses had been open either to go on with spanish of which the younger men had a certain knowledge and which was used by mr edmonds or to try to get some hold of the native tongue the latter plan was decided on and though at one time the difficulty seemed so great that this course was almost regretted in the end it was vindicated there is as stated a vocabulary in french made by the missionaries and also one in spanish but there is no grammar of any kind the french carpenter varta was some assistance particularly at the beginning the first steps were the easiest the kanakas were much interested in my endeavors and rushed round wildly bringing any object they could lay hands on in order to teach its name but even with the nouns an unexpected complication arose the natives speak not only their own language but side by side with it that of tahiti which is used in their religious books and services there are affinities between the two but they are quite dissimilar and to understand conversation it was necessary to learn both this very much prolonged the task and also lessened the results obtained the next stage the putting together of sentences was still more difficult how was it possible to talk in a language which had no verb to be i had it is true a native maid but after the simplest phrases had been learnt topics of conversation were difficult to find we looked through illustrated magazines together but wild beasts railway trains and the greater part of the pictures of all kinds conveyed nothing to her the plan was therefore hit on of a tale after the manner of the arabian nights dealing with imaginary events on the island it was very weird but served its purpose though there were initial difficulties the heroine for example was christened maria but there were parapina said three marias on the island which was it and it was long before she grasped if indeed she ever did so entirely that the lady was imaginary a certain sequence of events was somehow made intelligible to her she was then induced to repeat the story while it was taken down it was copied out and next day read again to her for further correction every word and idea gained was a help in understanding local names and the native point of view before the end in addition to using the language for the ordinary affairs of life it was found possible to get simple answers direct from the old men and understand firsthand much of what they said any real success in intercourse was however due to the intelligence of one individual who was known as juan tipano he was a younger man about forty years of age a full-blooded kanaka but had served his time in the chilean army and thus had seen something of men and manners he talked a little pidgin english which was a help in the earlier stages but before the end he and i were able to understand each other entirely in kanaka and he made clear to the old men anything i wished to know and explained their answers to me it was interesting to notice how his perception gradually grew of what truth and accuracy meant 
and he finally assumed the attitude of watchdog to prevent my being imposed on. Happily, it was discovered that he was able to draw, and he took great delight in this newfound power, which proved most useful. The tattoo designs were obtained, for example, by giving him a large sheet of paper with an outline of a man or woman, also a pencil and a piece of candle. These he took down to the village, gathered the old men together in their huts in the evening, and brought up in the morning the figure adorned by the direction of the ancients. He took a real interest in the work, learning through the conversations much about the place which was new to him, and at the end of the time triumphantly stated, Mama now knows everything there is to know about the island. It is proposed to unite the information gained from locality and memory, referring where necessary to the accounts of the early voyagers, and give as complete descriptions as possible of the primitive existence which continued on Easter Island till the middle of the last century. It will be seen that the condition of the people on the coming of Christianity, as we were able to ascertain it, corresponded almost exactly with that described by the first visitors from Europe more than a hundred years earlier. Such traditions as linger regarding the megalithic remains have already been alluded to earlier in this book, but attention will be drawn to the point whenever this line of research seems successful in throwing indirect light on the origin of the great works. End of section 17section eighteen of the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording is by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in march two thousand twenty three the Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge Chapter 15, Native Culture in Pre-Christian Times, Part 2 Mode of Life The present natives, in talking of old times, say that their ancestors were as thick as grass and stood up like the fingers of two hands with the palms together, a statement from which deduction must be made for pictorial representation. The early mariners never, as we have seen, estimate the population at more than 2,000, but the land could carry many more. Mr. Edmonds calculates that about half of the total amount, or some 15,000 acres, could grow bananas and sweet potatoes, Two acres of cultivated ground would be sufficient to supply an ordinary family. Housing accommodation presented no great problem. Many slept in the open, and even today, in the era of Christianity and European clothes, a cave is looked upon as sufficient shelter. When on moving from our town to our country house, we inquired where our attendants were to sleep, we were cheerfully informed that it was all right, there was a very good cave near Tongarica, and this cave, called Anahavia, became a permanent annex to the establishment. Some of these caves had a wall built in front for shelter. Houses, however, did exist, which were built in the form of a long, upturned canoe. They were made of sticks, the tops of which were tied together, the whole being thatched successively with reeds, grass, and sugar cane. In the best of these houses, the foundations, which are equivalent to the gunwale of a boat, are made of wrought stones let into the ground. They resemble the curbstones of a street pavement, save that the length is greater. In the top of the stones were holes from which sprang the curved rods, which were equivalent to the ribs of a boat, and formed the walls and roof. The end stones of the house are carefully worked on the curve, and it is very rare to find them still in place, as they were comparatively light, weighing from one to two hundred weight, and easily carried off. 
even the heavier stones were at times seized upon as booty in enemy raids one measuring fifteen feet was pointed out to us near an ahu on the south coast which had been brought all the way from the north side of the island in the middle of one side of the house was a doorway and in the front of it a porch which had also stone foundations the whole space in front of the house was neatly paved with water-worn boulders in the same manner as the ahu this served as a stoop on which to sit and talk but its practical utility was obvious to ourselves in the rainy seasons when the entrance to our tents and houses became deep in mud near the main abode was a thatched house which contained the native oven the stones of which are often still in place the cooking was done polynesian fashion a hole about fifteen inches deep is lined with flat stones a fire is made within and when the stones are sufficiently heated the food wrapped up in parcels is stacked within and covered with earth a fire being lighted on top many of the surviving old people were born and brought up in these houses which are known as hare payanga the old man for example before alluded to who was brought out to raraku roved round the mountain telling with excitement who occupied the different houses in the days of his youth he gave a particularly graphic description of the scene after sundown when all were gathered within for the evening meal in addition to the main door there was he said an opening near each end by which the food was passed in and then from hand to hand as perfect darkness reigned a sharp watch had to be kept that it all reached its proper owners he lay down within the old foundations to show how the inhabitants slept this was parallel to the long axis of the house the head being towards the door the old people were in the center in couples and the younger ones in the ends the largest of these houses which had some unique features measured one hundred and twenty-two feet in length with an extreme width of twelve feet but some fifty feet by five or six feet are more usual measurements they were often shared by related families and held anything from ten to thirty or even more persons the food consisted of the usual tropical produce such as potatoes bananas sugar-cane and taro animal diet formed a very small part of it rats being the only form of mammal but chickens played an important role in native life and the remains of the dwellings made for them are much more imposing than those for human beings they are solid cairns in the center of which was a chamber running the greater part of their length it was entered from outside by two or more narrow tunnels down which the chickens could pass they were placed here at night for the sake of safety as it was impossible to remove the stones in the dark without making a noise fish are not very plentiful as there is no barrier reef but they also were an article of diet and were bartered by those on the coast for the vegetable products obtained by those further inland fish hooks made of stone were formerly used and a legend tells of a man who had marvellous success because he used one made of human bone the heroes of the tales are also spoken of as fishing with nets there are in various places on the coast round towers built of stone which are said to have been lookout towers whence watchers on land communicated the whereabouts of the fish to those at sea these contained a small chamber below which was used as a sleeping apartment turtles appear on the carvings on the rock and are alluded to in legend and turtle shell ornaments were worn but the water is too cold for them ever to have been common and anakina is almost the only sandy bay where they could have come on shore the sole form of dress was the cloth made from paper mulberry and known throughout the south seas as tapa it was used for loincloths and wraps which the spaniards describe as fastening over one shoulder headgear was a very important point as witnessed by the way the islanders always stole the caps of the various european sailors the natives had various forms of crowns made of feathers some of them reserved for special occasions 
cherished feathers particularly those of white cocks were brought out of gourds where they had been carefully kept to manufacture specimens for the expedition the crowns are generally made to form a shade over the eyes like the headdresses of the images naturally every effort was made to find the prototype of the image hats no one recollected ever seeing anything precisely like it but among the pictures drawn for us of various head decorations was a cylindrical hat made of grass the brim projected all the way around as with a european hat but it had the same form of knot on the top as that of the statues tattooing was a universal practice and the exactness of the designs excited the admiration of the early voyagers who wondered how savages managed to achieve such regularity and accuracy the drawings made for us from the descriptions of the old people show the men covered not only with geometrical designs but with pictures of everyday objects such as chisels and fish hooks even houses boats and chickens were represented in this way according to taste the most striking objects were drawings of heads one on each side of the body known as parepu which the old mariners describe as fearsome monstrosities various old persons said that they remembered seeing men with a pattern on the back similar to the rings and girdle of the images it seems however doubtful whether the image design merely represented tattoo in view of the fact that it was raised not incised and in any case this would only put the search for its prototype a stage further back the fact however remains that those particular marks were still being perpetuated and form a link connecting the present with the past beachy in eighteen twenty five tells us the women were so tattooed as to look as if they wore breeches in addition to this kind of decoration the islanders adorned themselves with various colors white and red were obtained from mineral products found in certain places yellow from a plant known as pua and black from ashes of sugar-cane they had a distinct feeling for art some of the paintings found in caves and houses are obviously recent and it is a frequent answer to questions as to the why and wherefore of things that they were to make some object look nice it will be remembered that not only have the images long ears but that all the early voyagers speak of them as general among the inhabitants it was therefore somewhat surprising to find that no such thing was known as a man whose ears had been perforated though with the women the custom went on till the introduction of christianity and two or three females with the lobe dilated in this manner still surviving at last one old leper recalled that the father of his foster father had long ears and on asking as a child for the reason he had received the illuminating reply that the old people had them like that he also mentioned one or two other similar ears and this was subsequently confirmed by other authorities it will be seen that the custom as far as men were concerned of dilating the lobe of the ear must have been abandoned at the end of the eighteenth century or just about the time of the visits of the spanish english and french expeditions that this was cause and effect and that they imitated the appearance of foreign sailors seems more than a guess it will appear from other sources how great was the impression which was made by the foreigners social life rogovine's description of the people as being all shades of color is still accurate they themselves are very conscious of the variations and when we were collecting genealogies they were quite ready to give the color of even remote relations great aunt susan it would be unhesitatingly stated was white and great aunt jemima black the last real ariki or chief was said to be quite white quite like me i innocently asked you they said you are red the color in european cheeks as opposed to the sallow white to which they are accustomed is to the native our most distinguishing mark it is obvious that we are dealing with a mixed race but this only takes us part of the way as the mixture may have taken place either before or after they reached the island they were divided into ten groups or clans mata 
which were associated with different parts of the island, though the boundaries blend and overlap, members of one division settled not infrequently among those of another, each person still knows his own clan. In remembered times there was no group restrictions on marriage, which took place indiscriminately between members of the same or of different clans. The only prohibition had reference to consanguinity, and forbade all union nearer than the eighth degree or third cousins. These ten clans were again grouped, more especially in legend, or speaking of the remote past, into two major divisions known as Kotu or Otu and Hotu Iti, which correspond roughly with the western and eastern parts of the island. These divisions were also known respectively as Matanui or greater clans and Mataiti or lesser clans. The lower portions of the island were the most densely populated parts, especially those on the coast, and the settlements on the higher ground appeared to have been few. In Kotu, the Marama and Haumoana inhabited side by side the land running from sea to sea between the high central ground and the western volcano, Rano Kau. They had a small neighbor, the Gatimo, to the south, and jointly with the Miru spread over Rano Kau and formed settlements by the margin of the crater lake. The Miru lived on the high, narrow strip between the mountain and the apex and the cliff, and mixed up with them was a lesser people, the Hamiya. To the east was another small clan, the Ra, which is spoken of in conjunction with the Miru and Hamiya. The principal Hotu Iti clans were the Tupahotu, the Koro Orongo, and the Hitteria. The last were generally known as the Urahia. They inhabited jointly the level piece of ground from the northern bay to the south coast and had some dwellings on the eastern headland. Next to them on the south coast was a small group, the Ngari. The particular importance of the clans lies in the fact that, while they may be merely groups of one body, they may, on the other hand, represent different races or waves of immigrants. If there have been two peoples on Easter Island, these divisions are one place where we must at least look for traces for it. Legends tell of continual wars between Hotuiti and Kotu. In recent times, general fighting seems to have been constant and took place even between members of one clan. A wooden sword or paua was used, but the chief weapon was made from obsidian and took from it the name of mata. This volcanic glass is found on the slope of Renokau, but the principal quarries are on the neighboring hill of Orito. Tradition says its use was first discovered by a boy who stepped on it and cut his foot. The obsidian was napped till it had a cutting edge and also a tongue, which latter was fitted into a handle or a stick. The various shapes assumed were dignified by names, fourteen of which were given, such as tail of a fish, backbone of a rat, leaf of a banana. It was very usual to pick up these mata, and hordes were occasionally found. In one instance, fifty or sixty were discovered below a stone in a cave, and in another case, the hammer stone was found with them, which had been used in the process of squeezing off the flakes. The weapon was used both as a spear and as a javelin. A site is pointed out near Anakina, where a man throwing down hill killed another at about 35 yards. The art of making these mata is, of course, practically extinct, but one old man, commonly known as he, brought us some which he had manufactured himself for the expedition and which were fairly well wrought. With the exception of the Miru, of which more will be said, there were no chiefs nor any form of government. Any man who was expert in war became a leader. The warfare consisted largely of spasmodic and isolated raids. An aggrieved person gathered together his neighbors and descended on the offenders. It is related, incidentally, that one man, going along the south coast, found war going on, one set of men having blocked up another in a cave. Another story is told of six men called Guaruti Matakiva of the clan Tapahotu, who lived in a cave in a certain hillock on the south coast known as Toa Toa. 
they went round in a boat to hang a pico stole fish and returned rapidly to their cave a hundred men from Hangapico then came overland to punish the robbery and made a fire of grass before the cave in which the men lay hidden when the attackers assumed that the enemy were all dead from suffocation they went into the cave but those within had buried their faces in holes scraped in the earth and when the men from Hangapico entered they arose and slew the whole hundred a more interesting fact came out incidentally in connection with this gang of toa toa connecting them with the secret societies found elsewhere in the pacific they were it was said in the habit of going about after dark with their faces painted red white and black and visiting houses where they declared they were gods and demanded food which the inhabitants accordingly gave them the fraud however finally came to light when one day a man who was travelling with his servant saw them washing paint off their faces so they knew that they had deceived the people and the people gathered together and killed them in these internecine fights fire was very generally set to the enemy's dwellings he often burnt houses a young man said pointing to an older one and the impeachment was not denied the ahu too were raided and bodies burnt which seems to be the cause of the burnt bones recorded by certain travellers there is no reason to suppose there was cremation or sacrifice on easter island it was in this sort of warfare that the last images were overthrown while legends record how many people were eaten after each affray all living persons deny with rather striking unanimity not only that they themselves have ever been cannibals but that their fathers were so if this is correct the custom was dying out for some reason before the advent of christianity their grandfathers the old people admit ate human flesh but if there were any rites connected with it they did not tell the great-grandmother of an old man of the miru clan was according to his account killed on the high central part of the island by the yurio hei and eaten in revenge for the outrage one of her sons hotu by name killed sixty of the yurio hei another son who had pacifist leanings thought the feud ought then to be ended but hotu desired yet more victims and there was a violent quarrel between the two brothers in which the peacemaker was struck on the head with a club for as hotu remarked if they had slain his father it would have been different but really to eat his mother was no good our acquaintance with the person said to have been the last cannibal or rather with his remains came about accidentally during the time when i was alone on the island a little party of us had ridden to the top of the volcano ranokau and on the southern side of the crater that opposite orongo some of the natives were pointing out the legendary sites connected with the death of the first immigrant chief hotumatua suddenly one of them vanished into the crevice in the rocks and reappeared brandishing a thigh bone to call attention to its large size i dismounted scrambled into the little grotto or natural cave where a skeleton was extended the skull was missing but the jawbone was present and the rest of the bones were in regular order the individual had either died there or been buried bones were in the department of the absent member of the expedition but it was of course essential to collect them from the view of determining race and the natives never resented our doing so i therefore passed these out packing them in grass in the luncheon basket and sitting down on a rock asked to be told the story of the cave that my attendants replied is ko tori he was they said the last man on the island who had eaten human flesh in this hiding place he had enjoyed his meals and no one had ever been able to track him there had formerly been a cooking place but it was now hidden by a fall of stones he had died as a very old man at the other end of the island apparently in the odor of sanctity to judge by the toothless jaw if he had not deserted his sins they must long ago have deserted him his last desire was to be buried in the place with which he had such pleasant connections and in dutiful regard to his wishes or because it was feared that his ghost might otherwise make itself unpleasant some of the young men bore the corpse on stretchers along the south coast 
and up to the top of the mountain, depositing it here. The next thing was to get at some sort of date. Chronology is naturally of a vague order, and the most effective method is, if possible, to connect events with the generation in which they happened. Did your grandfather know him, was asked, or your father? The answer was unexpected. Poro, too, they said, pointing to one of the old men, helped to carry him, and a silence fell on the group. My heart sank. I had then undone this last pious work and committed sacrilege. To my great relief, however, strange sounds soon made it clear that the humorous side had appealed to the escort. They were suffocating with mirth. And now, they said, gasping between sobs of laughter, Kotori goes in a basket to England. As I write, Kotori resides at the Royal College of Surgeons and has done his bit towards elucidating the mystery of Easter Island. Sexual morality, as known to us, was not a strong point in life on the island, but marriage was distinctly recognized, and the absolute loose liver was a person apart. Polygamy was usual, but many seem to have had only one wife. The children belong to the father's clan, and are often distinguished by his name being given after their own. At the same time, the clan of the mother was not ignored, and a man would sometimes fight for his maternal side. If a man had sons by more than one wife, after his death each claimed the body of his father to lie on the ahu of his mother's clan, and the corpse might thus be carried to several in turn, finally returning to its own destination. We collected a certain number of genealogical trees, the various dramatis persona being for this purpose represented by matches or buttons. It was not a very popular line of research, the cry being apt to be raised, now let's talk of something interesting. But some two hundred names were in this way placed in their family groups, with details of clan, place of residence and color, and some knowledge obtained with regard to many more. It is not, of course, enough ground on which to found any theory, but it was very useful in checking information gathered in other ways. Only in one case was it possible to get back beyond the great-grandfather of our informant, but the knowledge of family connections was often greater than would be found among Europeans. The number of childless marriages was striking. The early story of Viriamo, the oldest woman living in our day, gives a picture of this primitive state of things. She belonged to the clan of Eurohei, and her family had lived for some generations, as far back as could be remembered, on the edge of the eastern volcano, not far from Raraku. The great-grandfather, who was dark, had as his only wife a white woman of the Hamiya. Their son was white, and had two wives, one of the Tupahotu and one of the Ngari. By the first, although she also was white, he had a dark son, who married a white wife of his own clan, Yurohei, but of a different group. Variamo was the second of their eight children, all of whom were white save herself and her eldest brother. Four of the girls died young in the epidemic of smallpox in 1864. Variamo and two of her sisters were initiated as children into the bird rite. When older, she was tattooed with rings round her forehead and with dark blue breeches. Somewhat later, but still as a young woman, she went over to Anakina and had her ears pierced, but she never had the lobe extended, preferring to let it remain small. When asked about her marriage, she bridled as coyly as a young girl. Her first union was a matter of arrangement. The husband, who was also of the Yurio Hei, giving her father much food, and if she had refused to accept the situation, she would, she said, have been beaten. There was no ceremony of any kind, no new clothes, nor feasting. Her father simply took her to her new home and handed her over. The house was near the two statues with the projecting noses, excavated on the southeastern slope of the Raraku. And when she wanted water, rather than cross the boundary and go round to the lake by the gap, through the hostile dwellers on the western side, she used to clamber with her vessel up the boundary rift in the cliff face. There was one white child who died young, but her marriage was not a success. 
and Variamo left the man and went off to live with one of the Miru clan at Anakina. His house already contained a wife and family, also four brothers, but they all got on quite happily together. She had five children by this man, who, like their father, were all white. Four of them, however, died in infancy. This was the result of the parents having most unfortunately falling foul of an old man, whose cloak had been taken without his consent, and who had accordingly prophesied disaster. The remaining child, a daughter, was living and unmarried when we were on the island. The last husband was the most satisfactory of the three. He was a Tupahotu living near Tongarica. She was handed over to him as a matter of family arrangement in discharge of a debt. But she was quite amenable to the exchange and was very fond of him. He was light in color, but her only child by this marriage, our friend Juan, was dark, taking, as he said, after my mamma. The women do not seem, judging by existing remains, to have had always a happy time. Dr. Keith, who examined the skulls collected by the expedition, concludes his report on one of the female specimens as follows. The most likely explanation is that the indent of the left temple was the cause of death, produced by the blow of a club, and that the superation and repair of the right side has been also produced by a former blow, which failed to prove fatal. Two other skulls, also those of women, showed indented fractures in the left temporal region. Any deficiency in marriages in the way of social festivity was made up at funerals. These were attended by persons from all over the island, for when they were not fighting, they were all cousins. In answer to the remark that, considering the population, their whole time must have gone in this way, it was cheerfully observed that they had nothing else to do. So they all went, everybody took food, and everybody ate. The parents of one of our friends, Kapira, lived in Anakina, but he was born on the south side of the island, near Vaihu, when his mother went for the funeral. The men who knew the tablets went also and sang, but there seems to have been little or nothing in the way of rites. The missionaries were impressed with the fact that there was no ceremony of any kind at the burial. Most elaborate spells were, however, performed in connection with a man who had been slain, known as Tangata Ika, or Fish Man. The corpse was kept from resting either day or night while his neighbors went in pursuit of vengeance. In front of one Ahu on the north coast, some pieces of the old statues have been formed into a rude chair. On this, it was said, had been seated the naked body of a man belonging to the district Kota Varivari by name, who had been killed at Akahanga on the south coast. One man kept the corpse from falling, while two others sat behind and chanted songs to aid the Avengers. These watchers were covered with black ashes, wore only feather hats, and carried a small dancing paddle known as a rapa. The chief man in charge of the ceremony was known as the Timo. It must have been an eerie scene as dusk came on. The story is told of a murder near Tongariki. In this case, the victim's corpse was placed on the ahu and turned over at intervals by the watchers. Hanga Maihiko, a converted image ahu on the south coast, is one of those which have a paved approach, and there are on the pavement two stones, pieces of a hat and a statue, specially used for exposing fishmen. If these charms failed to act, there was a still more reliable way. The clothes of the victim were buried beneath the cooking place of the foe, and when he had partaken of food prepared there, he would certainly die the night following. Some of the carved tablets were connected with these rites. One was certainly known as that of the Ika, while there is said to have been another called Timo, which was the list kept by each ahu of its murdered men. The custom of exposing the dead was, as has been stated, going on in living memory. The information already given on this head is confirmed by the accounts of the missionaries, but burial was also practiced, the mode of disposal being a matter of choice. 
there were two drawbacks to exposure firstly if the deceased was for any reason an uncanny person his ghost might make itself unpleasant he was safer hidden under stones secondly the body if left in the open might be burnt by enemies this latter was the reason given for the burial of the last great chief ngara who was interred in one of the image ahu on the western coast not only were the ruins of the greater ahu still being used but up till eighteen sixty three smaller ones were being built one was pointed out on the north coast as having been put up for an individual the maternal aunt of our guide the lady having had the misfortune to be killed by a devil in the night it was a small structure ovoidal in shape ten feet in length with a flat top sloping from the height of nine feet at the end towards the sea to four feet six inches at that towards the land there was beneath it a vaulted chamber for bones burial cairns called ahupopo were being made in modern times and the man skilled in their construction was amongst those who were carried off to peru the word popo is described as meaning a big canoe such as their ancestors came in to the island it is applied to two types of ahu one of which is obviously built to resemble a boat of this kind there are about twelve in the island one large one measured as much as one hundred and seventy eight feet in length the width being twenty feet while the ends which are made like the bow and stern of a canoe are about ten feet to fifteen feet in height the flat top is paved with sea boulders and is surrounded by a row of the same in imitation of the gunwale of a boat in one such ahu two vaults were found by us just below the surface with perfect burials one was the body of an old man the other of a woman with a child both had been wrapped in reeds and with the body of the woman were some glass beads on the surface of the ahu were a few bones possibly of a body which had been exposed there but the ahu had apparently been built for the two interments it is less obvious why the same name ahu popo should be applied to a burial place which was wedge-shaped in form it follows the lines of the image ahu in so far as having a wall towards the sea flanked on the land sides by a slope of masonry it might be held to represent the prow of a boat but resembles rather a pier or a jetty only some six of these were seen of which the longest was seventy feet one in a lonely spot at the very edge of a high cliff which overlooked anakina bay formed a most striking abode for the dead in a few cases the term ahu is given to a pavement generally by the roadside neatly made of rounded boulders and edged with a curb the form was said to be ancient one of those on the west road was reported as specially dedicated to matatoa which signifies victors or warriors and the same was said of a differently made ahu on the south coast neither exposure nor interment was necessarily confined to ahu and corpses were frequently disposed of in caverns as in the case of kotori three instances were mentioned an uncle and two nephews where the corpses after being exposed were lowered with a rope down the crevices of the cliff of raraku in order to evade the enemy one of the nephews who had been of the party when the final statues were overthrown had met with a tragic end being drowned by catching his hand in a rock when diving for lobsters under water with the exception of those near the standing statues we practically never found an earth burial this seems to account for the exaggerated estimates of the number of human remains on the island it is doubtful if even five hundred skulls could be collected but whether in caves or ruined ahu a large proportion of those which exist are very much in evidence memorials of the dead were erected in various places independently of the actual locality where the corpse rested some of these were simply mounds of earth which can be seen on various hills 
there is a regular succession on the landward rim of the raraku crater opposite to the great cliff but one at least of these was a memorial to a man whose body had been disposed of in the clefts of the cliff others of these independent memorials were in the shape of cairns about six feet in height known as pipi hereco and were formerly surmounted by a white stone many of them still exist and they are particularly numerous on the high ground above anakina cove the locality was chosen as one which was but little inhabited for the taboo for the dead or para extended to them and no one went near them in the daylight on penalty of being stoned till the period of mourning had been terminated with the usual feast various voyagers commented on these cairns which were marked to objects and cook thinks that they may have been put up instead of statues it would seem by the following tale which imposes a somewhat severe strain on the european imagination that piles of stones had in the native mind a certain resemblance to the human figure there was once an old lady who had an arm so long that it could have reached right across the island she was a bad old woman and once a month had a child to eat so a certain man determined to put an end to her power for doing harm he took her out in a boat to fish first telling his small son to collect stones and after they had gone to put them in piles in front of the house of the woman and also to make a fire and much smoke when the canoe had got out to sea he looked back and found the boy had done as he was told and glimpses of the cairns could be seen among the clouds of smoke then he called to the old woman look there are men at your house so she put out her long arm to seize what she thought were the people going to rob her hut whereupon the man seized the paddle and brought it down on her arm and broke it then he killed the old woman and threw her body into the sea life was by no means dull in easter island for if a feast was not being given to commemorate a departed relation it was arranged in honor of one whilst still alive the payana which means simply picture or representation was given by the family as a testimonial of esteem to a father or possibly a brother who might be either alive or dead it was a serious matter and the original direction for the celebration came from a supernaturally gifted individual known as an ivi atua the payana was a large figure made of wooden rods and the host would clamber up inside it and look through eyes or mouth it had a crown made of wings of a particular seabird known as makohi and long ears occasionally it was put up on a special spot where for example a man had been killed but the interesting point in connection with the piana is that the usual place for erection was in front of an image ahu on its landward side and at most or all of the large ahu there can still be seen in the grass at the foot of the paved slope the holes where the payana have stood it was kept in place by four long ropes one of which passed over the ahu the feast was held in the summer and lasted from two to four days at any given ahu there might be only one in the season or as many as five the drawbacks which would have seemed obvious to such a locality did not seem to have clouded the entertainment the feasting was great and consisted largely of rats which were caught in the hen houses the recollection of these entertainments and the crowds who attended them were very vivid and viriamo's eyes brightened as she told of the singing dancing and feasting of her youth there are records of another figure which appears to have been different from the payana it was clothed and known as copeca the spanish expedition of seventeen seventy says that the islanders brought down to the beach on the day when the three crosses were set up an idol about eleven feet high like a judas stuffed with straw it was all white and had a fringe of black hair hanging down its back they put it up on the stones and sat cross-legged around it howling all night by the light of flares as no information was volunteered to us about such celebrations the natives were asked if they had ever known a similar figure 
and an old man at once replied that there had existed one just like the description made of reeds as a memorial of a dead wife or fine child it stood in front of the house or was sometimes carried to a hillock where the people assembled to mourn one of the officers of the la perouse expedition also described a figure seen near a platform it was eleven feet in height clothed in white tapa et tuf blanc de pays it had hanging round the neck a basket covered with white and by the side of this bag the figure of a child two feet long this seems to confirm the information that it was intended to represent a woman another great festivity given for a father either living or dead was the koro this was a house party on a very extended scale a special dwelling made with poles and thatched was put up and according to accounts which surround it no doubt with a halo from the past measured some hundreds of feet in length and twenty feet in height an old man stated that at a celebration at which he was present there were a hundred guests a number which is probably a guess but the addition that there were ten cooking places sounds like memory invitations to these festivities were much in request as there was no work to do presents of food were brought to the hero who distributed them to the party they seemed to have lasted indefinitely going on for months and the time was passed with various entertainments the old people sang and the young people danced and the host who lived in a little house near came and looked on on the last day there was a great feast and the house was broken down with the aid of the carved wooden lizards which are associated with the island we were puzzled in coming across a rough stone building near anakina which seemed to be neither ahu dwelling nor chicken house it had been the men told us a shelter for the posts of the koro where they were kept in readiness for the next celebration there was yet another entertainment which is said to have been the honor of a mother as a koro was of a father in at least four different places on the island are to be seen a dancing ground known as conga it is a narrow strip paved with pebbles over two hundred feet in length by two feet in width and not unlike the paved approach of some of the ahu a demonstration was given of the way it was used the dancers fine men fine women as was explained with emphasis proceeded along it single file holding rapa in both hands in connection with some or all of the kaunga there was a house where the party remained indoors for a long time previous to the dances in order to get their complexions good a touch which shows that a white skin was admired these feasts were held in certain months only determined by the appearance of the heavens after nightfall on the extremity of the eastern headland there is an outcrop of boulders one of which is incised with a spiral design the place is known as kotipapa uihetu or the rock for seeing stars and here the old men came to watch the constellations about two hundred yards from these boulders there is another engraved stone on which ten cup-shaped depressions are visible this represented it is said a map of the stars the season for the payana depended on the position of the three central stars of orion with regard to which the following story is related a certain married woman on going down to bathe was carried off by a stranger when her husband discovered this he slew her in his anger and she fled up to be a star the husband then took their two boys one in each hand and followed her to the sky where the three formed the belt of orion the wife however would have nothing to do with them and remained in a separate part of the heavens this is the only nature myth which we encountered on the island end of section eighteen Section 19 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of Easter Island, 
The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge. Native culture in pre-Christian times continued. Religion, position of the Miru clan, the script, the bird cult, wooden carvings. Religion. The religion of the islanders, employing the word in our sense, seems always to have been somewhat hazy, and the difficulty in grasping it now is increased by the fact that since becoming Roman Catholics, they dislike giving the name of Atua, or God, to their old deities. It only drops out occasionally. They term them Aku-Aku, which means spirits, or more frequently Tatani, a word of which the derivation is obvious. The confusion of ideas was crystallized by a native who gravely remarked that they were uncertain whether one of these beings was God or the devil. So they wrote to Tahiti, and Tahiti wrote to Rome, and Rome said he was not the devil, he was God, a modern view being apparently taken at headquarters of the evolution of religious ideas. Both these words, Tatani and Aku Aku, will be employed for supernatural beings, without prejudice to their original character or claims to divinity. Some of them were certainly the spirits of the dead, but had probably become deified. The ancestors of Hotumatua were reported to have come with him to the island. They existed in large numbers, being both male and female, and were connected with different parts of the island. A list of about 90 was given with their places of residence. No worship was paid, and the only notice taken of these supernatural persons was to mention before meals the names of those to whom a man owed special duty and invite them to partake. It was etiquette to mention with your own the patron of any guest who was present. There was no sacrifice. The invitation to the supernatural power was purely formal or restricted to the essence of the food only. Nevertheless, the aku-aku, in this at least being human, were amiable or the reverse according to whether or not they were well fed. If they were hungry, they ate women and children, and one was reported as having a proclivity for stealing potatoes. If, on the contrary, they were well disposed to a man, they would do work for him, and he would wake in the morning to find his potato field dug, which, as our informant truly remarked, was no like Kanaka. The Aku Aku appeared in human form in which they were indistinguishable from ordinary persons. One known as Uka o Hoheru looked like a very beautiful woman and was the wife of a young Tupahotu who had no idea she was really a Tatani. She lived with him at Mahatua on the north coast and bore him a child. One very wet day she was obliged to leave the house to take fresh fire to the cooking place where it had gone out. When she returned, her husband was angry that she had no red paint on her face, and not heeding her explanation that the rain had washed it off, took a stick to beat her. She ran away and he followed, till at last she sat down on the edge of the eastern headland, where there is now an Ahu known by her name. When by and by he came up, she told him to go back and look after the child, and fled away like a rushing whirlwind over the sea, and was no more seen. Two other female Titani are reported to have lived together in a cave on the cliffside of Parehe, whose names were Kava'ara and Kavatua. They heard all men tell of the beauty of a certain Ure a Hohove, a young man who lived near Hangaroa. So they went down to see him, put him to sleep, and carried him on his mat up to their cave, where they left him. Before going away, they told an old woman also an aku-aku, that she was not to go and look into the cave. This she naturally proceeded to do, and finding Ure, warned him to eat nothing the two Tatani might give to him, supplying him herself with some chicken. When therefore his captors came back and offered him food, he only pretended to take it, and ate the chicken instead. Then they went away again. The old woman came back and said, If cockroaches come, kill them. If flies come, kill them, but if a crab comes, do not kill it. Ure did as he was told, and killed the cockroaches and flies, which were other Tatane. But the crab he did not kill, it was the old woman. Meanwhile, for many days, the father of Ure wept for him, till some men sailing under the cliff while fishing heard a song 
and looking up saw the missing man. But they would not go and fetch him, though the father gave them much food, for the cliff was steep and the cave difficult to reach. At last a woman volunteered for the task, and was lowered over the cliff in a net, and by this means succeeded in fetching Ure safely to the top. The history ends with his return to his home and does not mention if, in correct fashion, he married his fair deliverer. Aku Aku were not immortal. A man called Raraku, after whom the mountain is said to have been named, caught a big heike, which seems to have been an octopus, in the sea near Tongariki, and ate it with the result that he went mad, and all people gave chase to him. He caught up a wooden lizard, and using it as a club, ran amuck among Tatane across the north shore and down the west coast, killing them right and left. The names of twenty-three were given who thus met their fate. Human beings, on the other hand, were liable to be attacked by Tatane, more particularly at night, when there was risk not only to their bodies, but also to their spirits, which were at large while they slept. It is still firmly believed that in dreams the soul visits any locality present to the thought. On one of the ahu is a rough erection of slabs, said to be the house of the Aku Aku Matawarawara, or strong rain. He had as a partner another Aku Aku called Papai Ataki Vera, and they arranged between them that Mata should bring on rain while Papai constructed a house of reeds which was only there at night. Then, when the spirits of sleeping people, which were wandering abroad, became cold with the rain, they went into the house, and the Tatane killed them. The unfortunate sleeper waked in the morning, feeling distinctly unwell. He lingered on for two or three days, and then died. It was not essential to life to have a soul, but you could not really get on comfortably without it. No knowledge survives of any belief or ideas with regard to a future state. The spirit, it was said, appeared occasionally for five or ten years after a man's death, and then vanished. Pan, in the shape of Tatane, is by no means dead. Not only do such beings haunt the crater of Rano Raraku, but tales are told of weird apparitions at dusk, which vanish mysteriously into space. There were no priests, but certain men, known as Korimake, practiced spells which would secure the death of an enemy, and there was also the class known as Ivi Atua, which included both men and women. The most important of these Ivi Atua, of whom it was said there might be perhaps ten in the island, held commune with the Aku Aku. Others were able to prophesy and could foresee the whereabouts of fish or turtle, while some had the gift of seeing hidden things and would demand contributions from a secreted store of bananas or potatoes in a way which was very disconcerting to the owner. There was practically only one religious function of a general nature. It was very popular and had a surprising origin. Attention was attracted on the south coast by a particularly long step of rounded pebbles measuring 139 feet, and obviously connected with a thatched house now disappeared. That, our guide said in answer to a question, is a hare ate atua, where they praise the gods. What gods? The men who came from far away in ships. They saw they had pink cheeks, and they said they were gods. The early voyagers, for the cult went back at least three generations, were therefore taken for deities in the same way as Cook was at Hawaii. The simplest form of this celebration took place on long mounds of earth known as Miro o Orne, or earth ships, of which there are several in the island, one of them with a small mound near it to represent a boat. Here, the natives used to gather together and act the part of a European crew, one taking the lead and giving orders to the others. A more formal ceremony was held in a large house. This had three doors on each side by which the singers entered, who were up to a hundred in number, and ranged themselves in lines within. In one house, of which a diagram was drawn, a deep hole was dug in the middle, at the bottom of which was a gourd covered with a stone to act as a drum. On the top of this a man danced, being hidden out of sight in the hole. In other cases, two or perhaps three boats were constructed inside the house, the masts of which went through the roof, 
These boats were manned with crews clad in the garments of European sailors, the gifts from passing vessels being kept as stage properties. Fresh music was composed for every occasion, and in one song, which was quoted, much reference is made to the red face of the captain from over the seas. The position of chief performer was one of great honor, being analogous on a glorified scale to the leader of a cotillion of our own day. It was stated by an old man that his great-grandfather had so acted, and even the words sung were still remembered. Tehaha, Amiru, gave us to understand that he had been a great social success in his youth and counted up three koro and seven hare ate atua at which he had been present. As he was a handsome old man and was connected with the court of the chief Nagara, his pride of recollection was very probably justified. Juan, mixing up, no doubt, recollections of a later date, gave a vivid representation on one of these spots of the pseudo-captain striding about and using very strong language while he called upon the engineer to make more smoke so that the ship should go fast. The Miru Clan On the borderline between religion and magic, wherever, if anywhere, that line exists, was the position of the clan known as the Miru. Members of this group had, in the opinion of the islanders, the supernatural and valuable gift of being able to increase all food supplies, especially that of chickens, and this power was particularly in evidence after death. It has been known that certain skulls from Easter are marked with designs, such as the outline of a fish. These are crania of the miru, and called puoku moa, or fowl heads, because they had, in particular, the quality of making hens lay eggs. Hotu, the miru, whose mother, it may be remembered, was the victim of a cannibal feast, made his own skull an heirloom, as it was so extremely good for chickens, that he did not wish it to go out of the family. His son gave it to a relative, who was the father of an old man from whom we managed to obtain it. When the time came to hand it over to us, the late owner began to cling to it affectionately and say that he wept much at the thought of its going to England. As, however, the bargain had already been completed, we remained obdurate. And at the time of writing, Hotu resides with Kotori at the Royal College of Surgeons. The Miru were unique in other ways. They were the only group which had a headman or chief who was known as the Ariki, or sometimes as the Ariki Mao, the great chief to distinguish him from the Ariki Paka a term which seems to have been given to all other members of the clan. The office of Ariki Mau was hereditary, and he was the only man who was obliged to marry into his own clan. It was customary when he was old and feeble that he should resign in favor of his son. There are various lists of the succession of chiefs, counted from the first immigrant, Hotumatua. The oldest lists are those given by Bishop Jowson and by Admiral Lapelin, which contains some 30 names. Thompson gives one with 57. In our day, there was admittedly much uncertainty about the sequence, but the number was said to be 30, and two independent lists were obtained. All these categories differ, though they contain many of the same names, particularly at the beginning and end. The last man to fill the post of Ariki with its original dignity was Nagara. He died shortly before the Peruvian raid and becomes a very real personage to anyone inquiring into the history of the island. He was short and very stout, with white skin, as had all his family, but so heavily tattooed as to look black. He wore feather hats of various descriptions and was hung round both back and front with little wooden ornaments, which jingled as he walked. When our authorities can remember him, his wife was dead and he lived with his son Kaimokoi. It was not permitted to see them eat, and no one but the servants was allowed to enter the house. His headquarters were at Anakena, the cove on the island where, according to tradition, the first canoe landed. It is unique in having a sandy shore and is surrounded by an amphitheater of low hills. Behind it to the west rises the high central ground of the island. Beyond it, on the other side, is the eastern plain. It thus approximately terminates the strip of land held by the Miru. There are now at Anakena the remains of six ahu, a few statues, and the foundations of various houses. 
Nagara held official position for the whole island, but he was neither a leader in war, nor the fount of justice, nor even a priest. He can best be described as the custodian of certain customs and traditions. The act most nearly approaching a religious ceremony was conducted under his auspices, though not by him personally. In time of drought, he sent up a younger son and other arikipaka to a hilltop to pray for rain. They were painted on one side red, on the other black, with a stripe down the center. These prayers were addressed to Hero, said to be the god of the sky, a supernatural being in whom we seem getting nearer the idea of a divinity, as distinct from a spirit of the dead, and of whom we would gladly have learnt more than could be discovered. The Arikipaka had other duties besides praying for rain. They made maru, or strings of white feathers tied onto sticks, which they placed among the yams to make them grow. They buried a certain small fish among the sugar canes to bring up the plants. And when a koro was being held, and it was consequently particularly desirable that the fowls should thrive, an arikipaka painted a design in red, known as the rei miro, below the door of the chicken house. Tehaha, the social success, who was an arikipaka in the entourage of Nagara, gave graphic descriptions of life at Anakena when he was a boy. If, he said, people wanted chickens, they applied to the Ariki Mau, who sent him with Maru, and his visits were always attended with satisfactory results. Nagara never consumed rats, and one day, coming across the boy watching rats being cooked, he was extremely angry, for it transpired that, if Tehaha had eaten them, his power for producing chickens would have diminished presumably because he would have imbibed ratty nature, which was disastrous to eggs and young chickens. The Ariki, however, made himself useful to him on occasion. The younger Miru had long hair reaching to his heels, and one day when he was asleep in a cave, someone cut it off. So he went to Nagara, who told him to bring ten coconuts, which he broke and put in pieces of the sacred tree, Nagao Nagao. The spell blasted the offender, who promptly died. Nagara himself attended the inauguration of any house of importance. The wooden lizards were put formally on each side of the entrance to the porch, and the Ariki and an Iviatua, who went with him like a tatane, were the first to eat in the new dwelling. Only the houses with stone foundations were thus honored. The Ariki was visited one month in the year by all people, who brought him the plant known as pua on the end of sticks, put the pua into his house, and retired backwards. He also held receptions on other occasions, seated on the broken-off head of an old image, which was pointed out on a grassy declivity among the hills behind Anakena. These were special occasions for criticizing the tattoo. Those who were well tattooed were sent to stand on one hill slope, whilst those who were badly done were sent to another. The Ariki and men behind him laughed contemptuously at the latter which, as the process was permanent and could not be altered, seemed slightly unkind. These receptions were also attended by men who had made boats, and by twins to whom the Ariki gave a royal name. Such children were not, as in so many countries, considered unlucky, but it was necessary that at birth they should live in a house apart, otherwise they would not survive. This superstition still exists. Shortly before our arrival, a woman in the village had given birth to twins, for whom a little grass house was put up. Another woman went in and brought them out to the mother to nurse. The script. Closely connected with the subject of the Miru clan is that of the method of writing. While we can only catch glimpses of the image cult through the mists of antiquity, the tablets, known as Kohau Rongo Rongo, were an integral part of life on the island within the memory of men not much past middle age. The highest authority on them was the Ariki Nagara. It was tantalizing to feel how near we were to their translation, and yet how far. Tehaha had begun to learn to write, but found that his hand shook too much. Besides, as he explained, Nagara used to send him to the chickens. Juan had had the offer of learning one form of such script, but not unnaturally had looked upon it with some contempt, preferring European accomplishments. The information which could be gathered was, therefore, with one exception, which will be noted later, simply that of the layman, or man in the street, who had been aware of the existence of the art and seen it going on around him, but had no personal knowledge. 
The tablets were of all sizes up to six feet. It was a picturesque sight to see an old man pick up a piece of banana stem, larger than himself, from among the grove in which we were talking, and stagger along with it to show what it meant to carry a tablet, though, as he explained, the sides of the tablet were flat, not round like the stem. It is said that the original symbols were brought to the island by the first comers, and that they were on paper, that when the paper was done, their ancestors made them from the banana plant, and when it was found that withered, they resorted to wood. Every clan had professors in the art who were known as Rongo Rongo men, Tangata Rongo Rongo. They had houses apart, the sites of which are shown in various localities. Here they practiced their calling, often sitting and working with their pupils in the shade of the bananas. Their wives had separate establishments. In writing, the incision was made with a shark's tooth. The beginners worked on the outer sheaths of banana stems and later were promoted to use the wood known as Toro Miro. The glyphs are, as will be seen, so arranged that when the figures of one row are right way up, those of the one immediately below it are on their heads. Thus, only alternate rows can, at the same time, be seen in correct position. The method of reading was, according to Tehaha, to read one row from left to right, then come back reading the next from right to left. The method known as Bustrophedon, from the manner in which an ox plows a furrow. The finished ones were wrapped in reeds and hung up in the houses. According to two independent authorities, they could only be touched by the professors or their servants, and were taboo to the uninitiated, which, however, does not quite agree with other statements, nor with that of the missionaries that they were to be found in every house. They were looked upon as prizes to be carried off in war, but they were often burnt with the houses in tribal conflict. Nagara is said to have had hundreds of kohahu in his house and instructed in the art, which he had learnt from his grandfather. He is described with a vivid personal touch as teaching the words, holding a tablet in one hand and swaying from side to side as he recited. Besides giving instruction, he inspected the candidates prepared by other professors, who were generally their own sons. He looked at their kohau and made them read, on which he either passed them, clapping if they did well, or turned them back. Their sponsors were made personally responsible. If the pupils acquitted themselves creditably, presents of kohau were made to the teachers. If the youth failed, the tablets of the instructor were taken away. Every year there was a great gathering of Rongo Rongo men at Anakena according to Tehaha. As many as several hundreds of them came together. The younger and more energetic of the population assembled from all districts in the island to look on. They brought heu heu, feathers on the top of sticks, tied pua onto them, and stuck the sticks in the ground all round the place. The inhabitants of the neighboring districts brought offerings of food to Nagara that he should be able to supply the multitude, and the oven was five yards along. The gathering was near the principal Ahu, midway between the sandy shore and the background of hills. The Ariki and his son Kaimokoi sat on seats made of tablets, and each had a tablet in his hand. They wore feather hats, as did all the professors. The Rongo Rongo men were arranged in rows, with an alleyway down the center to the Ariki. Some of them had brought with them one tablet only, others as many as four. The old ones read in turn, or sometimes two together, from the places where they stood, but their tablets were not inspected. Tehaha and his comrades stood on the outskirts, and he and one other lad held Maru in their hands. If a young man failed, he was called up and his errors pointed out. But if an old man did not read well, Nagara would beckon to Tehaha, who would go up to the man and take him out by the ear. Our informant repeated this part of the story identically months later and added that the Ariki would say to the culprit, Are you not ashamed to be taken out by a child? The offender's hat was taken away, but the tablet was not inspected. The entire morning was spent in hearing one half of the men read. There was an interval at midday for a meal, after which the remainder recited, the whole performance lasting till evening. Fights occasionally ensued from people scoffing at those who failed. Nagara would then call Tehaha's attention to it, and the boy would go up to the offenders with the maru in his hand and look at them, 
when they would stop and there would be no more noise. When the function was over, the Ariki stood on a platform borne by eight men and addressed the Rongo Rongo men on their duties, and doing well, and gave them each a chicken. Another old man, Jotepha, gave a different account of the great assembly, by which the Ariki sat on his step, and the old men stood before him and prayed. According to this version, they either did not bring their tablets, or their doing so was voluntary. In addition to the great day, there were minor assemblies at new moon, or the last quarter of the moon, when the Rongo Rongo men came to Anakena. The Ariki walked up and down reading the tablets, while the old men stood in a body and looked on. Nagara used also to travel round the island, staying for a week or two in different localities with the resident experts. Another savant on the south coast was said to be too big a man to have a school, and also went about visiting and inspecting learned establishments in the same manner. Nagara, before the end, fell on evil days. The Nagari clan was in the ascendancy and carried off the Miru as slaves. The Ariki was taken to Akahanga on the south coast with his son, Kaimokoi, and grandson, Morata. They were there five years in captivity, and the Miru cried much. At the end of that time, the clan united with the Tupahotu and rescued the old man. He was then ill and died not long afterwards at Tahai, on the west coast, near Hangaroa, while living with his daughter, who had married a Marama. For six days after his death, everyone worked at making the sticks with feathers on the top, heyu heyu, and they were put all round the place. He was buried in the ruined image Ahu at Tahai, his body being carried on three of the tablets, and followed through a lane of spectators by the Rongo Rongo men. The tablets were buried with him. His head paid the penalty of its greatness and was subsequently stolen. Its whereabouts was unknown. Ten or fifteen of his tablets were given to old men. The rest went to a servant, Pito, and on his death to Morata. When Morata went to Peru, Take, a relative of Tehaha, obtained them, and Salmon asked Tehaha to get hold of them for him. Take, however, unfortunately owed Tehaha a grudge, because when Tehaha was in Salmon's service and consequently well off, he did not give him as many presents as his relative thought should have been forthcoming, and he consequently refused to surrender them. They were hidden in a cave whose general locality was surmised, but Take died without making known the exact site, and they could never be found. Kaimokoi's tablets were burnt in war. The question remains, what were the subjects with which the tablets dealt, and in what manner did they record them? Various attempts have been made to deal with a problem which will probably never be wholly solved. Twice before our own day, native assistance has been sought to decipher them. It will be remembered that the existence of these glyphs was first reported by the missionaries. But even at that time, when volunteers were asked for who could translate them, none came forward. Bishop Jowson, vicar apostolique of Tahiti, managed to find in that island a native of Easter, among those brought there to work on the Brander plantations, who was supposed to understand them, and who read them after the Bustrofeden method. From the information given by him, the bishop was satisfied that the signs represented different things, such as sun, stars, the ariki, and so forth, and has given a list of the figures and their equivalent. At the same time, he held that each one was only a peg on which to hang much longer matter which was committed to memory. The other attempt to obtain a translation was that of Paymaster Thompson of USS Mohican in 1886. There was then living an old man, Ure Vaiiko by name, who was said to be the last to understand the form of writing. He declined to assist in deciphering them on the ground that his religious teachers had said it would imperil his soul. Photographs, however, were shown, and by the aid of stimulants, he was induced to give a version of their meaning the words of which were taken down by Salmon. It was, however, remarked that when the photographs were changed, the words proceeded just the same. Inquiries were made by the expedition about this old man, and it was agreed by the islanders that he had never possessed any tablets, nor could he make them, but that he had been a servant of Nagara and had learned to repeat them. Before leaving the island, we went with the old man through the five translations given by Thompson. 
of three nothing was known. One which describes the process of creation was recognized as that of a kohau, but looked at a little askance, as there were Tahitian words in it. The last was laughed out of court as being merely a love song which everyone knew. Our own early experiences had resembled those of the Americans. Photographs of tablets which were produced merely to elicit general information were to our surprise promptly read, certain words being assigned to each figure. But after a great deal of trouble had been taken in drawing the signs and writing down the particular matter, it was found that any figure did equally well. The natives were like children pretending to read and only reciting. It was noted, however, with interest, that in perhaps half a dozen cases, different persons recited words approximately the same, beginning, He timo te ako ako, he ako ako tena. And on inquiry, it was said that they were derived from one of the earliest tablets and were generally known. It was like the alphabet learned first. Ure vai iko had stated that they were the great old words, all others being only little ones. To get any sort of translation was a difficult matter. To ask for it was much the same as for a stranger solemnly to inquire the meaning of some of our own old nursery rhymes, such as hey diddle diddle the cat and the fiddle. Some words could be explained, others could not. The whole meaning was unknown. It seems safe, however, to assume that at least we have here the contents of one of the old tablets. With regard to the other kohau, a list was obtained of the subjects which with they were believed to deal. These amounted to thirteen in all, most of the names being given by several different persons. We have seen that there was a kohahu of the Ika, the murdered men. This was known to only one professor, who taught it to a pupil, and the two divided the island between them, the master taking the west and north coast to Anakina, and the pupil the remainder. A connected or possibly the same tablet was made at the instance of the relatives of the victim and helped to secure vengeance. Certain kohau were said to be lists of wars. Some dealt with ceremonies, and others formed part of ceremonies themselves. They were in evidence at Koro, where Nagara and the professors used to come and pray for the father, and a woman went on to the roof of the house holding the kohau o tepure, prayer tablet. In another case, a woman who wished to honor her father-in-law and at the same time secure fertility set up a pole round which she walked holding a child and a tablet given her by Nagara, while he and other Rongo Rongo men who brought their koau at his order stood by and sang. Perhaps the most interesting tablet was one known as the koau o te ranga. The story was told to us sitting on the foundation of a house on the east side of Raraku, the aspect which is not quarried. This house, it was said, had been the abode of two men, who were old when the informant was a boy, and who taught the Rongo Rongo. Some days, ten students would come, other days fifteen. The wives and children of the old man lived in another house lower down the mountain. One of the experts, Arohio by name, was a Tupuhotu, and had as a friend another member of the same clan called Kara. Kara was servant to the Ariki, and had been taught Rongo Rongo by him, and Nagara, trusting him entirely, gave into his care this most valuable koau known as Ranga. It was the only one of the kind in existence, and was reported to have been brought by the first immigrants. It had the notable property of securing victory to its holders, in such a manner that they were able to get hold of the enemy for the Ranga, that is, as captives or slaves for manual labor. Kara, anxious to obtain the talisman for his own clan, stole the koau and gave it to our Ohio, who kept it in this house. When Nagara asked for it, the man said that it was at Raraku, but before the Ariki could get hold of it, our Ohio sent it back to Kara, and these two thus sent it backwards and forwards to one another, lying to Nagara when needful. The Ariki seems to have taken a somewhat feeble line, and instead of punishing his servant, merely tried to bribe him with the result that he never again saw his kohau. The son of Orohio sold it to one of the missionaries, and it is presumably one of those which went to Tahiti. The matters with which it would naturally have been supposed that the Rongo Rongo would deal, such as genealogies, 
lists of Ariki, or the wanderings of the people, were never mentioned. We were fortunately just in time to come across a man who had been able to make one species of glyphs, though he was no longer, alas, in the heyday of his powers. We were shown one day in the village a piece of paper taken from a Chilean manuscript book on which were somewhat roughly drawn a number of signs, some of them similar to those already known, others different from any we had seen. They were found to have been derived from an old man known as Tomenica. He was, by report, the last man acquainted with an inferior kind of rongo-rongo known as the Tau, but was now ill and confined to the leper colony. We paid a visit to him armed with a copy of the signs, but found him inside his doorway, which it was obviously undesirable to enter, and disinclined to give help. He acknowledged the figures as his work, recited, Hetimo te ako ako, and explained some of the signs as having to do with Jesus Christ. The outlook was not promising. Another visit, however, was paid, this time with Juan's assistance, and though the old man appeared childish, and the natives frankly said that he had lost his memory, things went better. He was seated on a blanket outside his grass hut, bare-legged, wearing a long coat and felt hat. He had piercing brown eyes, and in younger days must have been both good-looking and intelligent. He asked if we wanted the towel and requested a paper and pencil. The former he put on the ground in front of him between his legs and took hold of the pencil with his thumb above and first finger below. He made three vertical lines, first of noughts, then of ticks, gave a name to each line, and proceeded to recite. There was no doubt about the genuineness of the recitation, but he gabbled fast, and when asked to go slowly so that it could be taken down, was put out and had to begin again. He obviously used the marks simply to keep count of the different phrases. At the end of the visit, he offered to write something for next time. We left some paper with him, and on our return two or three days later, he had drawn five lines horizontally, of which four were in the form of the glyphs. But the same figure was constantly repeated, and there were not more than a dozen different symbols in all. It was said by the escort to be lazy writing. Tomenica complained that the paper was not big enough, so another sheet was given, which was put by the side of the first, and the lines continued in turn horizontally. He drew from left to right rapidly and easily. Unfortunately, it did not seem wise to touch the paper, but the writing was copied by looking over it as he went on, with a sincere hope that his blanket did not contain too many inhabitants of some infectious variety. The recitation was partly the same as on the previous occasion, the signs taking the place of ticks. Anything from three or four to ten words were said to each sign. If he made a variation when asked to repeat, it was in transposing the order of two phrases. Evidently, the signs themselves were not to him, now at any rate, connected with particular words. When we subsequently went with our escort into the meaning of the words, it was found that the latter half of each phrase generally consisted of one of the lower numericals preceded by the word tau, or year. Thus, the year four, the year five, etc., the numbers, roughly speaking, ran in order of sequence up to ten, recommencing with each line. The first part of the phrase was generally said to be the name of a man, but of this it was difficult to judge, as children were called after any object or place. Thus, flowering grass might be the name of a thing, or a place, or of a man called after either the object or the locality. Happily, one of the most reliable old men, Capiera by name, had at one time lived with Tomenica, who was said to have been in those days always busy writing, and he was able to explain the general bearing of the Tau. When a choral was made in honor of a father, an expert was called in to commemorate the old man's deeds, how many men he had killed, how many chickens he had stolen, and a tablet was made accordingly. There was, in addition, a larger tablet containing a list of these lesser ones, and giving merely the name of each hero and the year of his coro. It would read somewhat thus, James the year four, Charles the year five, and so forth, going up to the year ten, when the numbers began again. If there were two coro in a year, they came under the same numeral. It was this general summary which had been recited by Tomenica, 
and though there was a certain amount of confusion, each line seems to have represented a decade. In addition, as will be seen, James and Charles each had a kohau of their own. Capiero was able to give a specimen of the lesser tau. It illustrates, interestingly, the general method of condensation in which, even in the recitations, a few words assume or implicate extended knowledge. It ran thus. Of Kao the year nine, Nagakuraria the eldest, then come five men's names followed by the name of a fish, then a doubtful word, then that side island my place. I see Nagakuraria at the Koro. The story, as explained, was that Kao, a man of Vinapu on the south coast, and Nagakuraria, his eldest son, went to Mahatua on the north side and stayed with the five men whose names are given, who were brothers, and learnt from them the Tau. Having done this, they proceeded to murder them, and went and took a fish, then returned to Rano Kau, made a koro, and the Tau. The Tau was, it was said, originally made by an ancestor of the first immigrant chief, Hotumatua. It was not taboo in the same way as the other Rongo Rongo, and was not known to Nagara. There were, about the beginning of last century, only three personages acquainted with it. One was Omatahoi Atupahotu, whose son, Tia Atia, was Tomenika's foster father and instructor in the art. It was said by Tomenika himself and by others that he only knew part, and there were other signs with which he was not acquainted for his foster father had died before he knew all. A great effort was subsequently made to get further information from Tomonika, more particularly as to the exact method of writing, but he was back in his hut very ill, and all conversation had once more to be done through the doorway. Every way that could be thought of was tried to elicit information, but without real success. He did draw two fresh symbols, saying first they were new and then old, and stating they represented the man who gave the koro, but there was no sign meaning a man. He did not know that for Ariki, the old men did. The words were new, but the letters were old. Each line represented a koro. An attempt to get him to reproduce any tau made by himself was a failure. The answers on the whole were so wandering and contradictory that after a second visit under those conditions, making five in all, the prospect of getting anything further of material value did not seem sufficient to justify the risk to others, however slight. As the last interview drew to a close, I left the hut for a moment and leant against the wall outside, racking my brains to see if there was any question left unasked, any possible way of getting at the information. But most of what the old man knew he had forgotten, and what he dimly remembered he was incapable of explaining. I made one more futile effort, then bade him goodbye and turned away. It was late afternoon on a day of unusual calm. Everything in the lonely spot was perfectly still. The sea lay below like a sheet of glass. The sun as a globe of fire was nearing the horizon, while close at hand lay the old man gradually sinking and carrying in his tired brain the last remnants of a once prized knowledge. In a fortnight he was dead. No detailed systematic study of the tablets has as yet been possible from the point of view of the expedition, but it seems at present probable that the system was one of memory, and that the signs were simply aids to recollection, or for keeping count like the beads of a rosary. To what extent the figures were used at will, or how far each was associated with a definite idea, it is impossible to say. Possibly, there was no unvarying method. Certain ones may conveniently have been kept for an ever-recurrent factor, as the host in the Tau, and in well-known documents, such as Hei Timo Te Ako Ako, they would doubtless be reproduced in orthodox succession. But in the tablets which we possess, the same figures are continually repeated, and the fact that equivalents were always having to be found for new names, as in that of the fishman, or Ika, suggests that they may have been largely selected by the expert haphazard from a known number. As Tomenica said, the words were new, but the letters were old. Or to quote Capiera, to the same effect, they were the same picture, but other words. It will be noted how few men are reported to have known each variety of Rongo Rongo, and that while Nagara looked at the tablets of the boys, 
apparently to see if they were properly cut, it was in the recitation only of the older men that accuracy was insisted on. The names which Bishop Josen's informant assigned to some 500 figures may or may not be accurate, but whether the native or anyone else could have stated what the signs conveyed is another matter. It is easy to give the term for a knot in a pocket handkerchief, but no one save the owner can say whether he wishes to remember to pay his life insurance or the date of a tea party. In trying to enter into the state of society and of mind which evolved the tablets, there are two points worth noticing. Firstly, the islanders are distinctly clever with their hands and fond of representing forms. Setting aside the large images, the carving of the small wooden ones is very good, and the accuracy of the tablet designs is wonderful. Then they have real enjoyment in reciting categories of words. For example, in recounting folk tales, opportunity was always gleefully taken of any mention of feasting to go through the whole of the food products of the island. In the same way, if a hero went from one locality to another, the name of every place en route would be rolled out without any further object than the mere pleasure of giving a string of names. This form of recitation appears to affect them aesthetically, and the mere continuation of sound to be a pleasure. Given, therefore, that it was desired to remember lists of words, whether categories of names or correct forms of prayer, the repetition would be a labor of love, and to draw figures as aids to recollection would be very natural. Nevertheless, the signs themselves have no doubt a history, which as such, even apart from interpretation, may prove to be signposts in our search for the origin of this mysterious people. End of section 19, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 30th, 2023. Section 20 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge. Native Culture in Pre-Christian Times Continued, Part 2. The Bird Cult. Knowledge of the tablets was confined to a few, and formed a comparatively small element of life in the island. The whole of social existence revolved round the bird cult, and it was the last of the old order to pass away. The main object of the cult was to obtain the first egg of a certain migratory seabird, and the rites were connected with the western headland, Ranokao. Little has yet been said of this volcano, but from the scenic point of view, it is the most striking portion of the island. Its height is 1,300 feet, and it possesses a crater two-thirds of a mile across, at the bottom of which is a lake largely covered with weeds and plant life. On the eastward or landward face, the mountain, as already explained, slopes downward with a smooth and grassy incline, and the other three sides have been worn by the waves into cliffs over 1,000 feet in height. On the outermost side, the sea has nearly forced its way into the crater itself, and the ocean is now divided from the lake at this point by only a narrow edge, along which it would be possible, but not easy, to walk with safety. At some near date, as geological ages reckon, the island will have a magnificent harbor. Off this part of the coast are three little islets, outlying portions of the original mountain, which have as yet withstood the unceasing blows of the ocean. Their names are Motu Nui, Motu Iti, and Motu Kao Kao, and on them nest the seabirds which have for unknown centuries played so important a part in the history of the island. On the mainland, immediately opposite these islets, there is, on the top of the cliff, a deserted stone village. It is known as Orongo, and in it the islanders awaited the coming of the birds. It consists of nearly 50 dwellings arranged in two rows, both facing the sea and partly overlapping. The lower row terminates just before the narrowest part of the crater wall is reached. The final houses are built among an outcrop of rocks. They are betwixt two groups of stones and have in front of them a small natural pavement. 
The stones nearest the cliff look as if at any moment they might join their brethren in headlong descent to the shore below. Both the upstanding rocks and pavement are covered with carvings. Some of them are partly obliterated by time and can only be seen in a good light, but the ever-recurrent theme is a figure with the body of a man and the head of a bird. Portions of the carvings are covered by the houses, and they therefore antedate them. The whole position is marvelous, surpassing the wildest scenes depicted in romance. Immediately at hand are these strange relics of a mysterious past. On one side far beneath is the dark crater lake. On the other, a thousand feet below, swells and breaks the Pacific Ocean. It girdles the islets with a white belt of foam and extends in blue unbroken sweep till it meets the ice fields of the Antarctic. The all-pervading stillness of the island culminates here in a silence which may be felt, broken only by the cry of the seabirds as they circle round their lonely habitations. The stone village formed the scene of some of our earliest work during our first residence at the manager's house. For some weeks, weather permitting, we rode daily up the mountain, an ascent which took about 50 minutes, and spent the day on the top studying the remains and picking the brains of our native companions. Some of the houses have been destroyed in order to obtain the painted slabs within, but most are in fair and some in perfect preservation. The form of construction suitable to the low ground has perhaps been tried here and abandoned, for some of the foundation stones, pierced with the holes to support the superstructure of stick and grass, are built into the existing dwellings. The present buildings are well adapted to such a windswept spot. They are made of stone laminae with walls about six feet thick. The inside walls are generally lined with vertical slabs and horizontal slabs form the roof. The greater number are built at the back into rising ground, and their sides and top are covered with earth. The natives call them not hare, or houses, but ana, or caves. Where space permits it, the form is boat-shaped, but some have been adapted to natural contours. The dwellings vary in shape and size, from 52 feet by 6 feet to 8 feet by 4 feet. The height within varies from 4 feet to over 6 feet but it is the exception to be able to stand upright. In some cases, they open out of one another, and not unfrequently there is a hatch between two through which food could be passed. The doorway, with its six foot of passage, is just large enough to admit a man. Into each of them, armed with ends of candles, we either crawled on hands and knees or wriggled like serpents, according to our respective heights. The slabs lining the wall, which are just opposite the doorway, and thus obtain a little light, are frequently painted. Some of them have bird and others native designs, but perhaps the most popular is a European ship, sometimes in full sail, and once with a sailor aloft in a red shirt. Inside the houses we found the flat, sea-worn boulders which are used as pillows and often incised with rough designs. There were also a few obsidian spearheads or mata, and once or twice sphagnum from the crater, which was used for caulking boats, and also as a sponge to retain fresh water when at sea. Outside, many of the doors are small stone-lined holes, which we cleared out and examined. They measure roughly rather under two feet across by some 15 inches in depth. Our guides first told us that they were ovens, but as no ash was found, it seems probable that their second thoughts were right, and they were used to contain stores. The groups of dwellings have various names and are associated with the particular clans who, it is said, built them. One house, which stands near the center of the village, Tararenga by name, is particularly interesting as having been the dwelling of the statue Hoa Haka Nananya, roughly to be translated as Breaking Wave, now resident under the portico of the British Museum. Lying about nearby were two large stones which had originally served as foundations for the thatch type of dwelling, but had apparently been converted into doorposts for the house of the image. On one of them, a face had been roughly carved. The statue is not of Raraku stone, and it will be realized how entirely exceptional it is to find a statue under cover and in such a position. The back and face were painted white, with the tracings in red. The bottom contracts and was embedded in the earth though a stone suspiciously like a pedestal is built into a near wall. 
The house had to be broken down in order to get the figure out. According to the account of the missionaries, 300 sailors and 200 Kanakas were required to convey it down the mountain to HMS Topaz in Cook's Bay. The memory of the incident is fast fading, but our friend Viriamo repeated in a quavering treble the song of the sailors as they hauled down their load. The figure is some eight feet high and weighs about four tons. Day by day, as we worked, we gazed down on the islets. The outermost, which, as its name Motu Nui signifies, is also the largest, is most particularly connected with the bird story, which we were gradually beginning to grasp, and at last the call to visit it could no longer be resisted. It was not an easy matter, for Mana was away. The boats of the natives left a good deal to be desired in the way of seaworthiness, and it was only possible to make the attempt on a fine day. Finally, on arrival at the island, it required not a little agility to jump onto a ledge of rocks at the second the boat rose on the crest of the waves before it again sank on a boiling and surging sea till the heads of the crew were many feet below the landing place. We managed, however, between us to get there three times in all. Once, when I was there without S, there was an anxious moment on re-embarking. No one quite knew what happened. Some of the crew said that the gunwale of the boat, as she rose on a wave, caught under an overhanging shelf of rock. Others were of the opinion that the sudden weight of the last man, who at that moment leapt into the boat, upset her balance. Anyway, this tale was very nearly never written. Once landed on the island, the surface is comparatively level and presents no difficulties. It is about five acres in extent, the greater part is covered with grass, and in every niche and cranny of the rock are seabirds' nests. By a large bribe of tobacco, one of the most active old men was induced to accompany us and to point out the sites of interest. Later, we followed up the story at Raraku, and so little by little, at many times, in diverse places, and from various people, was gathered the story of the bird cult which follows. Not many seabirds frequent this part of the Pacific, but on Motu Nui some seven species find an abiding place. Some stay for the whole year, some come for the winter, and yet others for the summer. Among the last is a kind known to the natives as Manutara. It arrives in September, the spring of the southern hemisphere. The great object of life in Easter was to be the first to obtain one of the newly laid eggs of this bird. It was too solemn a matter for there to be any general scramble. Only those who belonged to the clan in the ascendancy, for the time being, could enter on the quest. Sometimes one group would keep it in their hands for years, or they might pass it on to a friendly clan. This selection gave rise, as might be expected, to burnings of hearts. The matter might be, and probably often was, settled by war. One year the Marama were inspired with jealousy because the Miru had chosen the Nagare as their successors and burnt down the house of Nagara. This was perhaps the beginning of the fray when the old Ariki was carried off captive. The fortunate clan, or clans, for sometimes several combined, left nothing to chance. In fact, as soon as one year's egg had been found, the incoming party made sure of their right-of-way by taking up their abode at the foot of Rano Kao, namely at Mataveri. Here there were a number of the large huts with stone foundations. In these they resided, with their wives and families. One of our old gentleman friends first saw the light in a Mataveri dwelling, when his people were in residence, or to use the proper phraseology, when his clan were the Ao. This name, Ao, is also given to a large paddle, as much as six feet in length, used principally, if not exclusively, in connection with bird rites and dancing at Mataveri. In some specimens, a face is fully depicted on the handle. In others, the features have degenerated to a raised line merely indicating the eyebrows and nose. There are pictures of it on slabs in the Orongo houses, in which the face is adorned with vertical stripes of red and white after the native manner, as described by the early voyagers. Naturally, the months passed at Mataveri were occupied by the residents in feasting as well as in dancing, and equally naturally, the victims were human. It was to grace one of these gatherings, when the Urehio Hei were the Ao, that the mother of Hotu the Miru 
was slain in a way which he considered outraged the decencies of life, and it was in revenge for another Mataveri victim that the last statues were thrown down. It is told that the destined provender for one meal evaded that fate by hiding in the extreme end of a hut, which was so long and dark that she was never found. Some of these repasts took place in a cave in the sea cliff near at hand. Here the ocean has made great caverns in a wall of lava, into which the waves surge and break with booming noise and dashing spray. The recess, which formed the banqueting hall, is just above high water mark and is known as Ana Kai Tangata, or Eat Man Cave. The roof is adorned with pictures of birds in red and white. One of these birds is drawn over a sketch of a European ship, showing that they are not of very ancient date. When July approached, the company, or some of them, wound their way up the western side of the hill along the ever-narrowing summit to the village of Arango. The path can just be traced in certain lights and is known as the Road of the Ao. They spent their time while awaiting the birds in dancing each day in front of the houses. Food was brought up by the women, of whom Viriamo was one. The group of houses at the end among the carved rocks was taboo during the festival, for they were inhabited by the Rongo Rongo men, the western half being apportioned to the experts from Hotu Iti, the eastern to those from Katu'u. They chanted all day, they stopped an hour to eat, that was all. They came at the command of Nagara, but it is noteworthy that he himself never appeared at Orongo, though he sometimes paid a friendly call at Mataveri. A short way down the cliff, immediately below Orongo, is a cave known as Haka Rongo Manu, or Listening for the Birds. Here men kept watch day and night for news from the islet below. The privilege of obtaining the first egg was a matter of competition between members of the Ao, but the right to be one of the competitors was secured only by supernatural means. An Ivi Atua, a divinely gifted individual, of the kind who had the gift of prophecy, dreamed that a certain man was favored by the gods, so that if he entered for the race he would be a winner, or, in technical parlance, become a bird man, or Tangata Manu. The victor, on being successful, was ordered to take a new name, which formed part of the revelation, and this bird name was given to the year in which victory was achieved, thus forming an easily remembered system of chronology. The nomination might be taken up at once or not for many years. If not used by the original nominee, it might descend to his son or grandson. If a man did not win, he might try again, or say that the Ivi Atua was a liar and retire from the contest. Women were never nominated, but the Ivi Atua might be male or female, and needless to say, was rewarded with presents of food. There were four gods connected with the eggs. Hawa Tu'u Take Take, who was chief of the eggs, and Make Make, both of whom were males. There were also two females, Via Hoa, the wife of Hawa, and Via Kanatea. Each of these four had a servant, whose names were given, and who were also supernatural beings. Those going to take the eggs recited the names of the gods before meat, inviting them to partake. The actual competitors were men of importance and spent their time with the remainder of the Ao in the stone houses of the village of Arango. They selected servants to represent them and await the coming of the birds in less comfortable quarters in the islet below. These men, who were known as Hopu, went to the islet when the Ao went up to Arango, or possibly rather later. Each made up his provisions into a pora, or securely bound bundle of reeds. He then swam on the top of the packet, holding it with one arm and propelling himself with the remaining arm and both legs. An incantation which was recited to us was said by him before starting. In one instance, the Ivi Atua, at the same time that he gave the nomination, prophesied that the year that it was taken up, a man should be eaten by a large fish. The original recipient never availed himself of it, but on his deathbed told his son of the prophecy. The son, Kilimuti, undeterred by it, entered for the race and sent two men to the islet. One of them started to swim there with his pora, but was never heard of again, and it was naturally said that the prophecy had been fulfilled. Kilimuti wasted no regret over the misfortune, obtained another servant, and secured the egg. 
He died while the expedition was on the island. The Hopu live together in a large cave of which the entrance is nearly concealed by grass. The inside, however, is light and airy. It measures 19 feet by 13, with a height of over 5 feet. And conspicuous among other carvings in the center of the wall is a large au more than 7 feet in length. A line dividing the islet between Kotu'u and Hotu'iti passed through the center of the cave, and also through another cave nearer the edge of the islet. In this latter, there was at one time a statue about two feet high known as Titahanga Otehanua, or the boundary of the land. As bad weather might prevent fresh consignments of food during the weeks of waiting, the men carefully dried on the rocks the skins of the bananas and potatoes which they had brought with them to be consumed in case of necessity. It was added with a touch appreciated by those acquainted with Easter Island that if the man who thus practiced foresight was not careful, others who had no food would steal it when he was not looking. The approach of the Manutara can be heard for miles, for their cry is their marked peculiarity, and the noise during nesting is said to be deafening. One incised drawing of the bird shows it with open beak, from which a series of lines spreads out fanwise, obviously representing the volume of sound. Names in imitation of these sounds were given to children, such as Piruru, Wero Wero, Kaara Ara. It is worth noting that the coming of the Tara inaugurates the deep sea fishing season. Till their arrival, all fish living in 20 or 30 fathoms were considered poisonous. The birds, on first alighting, tarried only a short time. Immediately on their departure, the Hopu rushed out to find the egg, or, according to another account, the rushing out of the Hopu frightened away the birds. The gods intervened in the hunt, so that the man who was not destined to win went past the egg, even when it lay right in his path. The first finder rushed up to the highest point of the islet, calling to his employer by his new name, Shave your head, you have got the egg. The cry was taken up by the watchers in the cave on the mainland, and the fortunate victor, beside himself with joy, proceeded to shave his head and paint it red, while the losers showed their grief by cutting themselves with mata'a. The defeated Hopu started at once to swim from the island to the shore, while the winner, who was obliged to fast while the egg was in his possession, put it in a little basket and going down to the landing rock, dipped it into the sea. One meaning of the word hopu is wash. He then tied the basket round his forehead and was able to swim quickly as the gods were with him. At this stage, sometimes accidents occurred, for if the sea was rough, an unlucky swimmer might be dashed on the rocks and killed. In one instance, it was said, only one man escaped with his life, owing, as he reported, to his having been warned by Make Make not to make the attempt. When the Hopu arrived on the mainland, he handed over the egg to his employer, and a Tangata Rongo Rongo tied round the arm which had taken it, a fragment of red tapa, and also a piece of the tree known as Ingau Ingau, reciting meanwhile the appropriate words. The finding was announced by a fire being lit on the landward side of the summit of Rano Kau on one of two sites, according to whether the Ao came from the west or east side of the island. It will be remembered that on the rocks which terminate the settlement of Orongo, the most numerous of the carvings is the figure of a man with the head of a bird. It is in a crouching attitude with the hands held up and is carved at every size and angle according to the surface of the rock. It can still be counted 111 times and many specimens must have disappeared. All knowledge of its meaning is lost. The figure may have represented one of the egg gods, but it seems more probable that each one was a memorial to a bird man, and this presumption is strengthened by the fact that in at least three of the carvings the hand is holding an egg. The history of another figure, a small design which is also very frequent, still survives and corroborates this by analogy. Within living memory, it was the custom for women of the island to come up here and be immortalized by having one of these small figures, Ko Mari, cut on the rock by a professional expert. We know, therefore, that conventional forms were used as memorials of certain definite persons. The birdman, having obtained the egg, took it in his hand palm upwards, 
resting it on a piece of tapa, and danced with a rejoicing company down the slope of Rhino Kau and along the south coast, a procedure which is known as haka epa, or make shelf, from the position of the hand with regard to the egg. If, however, the winner belonged to the western clans, he generally went to Anakena for the next stage, very possibly because, as was explained, he was afraid to go to Hotuiti. Some victors also went to special houses in their own district, otherwise the company went along the southern shore till they reached Rano Raraku. Amongst the statues standing on its exterior slope, there is shown at the southwest corner the foundations of a house. This is the point which would first be approached from the southern coast, and here the birdman remained for a year, five months of which were spent in strict taboo. The egg, which was still kept on tapa, was hung up inside the house and blown on the third day, a morsel of tapa being put inside. The victor did not wash and spent his time in sleeping all day, only coming out to sit in the shade. His correct headdress was a crown made of human hair. It was known as Hau Oho, and if it was not worn, the Aku Aku would be angry. The house was divided into two, the other half being occupied by a man who was called an Ivi Atua, but was of an inferior type to the one gifted with prophecy, and apparently merely a poor relation of the hero. There were two cooking places, as even he might not share that of the birdman. Food was brought as gifts, especially the first sugar cane, and these offerings seem to have been the sole practical advantage of victory. Those who did not contribute were apt to have their houses burnt. The birdman's wife came to Raraku, but dwelt apart, as for the first five months she could not enter her husband's house, nor he hers, on pain of death. A few yards below the birdman's house is the ahu alluded to on page 191. It consists merely of a low, rough wall built into the mountain, the ground above it being leveled and paved. It was reserved for the burial of birdmen. They were the uncanny persons whose ghosts might do unpleasant things. They were safer hidden under stones. The name Orohie is given to the whole of this corner of the mountain, with its houses, its ahu, and its statues. To this point, the figures led, which were round the base of the hill. If they were re-erected, they would stand with their backs not to the mountain, but to Orohie. As the birdman gazed lazily forth from the shade of his house, above him were the quarries with their unfinished work, below him were the bones of his dead predecessors, while on every hand giant images stood forever in stolid calm. It is difficult to escape from the question, were the statues on the mountain those of birdmen? The hopu also retired into private life. If he were of the ao, he could come to Orohie, but he might, if he wished, reside in his own house, which was in that case divided by a partition through which food was passed. It might not be eaten with his right hand, as that had taken the egg. His wife and children were also kept in seclusion and forbidden to associate with others. The new Ao had meanwhile taken up their abode at Mataveri. From here, a few weeks after their arrival, they went formally to Motunui to obtain the young Manutara, known from their cry as Piu. After the brief visit of the birds when the first egg was laid, they absented themselves from the islet for a period varyingly reported as from three days to a month. On their return, they laid plentifully, and as soon as the nestlings were hatched, the men of the celebrating clan carried them to the mainland, swimming with them in baskets bound round the forehead after the manner of the first egg. They were then taken in procession round the island, or according to another account, only as far as Orohie. It was not until the piu had been obtained that it was permissible to eat the eggs, and they were then consumed by the subservient clans only, not by the ao. The first two or three eggs, it was explained, were given to God. To eat them would prove fatal. Some of the young Manutara were kept in confinement till they were full grown when a piece of red tapa was tied round the wing and leg, and they were told, Kaho ki tehiva, go to the world outside. There was no objection to eating the young birds. The Tara departed from Motu Nui about March, but a few stragglers remained. We saw one bird and obtained eggs at the beginning of July. 
but the natives failed to get any for us in August. When in the following spring the new birdman had achieved his egg, he brought it to Orohie and was given the old one, which he buried in a gourd in a cranny of Ranu Raraku. Sometimes, however, it was thrown into the sea or kept and buried with its original owner. The new man then took the place of his predecessor, who returned to ordinary life. The last year that the Ao went to Orongo, which is known as Rokunga, appears to have been 1866 or 1867. The names of 12 subsequent years are given, during which the competition for the egg continued, and it was still taken to be interred at Raraku. The cult thus survived in a mutilated form the conversion of the island to Christianity, which was completed in 1868. It is said that once the missionaries saw the Ao dancing with the egg outside their door in Hangaroa and told the people it was the devil. It must have been celebrated even after the assembly of the remains of the clans into one place, which occurred about the same time, but it was finally crushed by the secular exploiters of the island whose house at Mataveri, that of the present manager, rests on the foundation stones of the cannibal habitation. The cult admittedly degenerated in later years. A new practice arose of having more than one bird man with other innovations. The request to be given the names of as many bird years as could be remembered met with an almost embarrassing response, 86 being quoted straight away, some of these may be the official names of birdmen and not represent a year, but they probably do so in most cases. Chronological sequence was achieved with fair certainty for 11 years prior to the final celebration at Orongo. In addition to the bird name, the names of both Winner and Hopu were ascertained with those of their respective clans. Two other ceremonies were mentioned in connection with Orongo and Motunui, but to obtain detailed information was very difficult. It finally transpired that of Take no first-hand knowledge existed, as the rites had been abandoned 30 years before the coming of the missionaries. All that can be safely said is that those concerned went into retreat on Motunui, living, it was stated, in the cave where the Hopu awaited the birds. The period was generally given as three months. A vigorous discussion took place on the subject between Viriamo and Jotefa, the oldest man in the village, seated on a log in the garden of the old lady. She was positive, in agreement with other authorities, that Take was for children. The boys and girls went in a canoe to the island. He firmly adhered to the statement that his father went for Take, after he, the son, was born. Tomenika stated that Take formed the subject of one of the tablets, and drew one of its figures, which bears no resemblance to any other known symbol. The details of Manu were more satisfactory. It was known as Timanu Mo Tepoki, or the bird for the child, and the child so initiated became a Poki Manu, or bird child. It could not be found that any special benefit resulted from it, but a child whose parents had not performed the ceremony and whose love affairs, for instance, went wrong might even kill his father in revenge for the omission. An expert known as Tangata Tapamanu, the man who, as Dr. Marit would tell us, knew the right things to say, was called in and given a hen's egg. On this last point, much stress was laid. He was at the same time told the child's name, which was subsequently inserted in the ritual. The child was shaved, decorated with white bands, and hung round with coconuts, or, as these were not readily obtainable in Easter Island, with pieces of wood carved to represent them, called tahonga. A number of children, each with an expert, then went up to Orongo. The correct month was December, and the Ao were therefore below at Mataveri. Jotefa, on whose final account I principally rely, stated that he and nine other children with their parents and ten Tangata Tapa Manu went to Orongo from his home on the north coast, a distance of some 11 miles. They took with them 10 chickens. The party danced in front of all the houses, went to the carved rocks at the end, and coming back stood in a semicircle in front of the door of Taru Renga, the house of the statue, the experts being behind and all singing. No offering was made to the image. Another authority stated that the parents and children went on the roof of the house. 
the experts being below, and the parents gave chickens to the men. Jotepha's party returned to their home, had a feast, and gave more food to the professionals. The Tangata Tapamanu subsequently repeated the ritual at any koro which was being held in the island, the object apparently being to make public the child's initiation. If, by reason of the state of the island, it was not possible to go to Orongo, the ceremony could take place at any of the big ahu with images. Viriamo, whose home, as will be remembered, was near Raraku, said with much pride that she was a pokimanu. She and her three younger sisters had been taken at the same time to the ahu of Orohie. Both parents went, and the mother took two chickens, one in each hand, and the mother and children stood upright, and the Maori sang. They did not go to Orongo because there was war. A drawing was made for us by Juan and the old men of the Pokimanu in ceremonial attire. It was particularly interesting to find, when it was handed in, that circles of white pigment were made on the child's back and also on each buttock, in a way which recalls the adornment of the Anakina image. Wooden Carvings the stone sculpture of Easter Island belongs to an era which is now forgotten. There are a number of wooden carvings which, whatever their original age, are connected with a recent past, and even in a limited sense with the present. The most important of these works, the tablets, have already been dealt with, and mention has been made of the lizard figures. They have the head of that animal on a human body. The ao, the large dancing paddle, and the smaller one, the rapa, are of much the same character, though used on different occasions. The ua is a club, on the handle of which are two heads back to back. These clubs were dignified with individual names. The paoa was a wooden sword. There were also bird ornaments carved in wood, which were worn on the last day of the kora and by Nagara. The rei miro is a breast ornament of a crescent shape, with a face at one or both ends. It is found depicted on the Orongo rocks and frequently on the tablets. It was especially a woman's decoration, but a number of small ones were said to have been worn by Nagara. The specimen in the British Museum is embellished with glyphs, of which no account was forthcoming. Wooden objects which are peculiarly interesting are the small male and female figures, some 20 to 30 inches in height. The natives term them moai, adding the word miro or wood. In a certain number of these, the ribs are very prominent, giving the effect of emaciation. They are called moai kava kava, or the statues with ribs. It has been suggested that this represents the condition in which the first inhabitants reached the island, but such an explanation is strenuously denied by the present people, who assert that their ancestors arrived with plenty of food. The figures have long ears, like the statues in stone, and a marked feature is their little goatee beards. These beards are found in three or four statues at Raraku, in a head in relief on Matunui, and one is indicated in figure 31. But the most striking link with the stone figures is the back, where there is a ring similar to that found on the larger statues. The girdle and M-like design below it also appear in varying degree. A comparative study of the backs of the wooden images has suggested the idea that this M-like marking in stone may be simply the last stage of an evolution in design, which originally showed the lines of the lower portion of the back and thigh. It would be satisfactory if, in the same way, the triple belt could be connected with the ribs and the ring with the vertebrae. But for this, the evidence is less conclusive although the ribs of the body with the lizard head closely approach the conventional. It must be remembered that the figures are nude, and that therefore these designs can scarcely represent any form of dress. There is a pronounced excrescence on the buttocks in the wooden figures, which is also a mystery, but which recalls the way in which the rings on the image found at Anakina and those on the Pokimanu emphasize the same part of the anatomy. The heads are embellished with ornaments, some of which are bird designs. These figures were worn by men only and hung round the neck on important occasions. They were parts of the festival dress at Mataveri and at the Koro. The tradition of the origin of the wooden images is one of the best known and uniformly narrated, but obviously bears the marks of endeavoring to explain facts whose genesis has been forgotten. 
It runs thus. Tu'u Koihu, an Ariki, and one of the first immigrants, was a clever man, or Tangata Maori. He had two houses, one at Ahu Tepeu on the west side, and one at Hanga Hahave on the south coast. The foundations of both are shown. One night, when he was sleeping at the latter dwelling, two female Aku Aku appeared to him, by name Papa Ahiro and Papa Akirani. When he awoke, he took the wood called Toromiro and carved two figures with faces, arms, and legs, just as he had seen the Aku Aku. When he had finished the work, he went over to Hangaroa to fish. He slept there and returned at daybreak, going back by the quarry of the stone hats. Two male Aku Aku, by name Ko Hitirau and Ko Nukutemangoa, were sleeping by the way, but were aroused on his approach by two more Aku Aku, whose names are given, who told them that there was a man coming who would notice that their ribs were exceedingly bad. The two sleepers awoke, saw Tu'u Kohihu, and asked him, Have you seen anything? He discreetly replied, Nothing, and they disappeared. They again met him on the road and put the same question, to which he gave the same answer. When he got to his house, he made two statues with ribs to represent the apparitions. After dark, they prowled round the house listening, with their hands up to their ears, to hear if he gossiped about what he had seen, intending, if he did so, to kill him. The Ariki, however, held his tongue. Later he went to his other home. There he took the wooden moai, both male and female, and made them walk. The house bears the lengthy name of The House of the Walking Moai of Tu'u Koihu the Ariki and is the large one whose measurements were given on page 216. Tu'u Koihu once lent a Moahi Miro to a man whose house took fire while it was in his possession. The Ariki, on hearing of the disaster, told the image to fly away, which it promptly did, and was subsequently found in the neighborhood unharmed. Wooden figures are said to have been made in a considerable variety of forms, some of them being in a sitting position, others with hands crossed, etc. Names were bestowed on them. Twenty-one such were repeated to us. It was not found possible to ascertain exactly what they are all intended to portray, the information being somewhat confused and contradictory. But on the whole, the female figures and those with ribs seem to have been considered to be supernatural beings. They are generally called aku-aku and sometimes atua, while the others represent men. It appears probable that they are portraits or memorial figures of which the older may have attained to deification. This is confirmed by the fact that there is one such figure at the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford with short ears, which is said to have been made to represent Captain Cook. When our friend Capiera was a boy, there were about 10 experts in the island who made wooden articles of various descriptions, including the images, of whom three at least were alive in our time. Tehaha, who was one of the old workmen, could still be seen sitting in his garden engaged in carving Moai Miro. We have, therefore, a craft existing in modern days which can be traced back to pre-Christian culture and which has strong affinities with the prehistoric stone figures. There is, of course, no sentiment connected with the figures of today. They are roughly done and merely for sale. The trade is extended to copies of stone images, which are bought by unsuspecting visitors, with circumstantial tales as to their history or discovery, which would deceive the very elect. The statues on the Ahu near the village, which are made of stone from Raraku, have had pieces cut off them to manufacture into these articles. One Kanaka had, in our day, a still more brilliant idea which saved him all trouble. He sold a fragment of this rock at a high price to a passing vessel as the last morsel of image stone to be found in the island. Local opinion regarding the intelligence of the visitors is not high. One man brought to us a wooden figure for sale, which he said was very old. Indeed, remarked my husband, it has grown up quickly. It was a newborn infant when I saw it being carved in the village a few weeks ago. Ah, said the proud possessor, slightly disappointed, but nursing his creation like a child and stroking it affectionately. He very fine, muy antiqua. I keep him for ships. Capitano Manowari, all same damn fool. End of section 20. 
Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 1, 2023. Section 21 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2023. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge. Chapter 17 caves and cave hunting residential caves caves as hiding places for treasure burial caves easter island from its geological formation is a land of underground cavities between the harder volcanic strata lie softer deposits which have been gradually washed away either by subterraneous streams or as in certain localities round the coast by the action of the waves leaving above and below the more durable substance. There are thus formed grottoes and crannies innumerable. They were used, as has been seen, for sleeping places and for burial, and they also came in handy as treasure deposits. Large caves are comparatively rare, though in one district, underground ways filled with water extend to a great length, and the whole surface rings hollow to the tread of a horse. We daily examined such caves and grottoes as came under our notice, and systematically excavated some half-dozen, which had apparently been used in former days as native habitations. Below the floor of one, Mr. Edmonds had already discovered a small chamber, walled and roofed with slabs, which the natives said had been used as a place of hiding in cannibal days but generally the earth deposit is very shallow and the yields were the same only as those of the houses at Orongo, a few spearheads, bone needles and seashells whose contents had been used for food. There were few objects among the natives which lent themselves to preservation for any length of time. They never made pottery, although there is clay on the island. Wooden articles would generally rot and they had no form of metal. This reflection reconciled us in some degree to what was otherwise a disappointment, our inability to reach the most thrilling of the caves, which are halfway up the great sea cliffs. They can be seen from the ocean and are known to have been used, but the original track has either been washed away by the encroaching waves or lies in a tumbled mass on the beach below. A special voyage was made round the island in Mana, with the object of studying these caves. Some of the expedition went in the yacht and signalled their situation to a second party who rode along the coast and placed marks on the cliff as a guide for subsequent exploration. We finally, however, gave up the idea of attempting to reach them. It would have been possible, no doubt, to have done so from the top, with a rope and experienced climbers, but a certain amount of danger would have been inevitably involved and, considering the smallness of our numbers and the circumstances, we felt it unwise to take the risk of accident. We do not believe, in view of our experience elsewhere, that they are likely to contain anything of material value, but, in any case, they remain unrifled for our successors. Articles which were considered of value by the owners were kept, not in these larger caves, but in little holes and crannies where they could be easily concealed. This practice still continues, both for legitimate and illegitimate purposes. It made it, for example, impossible to trace the stores which were stolen soon after our arrival. The natives are naturally secretive and do not confide the whereabouts of their hiding places, so that when a man dies, his hoard is lost. One old leper, who was said to have some five tablets, reported to his friends that when Mr. Edmonds was making a wall on the estate, the men went so near his cache that he was in momentary dread of its discovery, but they passed it by. He died soon after, and all knowledge of it was lost. The most tragic story is the authenticated one of a man who disappeared with his secret store. 
he had been bargaining with visitors and went to fetch for sale some of his hidden possessions he was never heard of again presumably some accident happened and he either fell down a cliff or was buried alive sometimes a man on his deathbed will give directions to his son as to where things are hidden but natural landmarks alter and this information seems seldom sufficient to enable the place to be recognized treasure hunting on easter island is therefore a most disappointing pursuit as we found to our cost soon after our arrival a man died in the village who was said to have things hidden among the rocks in a part of the coast not far from the village his neighbors turned out to dig we offered high rewards for anything found which were to be doubled if the objects were left untouched till our arrival on the scene and we wasted much time ourselves superintending the search but nothing appeared a young man volunteered the information that he had a cave on ranokao where his father had hidden things and another half day was spent in riding to the spot the whereabouts had only been described generally and he could not find the place yet another day we rode round the eastern headland to find some stone statues the locality of which had been confided to juan by the old man kilimuti who was a member of his family the search was again in vain and juan indignantly characterized his ancient relative as a liar an interesting but equally futile expedition was made to look for a tablet said to have been hidden by a rongo rongo man near anakena the cave in this case proved to have an entrance like a well artificially built up and to be a long natural subterranean chamber there were certain traces which might have been those of decayed wood but nothing more we subsequently discovered that this sort of thing is usual the natives possess not castles in spain but caves in certain localities which they speak of definitely as theirs but which are quite as reluctant to materialize as any southern chateau mr edmonds assures us with amused sympathy that his initial experiences and disillusionment had been precisely similar to our own the natives themselves nevertheless continue to hunt with undiminished zeal for these hidden articles whose value is well known it is the one form of work which they enjoy rumor had come from tahiti shortly before we reached the island that articles were hidden in a recess in the coast not far from the cannibal cave the whole place was dug over and ransacked by treasure hunters from the village without result so far as we ever heard caves were frequently used as places of burial generally as in the case of kotori an isolated corpse was placed in a grotto but on motunui we came across two subterranean chambers which had been definitely prepared as vaults one of these had obviously not been visited for some time as a considerable amount of clearance had to be effected before it could be reached the entrance proved to be a small properly constructed doorway two feet high and eleven inches in width from which a short passage descended at a sharp angle to wriggle down this narrow way felt much like a rabbit going into a burrow the cave below proved to be a circular vault under ten feet in diameter four corpses lay side by side on the floor while a fifth had been hurriedly shoved in head foremost through the doorway above the ceiling and walls were artificially made and covered with white pigment on the walls were three heads carved in relief the only ones encountered they were adorned with touches of red paint the one which was best wrought was twenty inches in length and projected some two to three inches from the surface of the wall it had a pronounced imperial the sides of the cave were also adorned with incised drawings of birds in order to copy these carvings by the light of a small candle it was necessary to encamp among the damp mould of the floor in contact with the remains of the dead the proceeding felt not a little gruesome even to a now hardened anthropologist and the return to daylight was very welcome the other cave on the islet was very similar but smaller in size and the carvings were not so good 
the corpses which it contained had evidently been buried in tapa no information of special interest was forthcoming to account for these burials on motunui if they were associated with any particular family or class the fact has been forgotten the custom is said to have existed of enclosing such articles as chisels and fish hooks in the wrappings of a corpse and it is recorded that the birdman's egg sometimes accompanied him to his last home the idea also of placing her prier dieu in angata's grave seemed to be a survival of such a practice with the one exception however of the beads in the canoe-shaped ahu we never found any objects with the dead the natives who were generally most anxious to reach the inaccessible caves in the hope of treasure felt no interest in one which can be seen from below to have a wall across the mouth and which was said to be a place of burial they considered that it would contain nothing of value it seems therefore probable that belongings buried with the deceased were speedily stolen and have not been available in the memory of this generation it is difficult to suppose that any fear of punishment here or hereafter would deter an easter islander from appropriating any such article for which he had a fancy there may still be accidental discoveries in grottoes of forgotten hoards or a few things treasured in this way by old men may be disclosed but personally we are persuaded that the secret of this land must be sought elsewhere than in its caves End of section 21section 22 of the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mystery of easter island the story of an expedition by katherine rutledge legends first arrival on the island the long ears exterminated by the short ears the struggle between Kotua and Hotuiti. It remains to be seen what accounts the islanders give of their origin and history, in addition to the vague fragments already quoted. These legends fall into three groups, which, though they touch at some points, are in reality separate, and their relation to one another in point of time cannot be certainly ascertained. It need hardly be said that, like all such legends, they cannot be regarded as more than suggestive. When the mysteries have been solved, it will no doubt be easy to see where they have been founded on fact and where error has crept in, and essential points distorted or forgotten. Meanwhile, the clues they afford can only be partial. These groups deal respectively, firstly with the arrival of the islanders under Hotumatua, secondly with the destruction of the long ears, and thirdly with the war between the two sides of the island, Kotua and Hotuiti. The stories have necessarily been somewhat abbreviated. First arrival on the island. The ancestors of the present inhabitants came, it is said, from two neighboring islands known as Marea Ranga and Marea Tohio. Here, on the death of the chief, Koririka Atea, a struggle for supremacy arose between his two sons, Kote Iraka Atea and Hotu Matua, in which Hotu was defeated. Now there was on one of the islands a certain Homaka, who had tattooed Hotu, and received from him in return a present of mother of pearl, which had been given to Hotu's father by an individual called Tuhupatoya. Tuhu had seen that the men who went down to get pearls were eaten by a big fish, so he invented a net by which the precious shell could be obtained without risk, and the pearls so procured he had presented to his chief, Koriri. This man, Homaka, had a dream, and during it his spirit went to a far country, and when he awoke he told six men, whose names are given, to go and seek for it. They were to look for a land where there were three islets and a big hole, also a long and beautiful road. So the six men went, each on a piece of wood, and they found the three islets, Motunui, Motuiti, Motukaukau, and the big hole, which was the crater of Ranokau. 
They landed on that part of the island and planted yams, and then walked round the island beginning by the south coast. When they were near Anakena, one of them, Ira, saw a turtle and tried to take it, but it was too heavy for him to lift. So the other five went to help, but it was still too heavy for them, and it struck out and injured one named Cuckoo. He was taken to a neighboring cave and begged the others not to leave him, but his companions made five cairns outside the cave and departed, and Cuckoo died in the cave. The men went to Hangaroa and on to Orongo. A sixth man then appeared on the scene, but whence he came is not known, and the other five told him that this was a bad land, for when they had planted yams, grass had grown up. Then the men went to Motunui and slept there, and in the morning when they woke, two boats were seen approaching. The vessels were bound together, but as they came near the land, the cord which united them was cut. The name of the one boat was Oteka, and in it were Hotumatua and his wife, Vakai Ahiva. And the name of the other boat was Ua, and in it were a certain Hinalilu and his wife, Avarapua. Ira called to them and told them also that this was a bad land, to which Hotumatua replied that they too came from a bad land. When the sea is low, we die few. When the sea is high, we die many. Then the boats divided, and Hotumatua went round the south and east coasts, and Hinalilu by the west and north. Hotu wished to be the first to reach Anakena, which the previous arrivals had told him was a good place to land. So when he saw the other vessel approaching, he said to himself a word, which made his own boat go fast and Hinalilu's go slow. So he got first to the cove. A son was born there to Vakai and named Ko Tumaheke. Hinalilu was a man of intelligence and wrote Rongo Rongo on paper he brought with him. Amongst those who came in the boats was the Ariki Tuuko Ihu, the maker of the wooden images. Two of his sons and two grandsons have given their names to four subdivisions of the Miru clan. Among Hotumatua's company there was a concealed passenger whose name was Oroi. He was an enemy of Hotu, who had killed his children in the place whence they came, and had hidden himself on board. He got on shore at Anakena without anyone having guessed at his presence, and killed everyone. One day the five children of a man named Orika went to bathe at Oahi, a small cove east of Anakena, and as they lay on a rock in the sea, Oroi came from behind and killed them and took out their insides. When they did not return, the father said to the mother, Where are the children? The mother said, On the rock. But when Aorika went to look, the rock was covered with water, for it was high tide. When by and by the water went down, he saw the five children and that they were dead. Aorika then told Hotumatua, Oroi, that bad man is here for he has killed my children. Now Hotumatua went to see his daughter who was married, and as he went, Oroi put a noose in his path and tried to catch his foot in it, but Hotu stepped on one side. When he had finished his visit to his daughter, he said to her and her husband, Follow me as I go home. And as he returned, he saw that the cord was still there and his enemy hidden behind the rock. This time Hotumatua intentionally stepped on the rope and fell, and when Oroi came up, he got hold of him and killed him, and then called to his daughter and son-in-law to see that he was dead. When, however, they put the corpse in the oven to cook him, he came to life again, so they had to take him over to the other side of the island to where the Ahu is called Oroi, and there he cooked quite satisfactorily, and they ate him. Hotumatua had many sons from whom the different clans are descended, and whose names they bear. He quarreled with the eldest, Tumaheki, and with his own wife, Vakai, the two having behaved badly to him. He finally gave up his position to Tumaheki and retired to the top of Ranokao, where he lived on the south side of the crater, that opposite to Orongo. He was old and blind, and became also very ill. His elder sons came to see him, but he kept asking for Hotuiti, the youngest, who was his favorite. When Marama appeared, the old man felt the calf of his leg and said, You are not Hotuiti, you are Marama. Where is Hotuiti? 
Koro Orongo answered as if he were Hotuiti and said, I am here. But he lied, and his father took hold of his leg and said again, You are not Hotuiti. And the same thing happened with Nagare and Ra and Hamea and the others, and at last came Hotuiti, and Hotumatua knew him, for he was small and his leg was slight, and said to him, You are Hotuiti of Mataiti, and your descendants shall prosper and survive all others. And he said to Kutu, You are Kutu of Matanui, and your descendants shall multiply like the shells of the sea and the reeds of the crater and the pebbles of the beach, but they shall die and shall not remain. And when he had said this, he left his house and went along to the cliff where the edge of the crater is narrowest and stood on it by two stones. And he looked over the islet of Motunui towards Marea Renga and called to four Aku Aku in his old home across the sea. Kuihi, Kuaha, Tongao, Opakako, make the cock crow for me. And the cock crew in Marai Renga, and he heard it across the sea. That was his death signal. So he said to his sons, Take me away. So they took him back to his house, and he died. Thus Hotumatua came to his end and was buried at Akahanga. Many of the gods of Mara'a Renga, who were the ancestors of Hotumatua, came with him in his boat, and he knew they were there, though the others did not see them. The names of eleven of them were given, four of which were independently quoted as amongst the Aku Aku associated with Akahanga. The Story of the Long Ears Now the long ears, Hana'u Epe, and short ears, Hana'u Momoku, lived together mixed up all over the land. But one of the long ears, Koita by name, who lived at Orongo, had in his house the bodies of thirty boys, whom he had killed to eat. Among his victims were the seven sons of one man, Kopepi. Kopepi went mad and ran round and round till he fell down, and his brothers took their mata'a and killed the long ears at Vinapu and at Orongo. They were joined by the other short ears till the long ears took refuge in the eastern headland, across which they then dug a ditch and filled it with brushwood in order to make a fire in self-defense. Now a body of the short ears were drawn up in array in front of the ditch, but another party was shown the way round at night by an old woman and thus turned their flank. So when morning dawned, the long ears found themselves attacked both from behind and before, and then were swept into the ditch of their own making. There they were all burnt except two, who made their way to a cave near Anakena, where they hid, but they were dug out of it and killed, calling aloud Oroini, the meaning of which is not known. Such is the outline of these stories. The most definite and agreed points are the most incomprehensible namely the landing of the six men prior to that of the main wave and the concealed arrival of Oroi. The sons of Hotumatua are not known exactly. Kotua is sometimes identified with Ko Tuumaheki and is sometimes a separate person. Miru occasionally figures as one of them, which is inconsistent with the statement that four of Tuukoihu's descendants are the ancestors of four subdivisions of that clan. Miru is also the name given in all the lists to Tutumahiki's son, the third Ariki. Hotuiti was always a district, never the name of a clan. On the most interesting point, namely the origin of the long ears, there is the most vagueness. According to Kilimuti, who was a recognized authority and whose account of the landing has been followed, Hotumatua and those in his boat were the short ears. Hinalilu and the crew of the second boat, the long ears. When asked how it was that the two came together, he merely replied that it was in the same way as we ourselves had various nationalities on the yacht. According to this authority, the destruction in the ditch took place in the time of Hotumatua's children. Another version, given by three old men in conclave, was that the long ears came into existence on the island through the mana of the third Ariki. Discussion one day waxed quite fierce on the point till Tehaha's wife, who was a shrewd middle-aged woman, turned and said, Never mind them, Mama. They don't know anything about it, which probably summed up the situation. 
The story of the ditch and the final extinction is well-established legend. The term long ears seemed to convey to the natives not the custom of distending the ears, but having them long by nature. It is interesting to compare the versions of these stories given to the expedition with those taken down from Salmon by Paymaster Thompson of the Mohican. The statement made by him and repeated by various travelers, probably from the same source, that Hotumatua came from the east was never met with by us. Kilimuti did not know whence he came. The direction in which Hotumatua looked when dying would be west, or more accurately, southwest. Juan put the home of the first immigrants in the Paumotu. As a young man, his knowledge of legend was a step further from the original, but it was often useful as summing up the general impression he had received. According to the Mohican story, the six early arrivals included the brother of Hotumatua and his wife. Oroi had been the rejected suitor of this lady, and it was the competition for her favor which had caused the quarrel with the family. The same authority states that Hotu was in the boat which went by the south and east, and his wife Vakai in the other. Hinalilu does not appear. Hotu is depicted as dividing the land between his sons, but there is no mention of the ultimate triumph of the descendants of Hotu Iti over those of Katu'u, which, as told to us on more than one occasion, was the chief point in the story. The finale, in which the old man looked towards his old home, is omitted. The long ears suddenly appear on the island at a much later time. The story of the ditch is much the same. Wars between Kotu'u and Hotu'iti Kainga was a great man, and he lived near Tongariki. He had three young sons. Two of them lived with him, one of whom was named Huriava'i, and the other was called Rau Hiva Aringa Erua, literally twin two faces for he had been born with two faces, one of which looked before and the other behind. Kainga's third son was named Mahanga Rake Rake A Kainga. He was not treated well at home and had been adopted by a woman who lived not far away, and there he had much fish to eat. Now one day two men came to Kainga's house and slept there. They were Marama from Hanga Roa, and their names were Makita and Roke Ava. Kainga killed two chickens and cooked the food and took it to his guests. Roke was asleep, and Makita said, What is this? And Kainga replied, Chicken. And Makita said, I do not like it. I want man. Kainga did not like to refuse, and went outside and said to his two boys, Go and tell Mahanga to come here. So the children went and gave the message. When Mahanga heard it, he cried. But when he had done weeping, he went back with his brothers. Kainga said to him, Lie down and go to sleep. And Kainga took a club and hit the child on the head and killed him. Then he cooked part of the body and gave it to Makita, saying, Here is food, and went back to the cooking place. Makita saw that it was human flesh and wakened Roke and told him. And Roke was alarmed and said, I do not like it. He broke the house of Kainga and hurried away. Makita also departed quickly. Kainga was very angry and said to the two men, Why do you throw away my food? And he took the body of the child and wrapped it in reeds and put it on the ahu. Kainga then said, Bring me much wood to make a boat. And all men worked at the boat of Kainga, and he gave them much food, chickens and potatoes and bananas, sugar cane, hens and fish and eels, but they did not make it well. Then Kainga sent for Tuukoihu, the chief who lived at Ahutepua, on the western side, and said, Come to me to make the boat. And Tuukoihu came, and he made a good boat twenty fathoms long, and when it was finished it was launched, and thirty men went in it to row. Now Makita and Roke and the people from Hangaroa and that part of the island had taken refuge on Motu Nui and other islets of the coast off Rano Kau. Kainga went in the boat to Motunui and rowed all around it, and Kainga called to the people on the island, Come out that I may see you. And they were all very frightened of Kainga, because he was a big man. So one after another all the men on the island came out that he might see them, and he said, Are there no more? And they looked and saw that there were two more hidden. 
So they brought them out, and they were Makita and Roke. And Makita he slew, but Roke he let go. Now there was war between one side of the island and the other side. The Koro Orongo, the Tupahotu, the Yure Ohei, and Nagare fought the Hau Moana, Miru, Marama, Hamea, and the Ra. Kainga fought with his spear against one of the Miru named Toari and was angry because he could not kill him. He went to his house and killed a white cock and gave it to the child Huriavai to eat. And then he took five mata'a and bound them on wood. That evening, Huri Ava'i went to sleep. He dreamed that the white cock was coming towards him and that he threw a stone at the bird and killed it, and he waked up afraid. Kainga said, What is it, child? And the boy answered, It is the white cock. He is dead. And Kainga was glad of the dream and said joyfully, He is dead. Tomorrow morning early at five o'clock, we will go and fight. So on the morrow he took the five mata'a in his hand and Huri Ava'i on his back. The men of Hotuiti fought the men of Anakena and Hangaroa. Kainga did not go into the battle, but he stood a little way off with the child, and he saw that Toari no one could kill. And he said to the child, Go, boy, and take two spears. Huri Ava'i was frightened, but he took two spears and went into the battle. The men of Anakena came to kill the boy, but he did not run away. They threw their spears, but they glanced off the child. Then all Kainga's men came forward, and they threw their spears at Toari. But Uriavahi threw one spear, and he killed him, and he lay dead. Kainga saw his enemy was slain, and took the boy on his back and went away quickly. When Kainga was gone, all the people of Hotuiti fled, and the people of Anakena pursued, and they killed all the people of Hotuiti, thousands and thousands and thousands, women and children and little children, big children and young men, and old men who could not walk away quickly. Some of those who escaped took refuge in the cave known as Anate Avanui, and others fled to the island of Marutiri. Kainga went to Marutiri, but Huri Avahi hid in a hole on the mainland opposite. His brother, who had two faces, was killed by a man named Pau Aurevera. The face behind said, I see Pau Aurevera. He comes to me with a spear in his hand. You look, too. But the face in front said, I do not like to look. You look. The face behind was angry and said, You look, too. And while the two faces talked, Pau struck the boy with his spear in the neck, and he fell dead. And Kainga saw from the island the fall of his son. The day after the battle, when Hotu Iti had been vanquished, Poie, who was one of the Ahumoana and a big man, came to live at Anahavea, the cave near Tongariki, and took a large boat with thirty men and went to the island of Marotiri. On the island were many thousands of the people of Hotuiti, but among them there was one man, Vaha. His father was of Hotuiti, but his mother was of Anakena. He was the father of Tuari, who was killed by Huriavahi. So he hated the men of Hotuiti, but no man dared kill him. When Poihe came in his boat, he said to Vaha, Give me men to cook. Vaha gave him one thousand in the boat. And Poihe went back to the shore and gave each of the men of Anakena a man to eat. He took thousands of children by the leg and dashed them against the stone. Every day he did the same again and brought a thousand men from Marotiri. One day when the boat came back, a man called Oho Takatori, a miru, was at Anahaveha and saw Poi throwing the men on shore, and among them a man named Anga Mai Ihi Te Kerau, and Oho Takatori said to Poi, Give me for my fish that man with a fine name. Poi said, I give no fish with a fine name to you who begin work at nine o'clock in the morning. Oho was angry with Poi. He was wearing a hat with cock's feathers sticking out in front, and he turned it round backside front and went to the house of his daughter, who had married a man of Hotuiti called Moa and lived near Tongariki. He said to her, Do not let your husband mourn for the men of Hotuiti. The girl replied, He does not tell me, but I think he mourns much. She gave her father food to eat, and he went to his own home, 
the other side of the island. When Moa came in from digging potatoes, his wife said, Your father-in-law has been here, and he said that you were not to cry for the men of Hotuiti. And Moa replied, I must mourn, but you are of Hangaroa. And he did not eat any potatoes, but wept. The men who had not taken refuge on Marotiri were, as has been told, in Anate Avanui. And the men of Anakena had made twenty holes in a row in the cliff above, and they stood in the holes one behind the other and lowered a net over the edge of the cliff with two men in it with spears. And the men in the holes held the rope and let down the net. And the men in the net shouted to them, Pull up or give way, till they were opposite the cave, and then they killed the men in the cave with their spears, and three brothers of Oho worked with these men. At five o'clock in the evening, when his wife did not know, Moa took all sorts of food and buried them so that no man should see. And at seven o'clock he said to his wife, Give me the big net. And she said, Are you going to take fish? And he said yes, but he lied. He was going to Te Avanui. He took the net and the food. By and by he left the net behind, but he kept the food and went to Maunga Tea Tea. There were many of Poe's men there, and all over Poiki, but they were asleep. He gathered there eight branches of palm, put them on his back, and went to the cave, and all the men on the top of the cliff were asleep. And Moa went down the cliff by the track and entered the cave. The men inside did not sleep. They said, Who are you? And he said, Hush, I am Moa. There were only thirty men alive. For two and a half months, they had had nothing to eat in the cave, and only the strongest were left. Moa gave the men the juice of the sugar cane like water and little bits of potato, and then he asked, Where are the bones of the warrior Peri Roki Roki? They replied, He is down there. So Moa said, Bring them to me. And Moa made fish hooks of bone and bound a hook to a palm branch. Then he said to the men, I have made one for you, make seven. And he went back. When the net came down in the morning, the men in the cave caught it with the hooks on the branches of palm, and the men in the net called to those above to drag up. But the men gave more line, and the men in the cave killed the men in the net, and then they climbed up the rope and killed all the men at the top except the brothers of Oho, those they did not kill. Three days before this, the men on Marotiri had rid themselves of Vaha. It was in this way. The boy, Huriavai, who was in a hole on the mainland, was very hungry, for he was not old enough to catch fish, and he ate seaweed. Vaha, on the island opposite, took the stem of a banana and cut it into pieces, so that it looked like yams, and put it where the boy could see it. And Huriavahi said, My father has plenty of food. So he swam across, and Vaha killed him. Then Vaha took the corpse and swam with it to the mainland. It was dark, but Kainga listened and heard the swish of the water, and he too went into the sea and followed him. And when he got to shore, he hid behind a big stone, and when he saw Vaha coming, carrying on his back the body of the child, he wept, and Kainga said, Who are you? And he replied, I am Vaha. And Kainga said, I am Kainga, the slayer of Vaha. And he slew him and took the corpse of Huriavahi to the Ahu, and then came and took the body of Vaha as fishman for food, brought it to Marotiri, and gave pieces to all the people on the island. There were thirty men then left there, but they had no fire, so they cooked the flesh in their armpits. Three days after this, the men from Te Avanui came along, and they shouted across from the mainland. We have killed the men in the net. And Marotiri shouted back, We too have killed a man. And they were all full of joy. The island men swam ashore, and they killed all the men at Ana Havea. The men from Marotiri went in one direction, and the men from Te Avanui in another, killing and slaying everyone. But Kainki went with neither, for he wished to find Poei. He went to Ana Havea, but his enemy had fled and he followed him all along the south coast till they were not far from Vaihu. Poie was a very big man, but Kainga was a little one, and he had nothing to eat. He called to Poie, You have food, I have none. I shall not kill you. I will go back, but another day I will kill you. 
The two parties of Hotu Iti men had now joined one another, and Kainga went with them. Men and old men, old women and children, they killed all. But the fine women they took. The sixty men divided the women between them. A man would say to a woman, Do you like me? And if she said no, then he killed her. Kainga told the men from Te Avanui to go to one place, and the men from Marutiri to go to another, and live with their wives and beget children. And so they did. But Poie went to Hangaroa. Kainga told a Tupahotu called Mayukuku to give his daughter to Poie. So she went to him and bore him many children. And one day, when years had gone by, Kainga called together his men and went over at night to the other side of the island to fight. Maikuku was staying in the house of his daughter, and Kainga had told him, If Poie is not in the house, sleep with your head outside the door. And Kainga came and looked and saw that the head of Maikuku was outside, and he said to him, Then Poie is not here? And he said, No, he has gone to the sea. The granddaughter of Maikuku heard and was angry for her father, and she went a little way up the hill outside and cried aloud, The enemy are coming to fight, and your father-in-law is very bad, although he has had bananas and fish and much to eat. Poie heard the child speak, and he and his five brothers hid their net and the fish, and they ran along the coast towards Ranokau, and Kainga went too, and then they swam to Motunui. Kainga followed, and they went on to Motuiti, and then swam to the land again, and came ashore at the foot of the cliff below Orongo, and Poie's brothers tried to run up the hill, but Kainga's men caught them and killed four. As Poie came up, the blood of his brothers flowed down, and he wept. But Poie they did not kill, because he had married the daughter of Maikuku, and because they were all afraid. Now Kirireva, a child of Hotuiti, whose father had been killed by Poie, stayed at Orongo, and the child asked if they were not going to kill Poie. And the old men said, No, we have already killed four. Kirireva shaved all his hair and his eyebrows, and put on red paint, and told Poie to stand up, and he ran three times between his legs, and the third time Poie fell, and the boy killed him with a club because he had slain his father. Now, when Poie was dead, Kotu'u was finished, and Hotu'iti victorious according to the words of Hotu'matua. The middle part of this story is briefly told by Thompson, but his account differs in important points from the foregoing. Moa is represented as the son of Oho Takatore, instead of his son-in-law, and his action is designed to avenge his father. This is a more comprehensible version. Kainga is dead, Kuriavai is on Marotiri, and on swimming ashore is killed by one of the enemy. Vaha is Huriavai's friend, who kills the slayer and swims back to Maratiri with the enemy's body. Our informant, Capiera, was quite positive that the events took place during the time of Nogara's grandfather, and refused to be dislodged from his position because Juan pertinently pointed out that this was inconsistent with the boat being made by Tuuko Ihu, who landed with Hotumatua. End of section 22 Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, July 8, 2023. Section 23 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition, by Catherine Vutledge. Chapter 19, The Present Position of the Problem. Do not be afraid of making generalizations, because knowledge is as yet imperfect or incomplete, and they are therefore liable to alteration. It is only through such generalizations that progress can be made. Dr. A.C. Hayden, as President of the Folklore Society, 1919. As we leave Easter Island, we pause to review our evidence, 
and find how far we have progressed toward the solution of its problems. We may dismiss the vague suggestion that the archaeological remains in the island survive from the time when it was part of a larger mass of land. Whatever may be the geological story of the Pacific, no scientific authorities are prepared to prove that such stupendous changes have taken place during the time which it has been inhabited by man. Instead of indulging in surmises as to the state of the world in a remote past, it is safer to begin with existing conditions and try to retrace the steps of development. It has already been seen that various links connect the people now living on Easter Island with the great images. Tradition is not altogether extinct. In a few cases, the names of the men are actually remembered who made the individual statues, and also those of their clans which are still in existence. But the two strongest bonds are the wooden figures and the bird cult. The wooden figures were being made in recent times, and they have a design on the back resembling that on the stone images, while they also possess the same long ears. There is no reason why a defunct type should have been copied, and it is probable that they date at least as far back as the same epoch. The bird cult also was alive in living memory. It is allied to that of the statues by the residence of the bird men among the images, by the fact that the bird right for the child was connected with them, and above all by the presence of a statue of typical form in the presence of the village at Orongo. Assuming then, at any rate for the sake of argument, that the stone figures were the work of the ancestors of the people of today, the next step is to inquire who these people are. Here, for a certain distance, we are on firm ground. They are undoubtedly connected with those found elsewhere in the Pacific. Much of their culture is similar, and even the earliest voyagers noted that their language resembled that found on the other islands. The suggestion that Easter Island has been populated from South America may therefore, for practical purposes, be ruled out of the question. If there is any connection between the two, it is more likely that the influence spread from the islands to the continent. Having reached this point, however, we are faced by the larger problem. Who were the race, or races, who populated the Pacific? Here our firm ground ends, for this is a very complicated subject, with regard to which much work still remains to be done. It is impossible as yet to make any broad statement which is not subject to qualification, or which can be implicitly relied on. The Solomon Group and other islands off the coast of Australia are inhabited by a people known as Malaysians, who have dark skins, fuzzy hair, and thick lips, resembling to some extent the natives of Africa. This area is called Melanesia. Certain outlying islets are, however, populated by a different race, who possess straight or wavy hair and fairer skins. Eastward of a line which is drawn at Fiji, this whiter race, called Polynesian, predominates, and the eastern part of the Pacific is known as Polynesia. Broadly speaking, the theory generally accepted has been that Negroid people are the earliest denizens, and that the lighter race came down into Melanesia through the Malay Peninsula, and thence passed on through Melanesia in a succession of waves. A large proportion of the invaders were probably of the male sex, and took wives from amongst the original inhabitants. They absorbed, in many ways, the culture of the older people, but did not wholly abandon their own. It is suggested, for instance, that while as a whole the conquerors adopted existing religions, the secret societies, so often found in the Pacific, are connected with their own rites and beliefs, which were guarded as something sacred and apart. It will easily be seen that the task of tracing these migrations is by no means simple. Canoes, carrying fighting men or immigrants, bent on victory or colonization, pass continually from one island to another, and each island has probably its own very complicated history. The Maoris of New Zealand, for example, are a Polynesian race, but there are also traces there of a darker people. Absolutely Negroid elements are found as far east as the Marquesas. Our servant Mahunga, whose features are of that type, came from the Pamuto Islands. The marvelous feats of seamanship performed in these wanderings, often against the prevailing trade wind, would be incredible if it were not obvious that they have been actually accomplished. The loss of life was doubtless very great, and many boats must have darted forth and never been heard of more. The fact remains, however, that native canoes have worked their way over unknown seas as far north as the Hawaiian or Sandwich Islands, 
and that somehow or other they reached that little spot in the waste of waters now known as Easter Island. The nearest land to Easter now inhabited, with the exception of Pitcairn Island, is in the Gambier Islands about 1,200 miles to the westward. The little coral patch Ducey Island, which lies between the two, is nearly 900 miles from Easter and has no dwellers. It has been suggested that the original emigrants may have intended to make a voyage from one known island to another and have been blown out of their course. However this may be, a long voyage must have been foreseen, or the boats would not have carried sufficient provisions to reach so distant a goal. It is even more strange to realize that, if the mixture of races found among the islanders occurred after their arrival, more than one native expedition has performed the miracle of reaching Easter Island. The traditions of the present people do not, as has been seen, give very material assistance as to the composition of the crew, nor how they reach the island. They tell us that their ancestors were compelled to leave their original home through being vanquished in war. This was a very usual reason for such migrations, as the conquered were frequently compelled to choose between voluntary exile or death. But to account for the discovery of the island, they are obliged to take refuge in the supernatural and explain that its whereabouts were revealed in a dream. The story of Hatumantu gives no suggestion that the island was already inhabited, save for one very vague hint. The six men who formed the first detachment of the party were told that the island, as revealed in the dream, possessed not only a great crater, but also a long beautiful road. The long ears, who according to tradition were exterminated by the short ears, may have been an earlier race, but it cannot be claimed that the story tells us so. The two peoples are represented as coming together, or as living side by side on the island. The whole account is rendered more puzzling by the fact that, while the short ears are said to have been the ancestors of the present people, the fashion of making long the lobe of the ears prevailed on the island until quite recently. It is noteworthy, however, that a legend exists elsewhere which definitely reports that the later comers did find an earlier people in possession. According to the account of Admiral T. de la Palene, there is a tradition of Mangoravia in the Gambier Islands to the effect that the adherents of a certain chief, being vanquished, sought safety in flight. They departed with a west wind in two big canoes, taking with them women, children, and all sorts of provisions. The party were never seen again, save for one man who subsequently returned to Mangravia. From him it was learned that the fugitives had found an island in the middle of the seas, and disembarked in a little bay surrounded by mountains, where, finding traces of inhabitants, they had made fortifications of stone on one of the heights. A few days later, they were attacked by a horde of natives armed with spears, but succeeded in defeating them. The victors then piteously massacred their opponents throughout the island, sparing only the women and children. There are now no stone fortifications visible at Anakena, but one of the hilltops to the east of the cove has, for some reason or other, been entrenched. Turning to more scientific evidence, we find that the islanders have always been judged to be of Polynesian race, as indeed would naturally be expected from the easterly position of the island in the Pacific Ocean. They have certain traces of that culture, and the great authority on the subject, Mr. Sidney Ray, has pronounced the language to be Polynesian. The surprise, therefore, which the results of the expedition have brought to the anthropological world, is the discovery of the extent to which the Negroid element is found to prevail there, both from the physical and cultural points of view. Melanesian skulls are mainly of the long-headed type, while Polynesian are frequently broad-headed. A collection of 58 skulls was brought back from Easter and examined by Dr. Keith. He says in his report, The Polynesian type is fairly purely represented in some of the Easter Islanders, but they are absolutely and relatively a remarkably long-headed people, and in this feature they approach the Melanesian more than the Polynesian type. A similar statement was quite independently made to the Royal Geographical Society on this head. In a discussion which followed the reading of a paper on behalf of the expedition, Captain T. A. Joyce of the British Museum remarked that a few years ago he had examined the skulls brought back from Easter Island by the late Lord Crawford. I then, he continued, wrote a paper which I never published. It remained both literally and metaphorically a skeleton in my cupboard, because I could not get away from the conclusion that in their measurements and general appearance these skulls were far more Melanesian than Polynesian. In speaking of skulls, Dr. Keith makes the interesting remark that the islanders are the largest brain people yet discovered in the islands or shores of the Pacific, 
and shows that their cranial capacity exceeds that of the inhabitants of Whitechapel. In the culture of the islands, also, the Melanesian influence is very strong. The custom of distending the lobe of the ear is much more Melanesian than Polynesian. Dr. Haddon has pointed out that an early illustration of an Easter Island canoe depicts it with a double outrigger, after a type found in the Nissan group in Melanesia. An obsidian blade has been found in the area of New Guinea influenced by Melanesian culture, which has been described and figured by Dr. Seligman. He draws attention to its striking likeness to the Mata'a of Easter Island. Weapons of the same type, and wooden figures in which the ribs are a prominent feature, have been found in the Chatham Islands. But the respective amount of Polynesian and Melanesian culture in these islands is as yet under discussion. The most striking evidence is, however, found in connection with the bird cult. It has been shown by Mr. Henry Balfour that a cult with strong resemblance to that of Easter existed in the Solomon Islands of Melanesia. It is there connected with a frigate bird, a sea bird which usually nests in trees and is characterized by a hooked beak and gulgar pouch. In treeless Easter Island, the sacred bird is the sooty tern, which is without the gulgar pouch and has a straight beak. In many of the carvings on the island, however, the sacred bird is represented with a hooked beak and a pouch. This seems to point to a recollection retained by the immigrants into Easter Island of a former cult of the frigate bird, which was practiced in a region where this bird was a familiar figure, and which was gradually given up in the new environment when this bird, though probably not unknown, was certainly not abundant, the cult being transferred to the locally numerous tern. Figures were also made in the Solomon Islands composed partly of bird and partly of human form. Bird heads appear on human bodies, as in Easter Island, and also human heads on bird bodies. It is noteworthy that, even when the head which is drawn on the bird body is human, it is depicted with bird-like characteristics, the lower part of the face being given a beak-like protrusion, till sometimes it is almost impossible to distinguish whether the head is that of a man or a bird. This prothonosis type, with the protrusion of the lower facial region, seems to have become a convention, and it is found in figures where the body, as well as the head, are human. This is the kind found in a modified form in the Easter Island stone figures. They differ from any normal human type in either Polynesia or Melanesia. It is impossible as yet to give with any certainty a connected account of the early history of Easter Island, but as a working hypothesis the following may perhaps be assumed. There was an original Negroid element which brought with it the custom of distending the ear, the wooden figures, and also the bird cult. A wider wave succeeded which mingled with the first inhabitants, and the next generation adopted the fashion of the country in stretching the lobe of the ear, and carried on the bird cult. At some time in the course of settlement, war arose between the earlier and later comers, in which the former took refuge in the eastern headland, and were largely exterminated. If these suppositions are so far correct, the story of the landing of Hotumatua and the establishment of his headquarters at Anakena refer to the Polynesian immigration, and it seems reasonable to look to the Muri, who are settled in that part of the island, and perhaps also to the allied clans of the Marama and Haumuona, who together form the chief inhabitants of the district of Katuu, as the more direct descendants of the Polynesian settlers. In confirmation of this, we find that the Ariki, or chief, the only man who was necessarily of pure descent, is said to have been quite white. The inscribed skulls, which are those of the Miru, are reported to be the Polynesian type. It is a somewhat striking fact, also, that the Ariki, in spite of his prominent position in the island, took no part in the bird cult ceremonies. In endeavoring to arrive at even an approximate date for these immigrations to the island, evidence outside its borders is likely to prove our best guide. In the present state of our knowledge, we cannot even guess how long the Negroid element has been in the Pacific, but the lighter races are believed to have entered it to not earlier than the Christian era. The colonization of the Pomatas is placed at A.D. 1000, and it has been suggested by Volz that the Polynesian wave reached Easter Island about A.D. 1400. There is at present no evidence to show whether the great works were initiated by the earlier or the later arrivals. There are other metholithic remains in the Pacific, notably great walls of stone in the Caroline Islands. The expedition found a stone statue at Pitcairn, but we have as yet no complete information with regard to these works or the circumstances of their construction. 
the Polynesians are accredited with having carried with them the fashion of erecting such monuments, but, if they brought it to Easter Island, the form which it took was apparently governed by conventions already existing on the island. On the other hand, it seems possible that the makers of the images may have come from a country where they were accustomed to modeling statues in wood, and finding no such material in the island, substituted for it the stone of Raraku. Sir Basil Thompson has pointed out that there were in the Marquesas wooden statues standing on erections of stone and also wooden dolls. Further knowledge of what exists elsewhere will probably throw light on the matter. But it is, in any case, owing to the fact that there is to be found at Easter a volcanic ash which can be easily wrought that we have the hundreds of images in the island. As regard to the duration of the image error, it has been shown that the number of statues, impressive as it is, does not necessarily imply that their manufacture covered a vast space of time. It must, however, in all probability, have extended over several centuries. As to its termination, the worship is reported as having been in existence in 1722. At any rate, the Ahuan statues were then in good repair. By 1774, some of the statues had fallen, and by about 1840, none remained in place. It seems, therefore, on the whole, most likely that the cult, and probably also the manufacture of the images, existed till the beginning of the 18th century. The alternative explanation can only be that though the cult had long been dead, the statues remained in place, not materially injured either by man or weather, until Europeans first visited the island, and that then an era of devastation set in which, in a hundred years, demolished them all. This, though not actually impossible, does not seem equally probable. We know that a large number, probably the majority, of the statues came to their end through being deliberately thrown down by invading enemies. The legendary struggles between Kutu and Hotuiti, in which Keenga played so prominent a part, are always spoken of as comparatively recent history, and one old man definitely asserted that they took place at the time of the grandfather of the last Ariki, which may be as far back as the 18th century. If these wars occurred between the visit of the Dutchmen in 1722 and that of the Spaniards in 1770, it is at least possible that it was during their course that the manufacture of the images ended and their overthrow began. It will be remembered that, while Roggeveen speaks of the island as cultivated and fertile, the navigators fifty years later are greatly disappointed with the barren condition in which they find it. In the curious absence, however, of any reference in these legends to the condition of the images, this must remain, for the present at any rate, as surmise only. It would be interesting to know more clearly the part played by the advent of the white men in the evolution of the culture of the island. While it cannot be definitely stated that it was their arrival which, by detracting from the reverence paid to the statues, hastened their downfall, we know that it largely affected native conceptions. Not only was it the probable cause of the abandonment at the end of the 18th century of the practice of distending the lobe of the ear, but it inspired a new form of worship. It is interesting to see in the drawings of foreign ships, which appear side by side with older designs, a new cult actually in course of intermingling with the old forms. Did we not possess the key to them, these pictures would add one more to the mysteries of the island. Such evidence as can be obtained from the condition of the images points to the fact that it cannot be in definite ages since they were completed. For example, in certain statues, those which are generally considered the most recent, the surface polish still remains in its place in the cavity representing the eye, and on parts of the neck and breast where it has been somewhat sheltered by the chin, notwithstanding the fact that the soft stone is one which easily weathers. The question as to what the statues represent is not yet fully solved. It seems probable that the form was a conventional one, and was used to denote various things. Some of the statues may have been gods, the name of a single image on an island Ahu, one of the very few which were remembered, was reported to be Moi Te Atua. It is, however, probably safe to regard Ahu statues as being in general representations of ancestors, either nearer or more distant. This does not necessarily exclude the idea of divinity. The hat may have been a badge of rank. Warriors in Tahiti wore a certain kind of hat as a special mark of distinction. Reasons have been given for suggesting that the images on Raraku may have been memorials of birdmen, and we know that some of the statues, 
as those on the southern slope of Raraku and in Motunui, denoted boundaries. Lastly, it is not impossible that some of the figures, such as those approaching the Yahoo of Akara, were simply ornamental, to make it look nice. The nearest approach which we ourselves have to such diverse employment of the same design is in our use of the Latin cross. Fundamentally a sacred sign, it is used not only to adorn churches and for personal ornament, but also to mark graves and denote common and central grounds, such as the site of markets and other public places. It is also used to preserve the memory of certain spots, as, for example, Charing Cross, where the body of Queen Eleanor rested. The last problem to be considered is that dealing with the tablets. An account has been given elsewhere of what is known of their general meaning. The figures themselves may be classed as ideograms, that is, signs representing ideas. But it is doubtful, as has been shown, if a given sign always represented the same idea. Each sign was in any case a peg on which to hang a large amount of matter which was committed to memory, and is therefore, alas, gone forever. No light has yet been thrown on the origin of the script. No other writing has been found in the Pacific, if we accept a form from the Caroline Islands, and a few rock carvings in the Chatham Islands, whose connection with the glyphs of Easter Island is as yet very doubtful. It would be satisfactory, in view of the relation of the Mira Ariki to the tablets, and the tradition that they came with Hotumatua, if internal evidence could show that it was of Polynesian origin. Unfortunately for this theory, the Melanesian bird figures largely among the signs. It is, of course, conceivable that they may have undergone local adaptation. While it is not probable that we shall ever be able to read the tablets, it is not impossible that further discovery may throw light on the history of the signs, and show to what extent the script has been imported from elsewhere, or how far it is, with much of its other culture, a product of the isolation of Easter Island. End of section 23. Recording by Todd. Section 24 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition, by Catherine Rutledge. Part 3. The Homeward Voyage, Easter Island to San Francisco. Pitcairn Island. Lieutenant Blight went to the Pacific in 1788 in command of His Majesty's ship Bounty with orders to obtain plants of the breadfruit and introduce it into the English possessions in the West Indies. He spent six months at Tahiti collecting the fruit and there the crew fell victim to the charms of its lotus-eating life, its sunshine, its flowers and its women. Soon after the ship sailed, the majority of the men mutinied, being led by Christian, the master's mate. They set Blight and eighteen others adrift in an open boat, and returned in the ship to Tahiti. Subsequently, fearing that retribution might follow, Christian and eight fellow mutineers left Tahiti on the bounty, taking with them nine native women, and also some native men to act as servants. For years their fate remained a mystery. The refuge found by the party was the lonely island of Pitcairn. They took out of the ship everything that they required, and then sank the vessel, fearing that her presence might betray them. The new habitation proved anything but an amicable Eden. The native servants were ill-treated by their masters, and in 1793 rose against them, murdering Christian and four other white men, but were finally themselves all killed by the Europeans. The women also were discontented with their lot, and in the following year they made a raft in order to quit the island, an attempt which was of course foredoomed to failure. Of the four mutineers left, one, McCoy, committed suicide through an intoxicating drink made from the tea plant. Another, Kintal, having threatened the lives of his two comrades, Adams and Young, was killed by them with an axe in self-defense. A woman who witnessed the scene as a child survived till 1883, and we were told by her grandchildren that her clearest recollection was the blood-spattered walls and the screaming women and children. Young, who had been a midshipman on the bounty, died shortly after, 
and in 1800 John Adams, alias Alexander Smith, was left the sole man on the island, with the native women and twenty-five children. Later ensued not the least strange part of the story. Adams was converted by a dream, and awoke to his responsibility towards the younger generation. He taught them to read from a Bible and prayer book, saved from the bounty, and the offspring of the mutineers became a civilized and God-fearing community. The small colony were first found by an American ship, the Topaz, in 1808, but little seems to have been heard of the discovery, and six years later, His Majesty's ships Britain and Tagus, sailing near the island, were much astonished at being hailed by a boatload of men who spoke English. By 1856, the population of Pitcairn numbered about 190, and they were removed, by their own request, to a larger Norfolk Island. Six homesick families, however, against the strong advice of Bishop Selwyn, subsequently returned to Pitcairn. In the afternoon of Wednesday, August 18, 1915, the last vestige of the long coast of Easter Island dipped below the horizon. We realized that we were homeward bound. Owing to the war and our prolonged residence on the island, it was no longer possible to keep to the plan made before leaving England and follow up Easter trails elsewhere in the Pacific. We decided, however, to adhere to the original arrangement of going first to Tahiti and then to make the return voyage by the Panama Canal, which was now open. One of our principal objects in visiting Tahiti was to collect all the letters, newspapers, and money which had been forwarded to us there during the last twelve months. With the exception of one stray letter, written the previous November, we had had no mail since Manas first returned to the island a year before. It seemed desirable to visit Pitcairn Island on the way thither, it was but little out of our route, and was said to have prehistoric remains. We had a very good voyage, for the eleven hundred miles from Easter to Pitcairn, staggering along with a following wind. The wind was indeed so strong that we became anxious for the safety of the dinghy in her davits, and swung her inboard for, I believe, the only time on the voyage. We arrived at Pitcairn on August the 27th. The island, as seen from the sea, rises as a solitary mass from the water. It is apparently the remaining half of an old crater, and is some two miles in width. An amphitheatre of luxuriant verdure faces northwards. Its lowest portion, or arena, is perhaps four hundred feet above sea level, and rests on the top of a wall of grey rock. The other three sides of the amphitheatre are encircled by high precipitous cliffs. The green gem, in its rocky setting, was a refreshing change after treeless Easter Island. Mana was welcomed by a boatload of sturdy men who were definitely European in appearance and manner. They were mostly of a sallow white complexion, though a few had a darker tinge. They spoke English, though with an intonation different from that of the Dominions, America, or the homeland. A local patois is sometimes used on the island, which is a mixture of English and Tahitian, but pure Tahitian is not understood. A graceful invitation was given by the chief magistrate, Mr. Gerard Christian, to come and stay on shore, and was accepted for the following day, which, the islanders said, will be the Sabbath. This was a somewhat surprising statement, as the day was Friday, and caused a momentary wonder whether something had gone wrong with the log of mana. We will explain all that later, added our hosts. The next morning, therefore, the big tent-oared boat turned up again, Mr. Christian bringing us the following kind letter from the missionaries, who we now learned were on the island. It was addressed to the gentlemen concerned. Pitcairn Island, 27th of August, 1915. Dear Sir and Madam, it is with pleasure that we extend this invitation to you to share with us the few comforts of our little island home. We cannot offer luxury, we live simply yet wholesomely. Should you be planning to sleep ashore, it will be well to bring your pillows, towels, and toilet soap. We trust that your stay will be attended with success. Yours very cordially, Mr. and Mrs. M. R. Adams. We suggested bringing food, but that was declined as unnecessary. The trip to the shore, even in so big a boat, is somewhat adventurous. 
The landing place is in Bounty Bay, below the precipitous cliffs of the northeastern corner of the island, beneath whose waters were sunk the remains of His Majesty's ship. The shore is reached, even under propitious circumstances, through a wide fringe of drenching surf. Happily, the islanders are excellent oarsmen, for the boat is apt to assume the vertical position usually associated with the picture of Grace Darling. A lifeboat sent as a gift from England in 1880 has proved too short for the character of the waves. The village is gained by a steep path, cut at times in the rock, and at the summit we found standing under the trees a group in white Sunday attire waiting to welcome us. We were now beginning to understand the meaning of the difference in days. Service used to be held at Pitcairn after the manner of the Church of England, but in 1886 the island was visited by one of the American sect calling themselves Seventh-day Adventists. The society is Christian, but the members regard as binding many of the Old Testament rules. Saturday is observed as the divinely appointed day of rest, pork is considered unclean, and the tenth part of goods is set aside for religious purposes. Special attention is paid to biblical prophecy, and the end of the world is thought to be near. It was not difficult to convert the reverent little community on Pitcairn to views for which it was claimed that there were plain teachings of the Bible, and various persons were shortly baptized in the sea. The group who awaited us were headed by our most kind hosts, the missionary and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Adams, who were of Australian birth. Sunday school was just over, and service about to begin. It was held in an airy building filled with a large congregation. The sermon was on prophecy as found in the books of Daniel and Revelation, and fulfilled in the division of the empire of Alexander the Great. It was depressing to be told that the late war is only the beginning of trouble. We went back with Mr. and Mrs. Adams to luncheon, which was served at 2.30 and composed principally of oranges and bananas. It was a very dainty, if, to some of us who had breakfasted at seven o'clock, a rather unsubstantial repast. Our hosts were vegetarians and had only two meals a day, but subsequently kind allowance was made for our less moderate appetites. I was glad of a rest in the afternoon but S., who attended a second service, said it had been the most interesting part of the Sunday observances. It was a less formal gathering, when personal religious testimonies were given by both young and old. Later we were shown a little settlement of huts in the higher part of the island, where once a year the community retire for ten days and have a series of camp meetings. The teachings of the new religion are practically observed, the tithe barn, at the time of our visit, held one hundred pound worth of dedicated produce, which was awaiting shipment. It was the prettiest sight to see the fruits of the earth being brought into it in the form of loads of various tropical produce. The whole community abstains from alcohol and, nominally at any rate, from tobacco, though one old gentleman was not above making an arrangement for a private supply from the yacht. Tea and coffee are thought to be undesirable stimulants, and even the export of coffee was beginning to be discouraged. The place suffers admittedly from the social laxity characteristic of Polynesia, but the evil is being combated by its spiritual leaders and is cognizable by law. The whole atmosphere is extraordinary. The visitor feels as if suddenly transported, amid the surroundings of a Pacific island, to Puritan England or bygone Scotland. It is a Puritanism which is nevertheless light-hearted and sunny, without hypocrisy or intolerance. The general influence of the missionaries seemed very helpful to the little community, and they also conducted a school for its younger members. Most of the inhabitants can read, but the subject matter of books is too far away for them to be of much interest, and the only application, it was noticed, which was made to the yacht for literature was for picture papers of the war. We gave, by request, an hour stock on the travels of the mana, and it was listened to with apparent understanding, or at any rate with politeness. The chief interest shown was in the manner of life of the Easter Islanders, about which many questions were asked. The houses are substantially built of wood with good furniture. 
A well-made chest of drawers was a birthday present to the missionary's wife from the young man of the island. There is a separate bedroom, or cubicle, for nearly every inhabitant, and some houses have a room set apart for meals. Hospitality was shown without stint, and we were entertained during our stay to a series of attractive repasts in various homes. Our hosts bore such names as Christian, Young, and McCoy. Meat is limited to goat or chicken, but there is a profusion of tropical produce, and oranges are too numerous to gather. The coconut trees are unfortunately dying. Each household has a share of the ground rising behind the village, and the hillside is traversed by shady avenues of palms and bananas, which afford, at every turn, glimpses of outstanding cliffs and the brilliant blue of the ocean. The standard of life compares very favorably with that of an English village, and is immeasurably superior to that achieved on Easter Island under similar circumstances. Pitcairn has the dignity of being a democratic, self-governing community with a magistrate and two houses of legislature. The present constitution was suggested by the captain of HMS Champion in 1892 and superseded an earlier one. The lower house, known as the committee, comprises a chairman and two members, also an official secretary. It makes regulations which are submitted to the upper house or council. The council consists of the chief magistrate, with two assessors and the secretary, and it acts also as a court of justice. The two committee members and the constable are nominated by the magistrate, but the other officials are elected annually by all inhabitants over 18 years. Pitcairn was therefore the first portion of the British Empire to possess female suffrage. It was interesting to see the government records, though the present book does not go back beyond about 50 years, earlier ones having apparently disappeared. This contained the laws of 1884, revised in 1904, regulations for school attendance, a category of the chief magistrates, a chronicle of visits from men of war, and mention of Queen Victoria's presence, consisting of an organ in 1879 and newly minted jubilee coins received in 1889. There were also recorded the births, marriages, and deaths of the island since 1864, and a description of the various brands adopted by respective owners for their goats, chickens, and trees. Among the legislative enactments was more than one concerned with the preservation of cats, the object being to keep down rats. Thus the laws of 1884 direct that any person or persons after this date, September 24, 1884, maliciously wounding or causing the death of a cat without permission will be liable to such punishment as the court will inflict. Should any dog, going out with his master, fall in with a cat and chase him, and no effort be made to save the cat, the dog must be killed. For the first offence, fine ten shillings. Cats in any part of the island doing any one damage must be killed in the presence of a member of parliament. Illicit medical practice is forbidden, and the regulation on this head runs as follows. It may be lawful for parents to treat their own children in case of sickness, but no one will understand that he is at liberty to treat or give any dose of medicine, unless it be one of his own family, without first getting license from the president. Drugs may not be landed without permission. More recent laws enact that each family may keep only six breeding nannies, and that coconuts may only be gathered under supervision of the committee or in company with their owners of the same patch. In case of want, however, they may be plucked for drinking. Persons killing fowls must present the legs, i.e. the lower portion which bears the brand, to a member of the government. With the entries of deaths are recorded their known or presumed cause. Those occasioned by accident are somewhat numerous, and include fatal results from climbing cliffs after birds, chasing goats, and falling from trees. Wills can be made by simply writing them in the official book, but entries under this head were not numerous. The island is in the jurisdiction of the British Council at Tahiti, but the magistrate explained sadly that it was then two years since it had been possible for his superior to send any instructions. 
In very serious matters, such as murder or divorce, reference is necessary to the High Commissioner at Fiji, and five years may elapse before an answer is received. It is indeed comparatively simple to communicate from Pitcairn with the outside world, particularly now that it lies near the route from Panama to New Zealand. Warning of the approach of a vessel is given by a church bell, and all hands rush forthwith to launch the boat and pull out to the ship. It is reported that once the bell sounded whilst a marriage was being celebrated. The crowded church emptied at once, and the bride, bridegroom, and officiator were left alone. Sooner or later a letter can thus be handed on board, but to obtain a reply is another matter. No steamer will undertake to deliver passengers, goods, or mails to the island. It does not pay to spend time over so small a matter. The liner may pass in the night, or the weather at the time may render communication with the shore impossible. During our visit, notice was given that a ship was approaching. The men, who were at the time engaged in digging for the expedition, threw down their tools and the boat started for the vessel, only to founder among the breakers of Bounty Bay. The place is too remote to be visited by the trading vessels which visit the Gambier Islands, and as there is no anchorage, it is by no means easy for the islanders to keep any form of ship on their own account. In normal times a British warship calls every alternate year, but its visits were suspended during the war. Of the two islands, Easter, which has at least definite bonds with a firm on the mainland, is on the whole the easier of access. The economic problem of Pitcairn lies in the difficulty of making it self-supporting. Food and housing materials abound, but clothes, tools, and similar articles must be obtained from elsewhere while to secure in return a market for its small exports is almost impossible. It is sometimes said that as the result, the inhabitants have grown so accustomed to be objects of interest and charity that they have become pauperized and expect everything to be given them freely by passing ships. This was certainly not our experience. They made us a large number of generous gifts, such as bundles of dried bananas and specimens of their handiwork, hats, baskets, and dried leaves, cleverly embroidered and painted. On the other hand, they took with gratitude any articles which were given by us, either as presents or in return for the things we purchased. One request has been received since we left the island. It was made with many apologies by the chief magistrate, and was for a Bible of the Oxford teacher's edition. The position, however, is unsatisfactory, and it seems very desirable that, if possible, more frequent communication should be established. In any case, it is to be hoped that now peace reigns, a warship may visit the place at least once a year. It is frequently suggested that the Pitcairners must have deteriorated in physique by intermarriage. As far, however, as we were able to observe, such is not the case. It has been remarked, indeed, that a large number have lost their front teeth, but in this they are not unique. Dr. Keith observes, in the report previously alluded to, that many Pacific Islanders are extremely liable to disease and loss of teeth. The effect of such disease is, he states, to be seen in every one of the skulls from Easter regarded as belonging to a person of over twenty-five years. Tooth trouble is even more prevalent in Easter Island than in the slums of our great towns. We were asked to collect pedigrees on Pitcairn and make observations from the point of view of the Mendelian theory. This would, however, have been a very long and troublesome business, and we did not feel assured that the results would be sufficiently exact to justify it. While there has possibly been no fresh infusion of South Sea blood, the islanders have constantly been in contact with white men. Between 1808 and 1856, 350 vessels touched at Pitcairn, and on various occasions shipwrecked mariners and others have taken up their abode on the island and intermixed with the population. The Pitcairn islanders have been described as the beggars of the Pacific, and, on the contrary, have also been depicted as saints in a modern Eden, Needless to say, they are neither the one nor the other, but inheritors of some of the weaknesses and a surprising number of the strength of their mixed ancestry. 
From the point of view of its main and scientific object, our visit had satisfactory results. The island was uninhabited when the mutineers arrived, but there were traces of past residents. The sites of three marae, or native structures, among the undergrowth were pointed out. They are said to have been preserved by the first Englishmen, but were unfortunately destroyed comparatively recently, and very little of them is still preserved. The old people could remember when bones could be seen lying about in their vicinity. The islanders most kindly offered to dig out what still existed of these remains, and two days running the whole population turned out for excavation. The most interesting of the erections proved to be one situated on the cliffs looking down on to Bounty Bay. We were only able roughly to examine it on the morning of our departure. It appeared to have been made of earth, not built of stone, and by clearing away some of the scrub we were able to arrive at the conclusion that it had been an embankment some twelve feet high, built on the immediate edge of the vertical cliff, and had had two faces. The face that was directed seawards was almost vertical, whilst the one towards the land formed an inclined plane, that measured thirty-seven feet between its highest and its lowest points. It seemed clear that both sides had been paved with marine boulders. In general character it resembled, to some extent, one of the semi-pyramid Ahu of Easter, but dense vegetation and tree growth rendered it impossible to speak definitely, and the form may have been determined by the shape of the cliff. It was remembered that three statues had stood on it, and that one in particular had been thrown down on to the beach beneath. The headless trunk of this image is preserved, it is thirty-one inches in height, and the form has a certain resemblance to that of Easter Island, but the workmanship is much cruder. There is said to have been also a statue on a marae on the other side of the island. There are interesting rock carvings in two places, both of which are somewhat difficult to reach. S. managed, however, to photograph one set, and a dear old man undertook the scramble to the other side, which was practically inaccessible to booted feet, and made drawings of them for the expedition. Then we had a great whip-up for any stone implements which might have been found. Miss Beatrice Young most kindly assisted and induced the owners to bring out their possessions. Over eighty were produced. The islanders were much pleased to think that their contribution would be numbered among the treasures of the British Museum, but the argument that, a hundred years hence, they would still be there, left them cold, for, as they explained, the end of the world would have come before then. We spent in all four nights on the island, which forms, we believe, a record sojourn for visitors. It is a very happy memory. A large portion of the population asked for passage to Tahiti, but the hearts of the most failed before the end, and we, on our part, drew the line at taking more than two men, who would work their passage. Those who finally came with us were brothers, Charles and Edwin Young, descendants of midshipman Young. They arrived on board with their hats wreathed with flowers, true Polynesian fashion, accompanied by many friends and relatives. Charles had been on one of the island trading vessels, but Edwin had never before left his home. From Pitcairn we made for Rapa, known as Rapa Iti or Little Rapa, to distinguish it from Rapa Nui or Great Rapa which, as has been seen, is one of the names for Easter. It is a French possession, and only visited by a vessel occasionally. It is seven hundred miles from Pitcairn, and was somewhat out of our route for Tahiti, but the sailing directions reported a number of prehistoric buildings, which they termed forts. We were anxious to inspect them, and see what relation, if any, they bore to buildings on Easter Island. But disappointment, alas, awaited us. The site of the island on which is the settlement was, at the time of our visit, the windward aspect. There was a strong breeze and quite a heavy sea. We remained abreast the village for some hours, awaiting the pilot, who is said to come off to visiting vessels. But no one appeared, nor was any signal made on the shore. Either they were afraid of us, or did not like the look of the weather. It was not one of the islands we had originally intended visiting and we had no chart. We had to sail the ship the whole time in order to keep our station, and eventually our forestay gave out, 
This meant putting her instantly before the wind, or we should have been dismasted. We therefore ran under the lee of the land and made good our damage. It would have taken a long time to thrash back to our original station, so we reluctantly gave up the attempt to make a landing. The coast is extremely fine, bold and precipitous, but that, and the illustration given, is all that we can tell of Rapa. End of chapter 24「Section 25 of The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge. Chapter 21. Tahiti. Hawaiian Islands, San Francisco. Tahiti. Wallace is the first European known certainly to have seen Tahiti. He visited it in 1767 and was followed two years later by Cook. The predominant chiefs on the island at this time were Amo and his wife Purea, of the district of Paparo on the south coast. They are chiefly notorious as the founders of the great Mare, or Temple of Mahiatia, which they built in honor of their infant son, Terriere. This work must have been in progress when Wallace anchored on the other side of the island. The demands which they made on their fellow natives in order to secure its erection were so extortionate that a rising took place against them and by the time Cook made his first appearance they were shorn of much of their glory. Subsequently, various other navigators visited the island. Cook anchored there a second time, and HMS Bounty made a prolonged sojourn. In 1797, thirty missionaries arrived, sent from England by the London Missionary Society. By this time another native family was in the ascendant, whose territory was on the north coast. They have become known as the Pomari, a name crystallized by the missionaries, but which was in reality only one of the minor appellations which had been adopted, native fashion, by the chief of the day. Pomari II was baptized in 1819. About forty years later, Roman Catholic missionaries arrived, and a struggle for ascendancy took place between them and the London Society. The home government refused to support the Protestants. Queen Pomari IV, therefore, though she much preferred the English, was compelled to apply for a French protectorate, which was established in 1843. On the death of the old queen in 1877, the French recognized her son, Pomeri V, who had married his cousin, Merau. The new queen was the daughter of a chiefess known as Ariai Temai, who had married an English Jew named Salmon. Miss Gordon Cumming, who visited the island at the time, gives an interesting account of the procession round the island to proclaim the new sovereigns in which she herself took part. In 1880, Pomare handed over his claims to the French government, by whom the island was then formally annexed. We sighted Tahiti on the 16th of September, 1915, sailed along its coast with interest, and anchored in the afternoon at Papite on the north shore. It was wonderful to return once more to the great world, even in its modified form at Tahiti, and the Rip Van Winkle sensation was most curious. The consul, Mr. H. A. Richards, was early on board with a kind welcome, and sent us round the longed-for sacks containing a year's accumulation of letters and newspapers. The mail, however, brought bad personal news, and though life had to go on as usual, recollections of the island have suffered from every point of view. Tahiti, as seen from the sea, with its mass of broken mountains covered with verdure, is undoubtedly very beautiful, 
and the sunset effects over the neighboring island of Morea are particularly striking. The lagoon, too, is fascinating, and refreshing expeditions were made in the motor launch to study the wonders of its protecting coral reef. When on land, however, the charm of the island is somewhat dissipated. The inhabited strip round the coast, which varies from nothing up to some two miles in width, is covered with bungalows and little native properties and is so full of coconuts and palms that all effect of the mountains is lost though it was only the month of september at the time of our visit it was very hot and airless making all mental and physical exertion an effort i went one morning for a walk at six thirty in the hope of better things but even then it felt as if nature had forgotten to open her windows the wild charm of romance which greeted the early voyagers and which must have assuaged the struggle of the first missionaries is now no more papite is civilized it is a port for the mail steamers between america and new zealand it is under french rule but a large proportion of business is in the hands of the british and also of the chinese we lived at the hotel as manna had to go on the slip and had an interesting fellow guest in an american geologist he was travelling in the pacific with the object of proving that it had never been a continent but that the islands were sporadic volcanic upheavals from the ocean bed he had found himself involved in the everlasting quarrel between geologists and biologists who each want the world constructed to prove their own theories in this case a biologist wished for continuity of land to account for the presence of the same snail in islands far removed our friend had contended that the mollusks might have travelled on driftwood but was told in reply that salt water did not suit their constitution he had then argued that they could easily have gone with the food in native canoes anyhow he concluded with a delightful yankee drawl to have the floor of the ocean raised up fifteen thousand feet for his snails to crawl over is just too much s was presented by the consul to the french governor and i called according to instructions to pay my respects to his wife who proved to be both young and charming she was good enough subsequently to send an invitation to a tea-party which differed interestingly from similar functions at home it took place in a large room where twenty chairs covered with brocade were arranged in a circle which was broken only by a settee on this sat the hostess and by her side either as the greatest stranger or as having taken the precaution to be an early arrival the stewardess of the manna one by one the chairs filled up and each fresh arrival after greeting her entertainer went round and shook hands with every one already there the hostess retained her seat from which she conversed across to various points of the circle no one moved except that when a delightful tea came in it was handed round by the young girls no servant appeared they are almost impossible to get the governor earned our particular gratitude by his kindness in sending daily a copy of the war bulletin which arrived by wireless from honolulu and new zealand though the installation was not at the time sufficiently advanced to be capable of sending out messages the germans were interned in the bay on what was known as quarantine island and were employed to do a certain amount of leisurely work on the roads at a comparatively high rate of pay at the same time the french subjects native and half-caste had been called up for much harder military service and received the standard remuneration which was much lower it was commonly reported that the latter had sent in a petition humbly begging that they might be considered as german prisoners 
during our time on the island the anniversary occurred of the visit of van spee's fleet on their way to easter island and the trees were adorned with official notices proclaiming a public holiday in memory of the french victory what happened on that occasion is not precisely clear and each person gives a different account it seems however that as the cruisers scharnhorst and Nisenau appeared without any proper announcement the shore batteries fired across their bows to stop them the germans replied and some houses in the town were set on fire the french gunboat zele was sunk in the harbour also a german ship which had been taken as a prize the custodian of the coal supply set it on fire to prevent it from falling into the enemy's hands this action was subsequently justified as it transpired that the germans had given out that they were going to papite in order to obtain coal after a certain number of shots had passed in both directions the enemy went on their way we had particular pleasure in making the acquaintance of the late queen widow of pomare the fifth an able and cultured lady who lives in a villa in papite and calls herself simply madame maro tararoa she was kind enough to lend us a valuable book written by her mother arii temai which tells the history of the island as related by family traditions and combines with this account the information given by the early voyagers her charming daughter princess tekau pomare who had been educated in paris placed us under a great obligation by constituting herself our cicerone she took us to see the monument on venus point erected to mark the spot where cook observed the transit of venus and also the pomare mausoleum miss gordon cumming records that it was the ancient habit of tahiti for the dead to be placed in a house watched till only dust and ashes remained and then buried securely in the mountain to guard against possible desecration this custom she states still survived in her day in the case of departed royalty we had also a delightful motor drive with the princess to some family property on the south side of the island lunching at a small hotel which was nothing if not up to date being dignified with the name of the tipperary hotel the proprietor a frenchman advertised it by stating that while it was a long long way to tipperary it was only a short way to his establishment he had adorned the walls of the dining-room with large frescoes of the flags of the allies leaving as he explained plenty of room for holland greece and america the marais of tahiti have vanished but on the way back we stopped to see all that remains of a once famous pile nothing now exists but a mass of overgrown coral stones converted into a lime kiln fortunately cook and his companion banks both visited mahayatia in its glory and have left us descriptions and we have also a drawing of it it is obvious that these structures in no way resembled the ahu of easter island mahayatia was a pyramid of oblong form with a base two hundred and sixty seven feet by seventy one feet it was composed of squared coral stones and blue pebbles and consisted of eleven steps each some four feet in height it impressed banks as a most enormous pile its size and workmanship almost surpassing belief the pyramid formed one side of a court or square the hull being walled in and paved with flat stones Marais, as Arii Tamai explains, were sacred to some god, but the god was only a secondary affair. A man's whole social position depended on his having a stone to sit on within his Marais enclosure. Cook was asked for the name of his Marais, 
as it was not supposed possible that a chief could be without one, and took refuge in giving the name of his London parish, Stepney. Princess Tekel kindly acted as interpreter when we went to look up the Easter Islanders, who came here to work on the Brander plantation, and who still form a little colony. One of our main objects in visiting Tahiti had been to inspect the tablets and Easter Island collection of Bishop Jawson, who died in 1892. In this we met with disappointment. The present authorities, whom we saw more than once, took no interest at all in the subject, and said that on Bishop Jawson's death the brothers had sent the articles home as curios to their friends in Europe. They gave us an address in Louvain, which it has not, of course, up to the present, been possible to follow up. Our crew underwent some alterations at Tahiti. The post of engineer had been filled by a Chilean, and one deckhand had already gone home as a reservist. Two more now desired to return direct to serve their country. One of these was my friend Bailey, the cook. As he had had no opportunity of spending his wages, he was, on being paid off, quite a millionaire. He invested in a number of white washing suits and took up his residence at our hotel. I was presented with his photograph clad in the new raiment. An officer travelling to England from New Zealand was kind enough to undertake to give him some care on the journey, and managed to get him safely home, though most of his fortune had disappeared en route. He took service as a ship's cook, and we saw his name subsequently, with most sincere regret, in a list of missing Bailey's place was taken by an American, who had formed part of the crew, which had been discharged from a ship, which they had brought to Tahiti from California. He declined to come on board till just before we sailed, as he was engaged for a prize-fight with a noted colored champion. The prospective fight excited a good deal of local interest, but ended lamentably in the white man being knocked out at the first blow. As we were still short-handed, we arranged with our two Pitcairn Islanders to come on with us to England. Charles Young was signed on as deckhand, and Edwin, who was of less strong physique, as steward. They both gave every satisfaction, and Edwin, though he had of course to be taught his duties, was the best steward we ever had. We had considerable conversation with our consul, Mr. Richards, on the subject of Pitcairn, in which he has always taken great interest, doing all that he could for the islanders. He had been anxious, if possible, to make a stay there of some duration, feeling, no doubt rightly, that the only way to solve its difficulties was for someone to dwell there long enough to see the situation, not as a visitor, but as a resident. Circumstances had not so far rendered this feasible, but it is to be hoped it may still be accomplished. It was impossible to make a direct passage from Tahiti to Panama, as the trade wind would have been dead against us. We had therefore to turn its flank by going as far north as the Sandwich Group, or to give them their American name, the Hawaiian Islands. We passed within sight of one or two of the Paumotu group, which was our first introduction to coral atolls, but I do not think we saw a ship during the hull voyage. It was a long run, as we met with calms in the doldrums, and were without the use of the motor, which stood in need of some simple repairs that could not be done in Tahiti. Being becalmed is certainly unpleasant, there is no air, everything hangs loose, rattles and bangs, and cheerful calculations are made as to how much damage per hour is being done to the gear. But on the whole, the patience of seamen is marvellous. Occupation happily was provided in the stupendous quantity of arrears of newspapers, 
we read them most diligently but it is hardly fair to journalists to deal with their output a year after it is written the mistakes and false prophecies of even the most sober papers become painfully obvious we became acquainted for example at one and the same time with the birth and death of the russian steam roller theory and other similar figments my diary is diversified by such items of domestic interest as showed edwin how to look after the brass s taught edwin to clean silver hawaiian islands the group is composed of eight inhabited islands which stretch in a line from northwest to southeast hawaii the most southerly is the largest and now gives its name to the hull but the principal modern town honolulu is on the more northerly island of oahu the islands were known to the early spanish voyagers but their connection with the civilized world really dates from their rediscovery by cook he called them after lord sandwich who was at that time first lord of the admiralty the great navigator was murdered on hawaii in seventeen seventy nine vancouver touched there more than once and obtained the consent of the natives to a british protectorate which he proclaimed on hawaii in seventeen ninety four the action was however ignored by the home government at this time a powerful chief of hawaii kamehameha the first rose to pre-eminence he captured the island of oahu in seventeen ninety five and consolidated the group under one government contact with the outside world gradually undermined the native beliefs and the old ceremonial taboos became wearisome after the death of kamehameha they were overthrown by his son in eighteen nineteen though not without armed resistance from the more orthodox section the islands were for a short time a nation without a religion but Christianity was introduced almost immediately by American missionaries. The group was nominally independent till the time of Queen Liliuo Kalani, who succeeded in 1891. Her rule roused much resentment among the foreign residents, and during a period of unsettlement she was imprisoned in her palace for nine months. An appeal was made to the United States, and the islands were formally annexed by that power in eighteen ninety eight oahu after a five weeks voyage which included an abortive attempt to call at the island of hawaii we reached honolulu in the island of oahu on november eleventh nineteen fifteen from the isolation of easter we had come to the comparatively busy life of tahiti and now at honolulu we felt once more in touch with the great world it is a cheerful and up-to-date city in beautiful surroundings seen from the harbor it is not unlike papite but the town is bigger and the mountains more distant the roads of the suburbs are frequently bordered by large areas of mown grass which form part of the gardens of the adjacent villas it is considered a duty to erect no wall or paling, and the custom, while it deprives the residences of privacy, greatly enhances the charm of the highway. The practice is encouraged by a public-spirited society interested in the beauty of the place. The aquarium contains fish of most gorgeous coloring, and it is well worth while to explore a coral reef on the eastern shore in a glass-bottomed boat. In addition to the original population, the place swarms with Japanese, and the Americans seem little more than a ruling caste. The natives are reported to be entirely sophisticated, and quite competent to invent folk tales or anything else to order. The Bishop Museum has an interesting collection of relics and models of the old civilization, and we are much indebted to the director, Dr. Brigham, for his kindness in exhibiting them to us. 
the principal treasures are the wonderful feather cloaks and helmets of the old chiefs fifty men were employed for a hundred years in collecting the yellow feathers from which one cloak is made the birds which produce only a few feathers each of the desired colour were caught on branches smeared with gum there is also in the museum an excellent model of one heiau or temple it is shown as a rectangular enclosure containing various sacred erections this form of heiau has no resemblance either to the mare of tahiti or the ahu of easter island and the art of building never seems to have approached the excellence reached in the latter mr gordon the british consul gave us much pleasure by taking us in his motor accompanied by dr brigham to see the remains of one of these temples on the eastern side of the island little now exists save a rough enclosing wall it is a matter of surprise that under so enlightened a government as the american more pains are not taken to preserve the archaeological monuments throughout the islands which are fast disappearing much care is bestowed on attracting visitors and it would have seemed even from the financial point of view that the protection of these objects of interest would have been eminently worth while we also visited the famous pali the site of a great battle at the time of the conquest of the island by kamahameha chief of hawaii a range of mountains runs along the eastern side of the island the visitor approaching from the west rises gradually till he reaches the summit and is then confronted by a sheer drop of many hundreds of feet down to the coast below the cliff extends for many miles and the views over land and sea are most striking during the invasion the hawaiian army pursued the natives up the slope and drove them headlong over the pali or precipice kamehameha is the national hero when a statue was erected in honolulu to commemorate the centenary of the discovery of the island by cook it was dedicated not to the navigator but to the hawaiian chief we were accorded an interview with the ex-queen liliuokalani it was a distinctly formal occasion we were shown into a waiting-room till some previous arrivals had finished their audience and were then ceremoniously introduced to royalty the room was furnished after european fashion but was adorned with feather ornaments the old lady who had a tattoo mark on her cheek sat with quiet dignity in an armchair she was obviously frail and though she spoke occasionally in good english her secretary did most of the conversation she told us that her brother had caused certain native legends and songs to be written down and she herself during her imprisonment in eighteen ninety five had translated into english an hawaiian account of the creation of the world the secretary presented us with a copy of this book we did not gather that either of them had ever heard of easter island after a short time we took our leave curtsying again and backing out as we had seen done by our predecessors it may be remembered that liliuokalani visited england at the time of queen victoria's jubilee since our return we have seen the announcement of her death so closes the list of the hawaiian sovereigns being in harbour brought the not unknown domestic excitements the pugilistic american cook who had been quite satisfactory on the voyage proved to be one of those who cannot be in port without going on the bust he was rescued once but he shortly afterwards asked for shore leave at ten o'clock in the morning this was naturally declined he then said he wanted to have a tooth out s assured him he was quite capable of officiating finding he could get neither leave money nor a boat he sprang overboard and swam ashore in his clothes his place was taken by a japanese cook from honolulu hawaii 
when the repairs to the engine had been accomplished we sent the yacht ahead to san francisco and ourselves made a trip by steamer from the island of oahu to that of hawaii between the two lies the island of molokai on which is the leper settlement connected with father damien's heroic work and death we did not see the settlement itself but from its photographs it seems an attractive collection of small houses in the midst of wonderfully beautiful scenery the principal site on hawaii is the active crater of kilauea instead of the long ride described by lady brassey visitors landing at the port of hilo are now conveyed in motors to a comfortable hotel on the edge of the crater we made a detour on the way to see a genuine native settlement where the standard of living proved to be much the same as on easter the crater itself is a subsidiary one on the side of the great mountain mauna loa it is four thousand feet above sea level and has a circuit of nearly eight miles the greater part of the crater is extinct and its hardened lava can easily be walked over but one portion is still active and forms a boiling lake about a thousand feet across no photograph gives any idea of the impressiveness of the scene particularly after dark the floor of the pit is paved with dark but iridescent lava across which run irregular and ever varying cracks of glowing gold first one of these cracks and then another bubbles out into a roaring fire the heat melts the adjacent lava causing great dark masses to break off and slip into the furnace where they are devoured by the flames it is a fascinating spectacle which could be watched for hours the floor of the pit rises and sinks when we were there it was some hundreds of feet below the spectator kilauea was considered in olden times to be the special abode of pele the goddess of fire but after the advent of the missionaries her power was formally defied by kapiolani the daughter of a chief who ate the berries consecrated to the deity on the brink of the pit more than fifty years later however in eighteen eighty there was so great an eruption of lava on the other side of mauna loa that native royalty had to beseech pele to stifle her anger and save the people a prayer which was it is said immediately effective we decided not to return to hilo but to see something more of the island and catch the steamer at kawaii on the western side we left the hotel at eight a m and motored over a hundred miles first passing through grasslands and cattle ranches and then through sugar plantations the way was diversified by extraordinary flows of lava through which the road had been cleared they extended for miles like a great sea one of the streams was as recent as nineteen o seven the last stage of the drive was through forest growth and coffee plantations we spent the night at a small hotel kept by a lady an interesting fellow-guest was a government entomologist who was combating a parasite which was injuring the coffee to this end he had introduced an enemy beast of the same nature brought from nigeria which was successfully devouring its natural foe below the hotel was the bay of kialakakua which was the scene of the last great drama in the life of cook on its shore are the remains of the building where he was treated as the incarnation of the god laurel it is now only a mass of stones but is said to have been a truncated pyramid which is an old form of iayo on the top of this temple cook was robed in red tapa offered a hog and otherwise worshipped the conduct of the white men however was such that they soon lost the respect of the natives an affray occurred over the stealing of one of the ship's boats
and Cook was stabbed in the back by one of the iron daggers which he had himself given in barter. An obelisk has been erected to his memory. On the opposite side of the bay is a Pu'u Hanua, or place of refuge, by name Honono. It corresponded with the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. Hither, says Ellis, the man-slayer, the man who had broken a taboo, the thief and even the murderer fled from his incensed pursuer and was secure. It covered seven acres and was enclosed on the landward side by a massive wall twelve feet high and fifteen feet thick. In the afternoon we motored on to Wamea by a cornice road, which was bumpy beyond description. The hotel consisted of a few rooms behind the principal store. The next morning, on the way to the steamer, we inspected two heiau, a small one at the foot of a hill and a large and striking one on its summit, known as Pu'u Kohola. Tradition says that the hero Kamehameha set out to rebuild the former in order to secure success in war, but was told that, if he wished to be victorious, he must erect a temple instead on the higher altitude. The temple, which adapts itself to the ground, rises on the seaward side by a series of great terraces, and culminates on the summit in a leveled area paved with stones. On the landward side the building is enclosed by a great wall, on which stood innumerable wooden idols. It was entered by a narrow passage between high walls. On the area at the top were various sacred buildings, including a wicker tower, out of which the priest spoke, an altar, and certain houses, in one of which the king resided during periods of taboo. Whilst the temple was being built, even the great chiefs assisted in carrying stones, and the day it was completed, 1791, eleven men were sacrificed on the altar. It is one of the latest, as it is one of the finest of the heiau. From the walls are magnificent views of the two great mountains of Hawaii, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, both over 13,000 feet. It was interesting to recognize in the Hawaiian language not a few words similar to those which we had learnt on Easter Island. In Polynesian, the letters K and T are practically interchangeable. Thus, Mauna Kea, meaning Mount White, from its usual covering of snow, is equivalent to Monga Tea Tea, the hill of white ash in Easter. The same is true of the letters L and R. Mauna Loa is Mount Long, just as Hangaroa is Bay Long. The identification of these last letters is not confined to Polynesia. We made one of the Akikuyu in East Africa repeat the same word over and over again, to see if it had the sound of L or R. He used first one and then the other without any discrimination. The names in Hawaii are said to exist in their present form simply according to the manner in which they have been crystallized in writing. We duly caught our steamer to Honolulu and changed there into the boat for San Francisco. California Cortez, governor of Mexico, was under the impression that America was in close proximity to Asia. Hearing of the success of Magellan in discovering a southern route to the westward, he sent an expedition to the north with the object of finding a road to India in that direction. The members of this party, which was commanded by Cabrillo, were the first Europeans to discover California, 1542. The native Indian population at that time is supposed to have been about 700,000 in number. For over two hundred years Spain took but little interest in the new country, but in 1769 she began to be alarmed lest the Russians should descend on it from the north, and its occupation was ordered from Mexico. 
in this movement not only was the secular power represented but catholic missions played an important part the franciscan order was first in the field and the mission station which gave its name to the bay of san francisco was dedicated in seventeen seventy six later the dominican order also founded religious establishments these institutions were finally secularized in eighteen thirty six but californians justly regard the remains as the most romantic as well as historic objects in the country a wave of immigrants from the united states began to arrive about eighteen forty one war broke out with the parent country of mexico in eighteen forty six and in eighteen forty eight california was formally transferred to the states the same year eighteen forty eight the first discovery of gold caused an enormous inrush of population the journey was no easy one for twenty years the would-be immigrant from the east had to choose between the dangerous expedition overland the unhealthy condition of the panama route or a voyage round the horn the pacific railway was at last completed in eighteen sixty nine the most dramatic event of recent years has been the earthquake of nineteen o six which was followed by a great fire when for three days the city was a mass of flames we arrived at san francisco on december fourteenth nineteen fifteen the bay recalls in some degree that of rio de janeiro the ocean has in the same way penetrated through a narrow channel into a low district surrounded by mountains and formed it into an inland sea there however the resemblance stops the bay of san francisco runs for its major portion parallel to the sea and thus forms a peninsula on either side of the entrance the well-known golden gate the tract on the southern side is sufficiently level to allow of the sight of a town the main frontage of the city is on the bay but it extends to the seaward side the population has also spread across the bay and the suburbs have attained to the magnitude of towns the large ferry-boats which ply across the water are marked features of san francisco life there was nothing in the present fine city to recall the fact that ten years before it had been laid low by the great fire but any building dating back more than a score of years is treated with respectful interest a professional guide who escorts tourists in a motor char -a banks solemnly stated that such and such houses were in the style of thirty-five years ago or that a church was one hundred years old but still used for service it is not however in such matters that the youth of california most strikes a visitor from an older country its inhabitants appear to him to resemble children who have discovered a new playground and who are busily occupied in seeing what each can find there they seem with notable exceptions to have little time to spare for those deeper studies and questionings which form part of life in lands where the earlier stage has long been passed there are no doubt in the gay crowd many profound thinkers numbers with unsatisfied longings and broken hearts but they are not obvious in the general cheerful absorption as to how much everything costs and everybody is worth the stranger also however much theoretically prepared experiences a shock in finding how little a population formed from manifold races has as yet amalgamated the owner of a shop for instance may not be able to speak even intelligibly the language of the country of his adoption depressing accounts were given of the type of man who thought it worth while to take up political life and the consequent short-sightedness of some of the legislative measures we were frankly told that we were much better off with our british monarchy 
and once an american-born citizen was even hurt to regret the war of independence with regard to the great war we were told that at that time ninety five per cent of the population of san francisco were pro ally though a few professors still looked to germany as the home of culture conversation on the subject was definitely discouraged and one man who spoke to us for a few minutes concerning the struggle ended by saying i have not talked so much about the war for months it was naturally impossible to appreciate at so great a distance the feeling which pervaded europe a high authority whom we consulted as to where we could see some indian life recommended us to go to a certain german mission and ask for hospitality from the fathers that we should prefer not to do so he obviously thought most narrow-minded affairs in mexico where some americans had just been killed by the insurgents were much more interesting even japan and australia appeared more closely connected with everyday life and not only seemed nearer than europe but than the eastern states themselves so was brought home the truth of the saying that oceans unite not divide also that the pacific and its seaboard are really an entity however much the atlas may prefer to give a contrary impression later it was impossible to think without deep sympathy of this young community plunged wholeheartedly with all its fresh ardor and keen intelligence into the solemn crucible of war we received welcome help and hospitality from mr ross our consul-general mr barnison the commodore of the leading yacht club and other kind friends mr adamson of messrs balfour and guthrie a firm allied to our chilean friends williamson and balfour came opportunely to our assistance when the censor felt that a cabled draft from england was too dangerous a document to pass without many days of consideration we were naturally much interested in making the acquaintance of our anthropological confrere of the university of california dr waterman and mr gifford and in hearing of their important work among the surviving indians a luncheon party at the university buildings at berkeley one of the suburbs on the other side of the bay was both pleasant and enlarging to the mind It is a mixed university, with some five or six thousand students, situated in beautiful surroundings and with an enviable library. One of the guests at luncheon was a German professor, who was at work in New Guinea when the war broke out. The account runs that the British troops, hearing there was an expedition in the mountains, went there expecting to encounter an armed force he was detained in california unable to get home christmas the third since we left england we spent in a hotel on the top of mount tamalpay which is on the other side of the golden gate and directly opposite to san francisco it is reached by a mountain railway and gives most beautiful panoramic views of ocean city and bay the management have hit on the ingenious plan of pointing out special sites by placing tubes on the walks round the mountain at the level of the eye oriented on particular places and labelled accordingly at night the scene is marvellous the city appears as a blaze of illumination and lights in every direction are reflected in the still water of the bay while on mount tamalpay we received a telephone message to say that manna was coming through the gate she had taken two days less to do the distance from honolulu than a four-masted bark which left about the same time we could not get down before her arrival so left mr gillam to grapple with the usual officials and not least with the reporters seventeen of whom he declared came on board we had had our share of the representatives of the press 
but any temptation to self-complacency would have been quenched by the knowledge that real success in newspaper paragraphs had already been achieved by the american cook who left in so summary a fashion at honolulu he had turned up from hawaii and given out that he had been obliged to quit the yacht because he could not stand a spook ship with skulls on board except by one christian science reporter scientific research was considered dull but this aspect of our work gave a hope of copy and we received a request from more than one agency that we would pose for moving pictures on the deck of the yacht exhibiting the said skulls to one another the pitcairn islanders almost rivalled the cook as objects of popular interest as the men had nothing to gain from notoriety we fixed a modest sum to be given them by each reporter whom they saw as might perhaps have been foreseen an interview then appeared without any such unnecessary preliminary as a previous conversation charles and edwin told us that the life of a great city surpassed even their expectations but it must be confessed that their most enthusiastic admiration was aroused by charlie chaplin as he appeared at the picture palaces the exhibition was just over and manna was moored alongside the now deserted buildings which even in their then condition were well worth seeing we had understood that there would be no difficulty about our new cook as he was not chinese and came from an american dependency but he was forbidden by the authorities to go on shore this ruling we had of course no means of enforcing and we found also that we were liable to a fine of over one hundred pounds if we could not produce him when we sailed it was not encouraging to be told that there were plenty of people who would entice him away for a share in the fine and it was a relief when manna at length sailed having all her crew safely on board it had been arranged that i was to return home overland in order to avoid the long hot voyage on the yacht and to put in hand preliminary arrangements there i left on january sixteenth taking the more southerly route across the continent a night was spent at santa barbara to see the mission buildings which are in the hands of one of the two remaining san franciscan communities the brother who acted as guide and who was of hungarian polish descent said that it had been instrumental in converting between four thousand and five thousand indians from santa barbara the route runs to los angeles which forms a winter resort for various Central American millionaires. A detour was made to the Grand Canyon, which is perhaps more impressive than beautiful, and so to Washington. A happy time was spent in seeing the city, and being shown over the National Museum by Dr. Walter Howe. The objects brought from Easter by the Mohican naturally proved of the greatest interest. At New York, the beautiful Natural History Museum excited admiration, and gratitude is owed for the kindness of Dr. Lowy. At that time, we were considering the question whether, owing to war conditions, to lay up or sell manna in New York. Nothing could have been kinder than the assistance given in my search for information by more friends than I can mention. It was finally, as will be seen, decided to bring her home. The crossing of the Atlantic in an American vessel was uneventful, and on Sunday, February 6, 1916, I found myself with an indescribable thrill at home once more in the strange New England of time of war, which was yet the dear familiar England for which her sons have found it worth while to fight, and if need be, to die. End of section twenty five. Section twenty six of The Mystery of Easter Island The Story of an Expedition. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of Easter Island, The Story of an Expedition by Catherine Rutledge. Part 4. The Homeward Voyage Continued. San Francisco to Southampton by S. R. Chapter 22. San Francisco to Panama. On the 20th of January, 1916, we left the harbor of San Francisco and proceeded to get well clear of the land, as the glass told us to expect a blow, and in due course it came, and plenty of it. We hove to for 24 hours, with oil bags to windward, for the seas were high and untrue. The weather then moderated, so we let draw and put her on her course, and were soon in a more pleasant climate. The Panama Canal had been closed to all traffic for many months past in consequence of landslides. Of course, Mana, drawing but 11 feet and only 72 feet on the waterline, would experience no difficulty in passing if the administration would permit her to do so. But would it? We had been unable to discover through any source in San Francisco whether we should or should not be allowed to traverse the canal. The only course left open to us was to go to the isthmus and see what could be done on the spot. If we could not get through, we must continue onward to the southern and go round the horn. Mr. Gillum and the owner were quite keen on doing so. Mr. Gillum thought it was only fair to the vessel, to give her a chance of showing what a good little ship she was. The crew, however, said they were quite satisfied on that point, and after three years of it, sighed only for Britain, beer, and beauty. So firmly were they convinced that our plucky sailing master would take her round the horn just for the sake of doing so, should he chance to come back alone without the owner, that, when they signed on again at Tahiti for the voyage home, it was subject to the proviso that the outside passage round Cape Horn should not be taken without their consent. So, from the so-called Golden Gate of San Francisco town to the real Balboa Gate of the Panama Canal, sailed we in the pious hope that something would turn up in our favor, and believing that it would do so, for the Mana is a lucky ship, and of course that something did. But other events, not devoid of interest, intervene and demand recital. At this point, political conditions must be referred to for the due understanding of our story. Absurd though it be, the fact remains that, just as England meekly allows herself to be bamboozled, robbed, insulted, and defied by one petty sans-culotte province, so do the United States submit to like treatment from Mexico. The same small delta that represents mathematically the consideration in which an Irishman holds the British government, may be said equally to symbolize the degree of respect in which the American eagle is held by the patriots of Mexico. Therefore, argued we, as the noble Mexican does not hesitate to pluck the eagle whenever that fowl comes hopping on his ground, Still less will he refrain from depilating the lion should he want some fur for fly-tying. No, we will give the coast of Mexico a good berth. A vessel like the Mana would at the moment have been an invaluable capture for the patriots, whose acquaintance we had no wish to cultivate. We thought of the many oared rowboats of the Rift Coast and how they could come at speed over the smooth windless sea and board us on either quarter. Of course, our motor would have been in our favor, but, all the same, discretion was perhaps better than valor, as we were unarmed. So we decided to keep 200 miles off the land in working down the coast of Lower California and Mexico, though it would have been better navigation and more interesting, to have come close in. The climate was now delightful, smooth water, gentle fair breezes. These conditions enabled us to capture all the turtle, and more than all, we wanted. They were asleep at the surface, the sea like glass, and heaving rhythmically. 
The undulations of a sea like this are so long and wide and gentle that one somehow ceases to regard them as waves and thinks of the movement of the water immediately around the craft as being only a local pulsation. We had noticed, from time to time, isolated seagulls heaving into sight on the top of the swell. Sometimes there would be as many as three or four within calling distance from one another. Each seemed to stand on a separate piece of driftwood, never two on the same piece. Some seemed occupied with affairs, swearing all the time, as seagulls always do. Some stood silently on one leg, a staring into vacancy, and thinking on their past. Some preened and oiled their feathers. We could not understand why there should be driftwood, all small and all over the place like this, so bore down on a sleeping bird, when, to our great surprise, we found that his resting place was the back of one of nature's U-boats, a turtle. Some may think, then, that all we had to do, if we wanted a turtle, was to approach a resting bird, but not a bit of it. If the bird, for reasons of his own, flew away from the back of the turtle, the turtle remained as before, nor did he even seem to draw the line at the profanity with which his visitor argued some point with the nearest neighbors. But let a boat approach, however gently and innocently, and the gull decide to clear, because he did not like the look of it, even as the bird did so, did Master Turtle down with his head and up with his heels, and where he had been, he was not, without a splash or a swirl or a bubble. If any failed to understand this description, he should betake himself to Africa and stalk rhino in high grass, whilst they have their red-billed birds in attendance scrambling all over their huge bodies hunting for ticks. Let but one bird spring up suddenly in alarm from a rhino's back, forthwith will occur proceedings that shall not fail to leave a lasting impression on the observer. When we wanted a turtle, however, we went to work in this way. The little twelve-foot dinghy, having two thwarts and a stern seat, was lowered from the starboard quarter and towed astern. A sharp lookout was kept ahead and to leeward for a turtle asleep on the surface. On one being sighted, the vessel was run off toward it. Simultaneously, the dinghy was hauled up alongside, and two of us, barefooted, dropped into her. She was then passed astern again and towed. One man sat in the stern sheets and steered with a paddle, having handy a strong gaff hook lashed on the end of the staff of a six-foot boat hook. The oarsman occupied the forward thwart with his paddles shipped in the rowlocks. The leather of the oars had been well greased previously so as to make no sound. The dinghy silently sped after the ship. On the vessel arriving within some fifty yards of the turtle, an arm on the quarter-deck was waved. The dinghy slipped her tow-line, the ship's helm was put up, and she edged off to leeward away from the fish, whilst the dinghy continued, under the way she carried, on the line of the vessel's former course, and therefore straight toward the turtle. On the sitter catching sight of the fish, if the boat was carrying sufficient way to bring him up to it, he laid aside the steering oar and at the right moment made a sign to his mate, who then gently dipped one of his paddles into the water. The boat, in consequence, made half a rotation, coming stern on to the turtle instead of bows on as previously. The oarsman then saw the fish for the first time and commenced to back her down with gentle touches of his two paddles right on to the top of the fish. Meanwhile, the sitter slid off the after seat, turned himself round so as to face the stern and knelt on the bottom of the boat with his knees placed well under the after seat, his chest resting on the transom, his arm outstretched over the water, rigidly holding the gaff extended like a bumpkin, with the point of the hook directed downward toward the water and about two inches above its surface. Now the old turtle is roosting on the water with the edges of his shell just awash, his dome-shaped back rising just clear of it and his head hanging downward in order that he may keep his brains cool. At the opposite end to his head is his tail. This detail may seem unnecessary, but it is not so. 
it is an essential point. When a turtle is surprised, he does not express it by throwing himself backward head uppermost onto his tail and show his white waistcoat and wave his arms in depreciation of the interview, but he downs with his head and ups with his heels and the tip of his tail, if you are able to recognize it, is the last you see of Master Turtle. And when he acts thus, he shows much decision of character. There is no hesitation. In a moment of time, he is absent. Hence, when you approach a turtle, you must first decide where away lies his tail, and so place your craft that her keel, and the turtle's spine, shall lie in the same straight line. Then, as she is back stern foremost toward him, the staff of the gaff is brought, by the movement of the boat, immediately above the length of his back. Now for it! The fisherman suddenly thrusts the gaff from him till the point of the hook is beyond the rim of the shell, raises his hand the least trifle so as to press the hook slightly, then savagely snatches the gaff backward, at the same time shortening his grasp on the shaft. The turtle awakes from his dreams to find that he is in a position in which he is helpless, standing on his tail with his back against the boat's transom and his four flippers out of the water. But he is not given time to think. As his back touches the flat end of the boat, the fisherman springs from his knees to his feet and, with one lusty heave, hoiks uncle up onto the edge of the transom and balances him there for the moment. Down goes the stern of the little boat, well toward water level under the combined weight of man and fish, then the slightest further pull, and into the bottom of the dinghy the turtle slides with a crash, whilst the fisherman, whose only thought now is for the safety of his toes, gracefully sinks down upon the middle thwart, takes hold of the gunwale with either hand, and hangs one bare leg overboard to starboard and the other to port, until the turtle has decided in which part of the boat he proposes permanently to place his head. Slowly he opens and closes his bill, shaped like the forceps of a dentist, and slowly he blinks his ein, as much as to say, Just put a foot in my neighborhood, or even one big toe. Turtles have no charity. The turtle and the fisherman have engrossed one another's attention so far, but there are three other elements in the equation. They are A, the boat, B, the boatman, and C, the shark. Each of these requires a word in passing. Now a 12-foot dinghy, like any other of God's creatures, has feelings. These it expresses, amongst other ways, when treated unreasonably, by capsizing, and turtle catching it puts in the neighborhood of the limit. Not infrequently, it happens that the long black fin of a San Francisco pilot comes mooching around at a turtle hunt, as if to incite the long-suffering dinghy to show temper. Hence, it is sometimes quite interesting to view, from the ship, the sympathetic way in which the oarsman exerts himself to humor every whim of the little boat in order to induce it to maintain its center of gravity during the scrimmage. He quite seems to have the idea in his head that, with a shark assisting at the ceremony, a capsize would be anything but a joke for him. Anyhow, it is all right this time, so we make for the vessel, now gently rising high on the top of the swell, anon slowly sinking until only her vein is visible. Leo! Round she comes! Let the stay sail bide! As she loses her way, the dinghy shoots up toward her, a line comes flying in straightening coils from the bows of the ship and falls with a whack across the dinghy's nose. The oarsman claps a turn with it around the forward thwart and quickly gets his weight out of her bows by shifting to the middle thwart before the strain comes. At the same time, the fisherman nips aft whilst keeping an eye on Master Turtle's jaws, squats on the after seat, picks up an oar and shears her in toward the ship. Then a strop falls into the stern sheets. The oarsman slips it over a hind flipper. One of the dinghies falls is swayed to him. He hooks it into the strop, and up runs Bob a turtle to be swung inboard the next moment into the arms of the Japanese cook, who receives him with a Japanese smile as he bears his sniggery snee. 
We had now been more than a fortnight at sea. After a run of this length, we generally found it well to touch somewhere to refresh. The chart showed ahead of us the island of Socorro, which we could fetch by edging off a little. The sailing directions told us it was uninhabited and rarely visited, that there was no fresh water on it, but nevertheless that sheep and goats were to be found, and that landing was possible. The early morning of February the 5th showed its single lofty peak standing out clearly above the lower mist and in a line with our bowsprit, whilst a light breeze on our quarter made us raise it fairly fast. In the chart room, we pored over the only chart we had, a small scale one, using it for what it was worth to elucidate the sailing directions. These indicated an anchorage and landing place on its southwestern side, poor but possible, and no outlying dangers. We therefore decided to examine that coast and see what we could find in the way of anchorage and landing facilities. At the same time, the conversation turned on the apparent excellence of the place as a gun-running depot for the Mexican revolutionaries and the exceeding awkwardness of our position if we suddenly shoved our nose into any such hornet's nest. The powwow finished. Up the ladder we tumbled onto the quarter-deck and turned to the island, and lo! Round a point was emerging a something, first appearing as a boat with bare masts, then as a boat with sails, she has presumably come out under oars and is now getting the canvas on her. She has seen us making for the island and is clearing out. They are at the game then, after all. Now she grows into a vessel under canvas. Now she fades away. No ship had we seen since getting well clear of San Francisco. We could make nothing of her in the haze and the mirage, for the air was all a-quiver with the heat. The general opinion seemed to be that she was a small schooner sailing with her arms akimbo, which, with the wind as we had it, was impossible. Anyhow, she was approaching us rapidly in the teeth of the wind, goose-winged, but anything seems to our mariners possible in these er fern parts. But alas for romance! Gradually, she revealed herself through the haze as a tramp steamer with a high-deck cargo. Her black hull and black painted mast tops, as she opened the land and partly showed her length, had made her the small boat with bare pole masts. Afterwards, when she shifted her helm and came toward us bows on, she became the small schooner running before a fair wind off the land her light-colored deck cargo, high-built up, and white-painted bridge formed the goose wings extended on either side of the black masts that rose above them and stood out distinctly against the sky. We kept our course. She passed us close to starboard. We ran up our ensign and number and asked her to report us, but she took no notice. Only one man was seen aboard her, we thought at the time she was from the canal, but afterwards learnt that nothing had come through it for several months, also that a somewhat similar vessel had, in May last, lain for a month off Socorro, to admire the scenery. We closed with the land at its western extremity about 3 p.m., and then slowly ranged along the southwestern shore, examining it carefully with the glasses for indications of a landing place. The water was smooth and crystal clear, and the sun behind us, so that comfortably ensconced in the foretop, we could see well ahead in the line of the ship's progress and to a great depth. We were able, therefore, without risk, to hug the shore and to examine it with precision. Everywhere was the same low cliff. On its top, scrubby vegetation with a sheen like the foliage of the olive, sage bush. Immediately below this, a broad scarlet band, disintegrated lava, then a grayish red or black cliff wall of igneous rock. At its foot, a snow-white girdle of foam from the ocean swell dashing against it. So we progressed until we reached what we decided must be Braithwaite Bay at the southwestern corner of the island. The sailing directions gave this as the only anchorage. 
Mr. Gillum jumped into the dinghy and pulled in to examine it, whilst we followed her in very slowly with the ship. A couple of whales seemed to find the floor of the bay quite to their taste as a dressing room. The huge fellows quietly spouted and wallowed, a cleaning of themselves, and took no notice of us. The dinghy did not like the look of things for either landing or anchorage, so held up an oar. Thereupon we put the ship round and went out on the same track as that on which we had entered. Nightfall was now approaching. We picked up the dinghy and stood off a bit, and then hove to. Now, immediately before reaching Braithwaite Bay, we had noticed in the coastline, from the masthead, an indentation or small inlet, across which there was no line of breakers. Also, we had observed a remarkable white patch set deeply into the land apparently at the head of this indentation. Of these points, presently. During the night, whilst hove to some distance off, the watch picked up a beautifully modeled, painted and weighted decoy duck, with the initials H.T. cut into it. This wooden fowl, we concluded, had drifted down from San Francisco, for there they are largely used in duck shooting. It had broken its anchoring line, been swept through the Golden Gate, and then by the prevailing winds and currents, carried to the point where we had picked it up. The find was interesting, as showing that our navigation was correctly based for current. With the daylight, we again stood in, this time toward the inlet, and after an early breakfast, the cutter was swung out. A breaker of water, a cooking pot or two, a watertight box of food, another containing ammunition, the photographic and botanical outfits, and a Mauser rifle in its watertight bag were put into her, and, with five hands, we started off. As we approached the break in the cliffs, we again met our two friends of yesterday, the whales. They had shifted their ground and were now right in the entrance to the cove, so we had to lay on our oars for quite a while until they gradually moved away. It was most interesting to watch the great brutes comparatively close alongside, yet absolutely indifferent to, or unaware of, the boat's presence. Certainly we kept quiet and did not allow objects in the boat to rattle or roll. Sound waves are transmitted through the water just as they are through the air. Each of these fish would have been worth a thousand pounds, at least at pre-war prices. Life is full of vain regrets. Our break in the cliff proved the entrance to a fissure in the landmass comparatively far extending. On either hand, it had nearly vertical cliff walls, and these again had steep ground above and behind them. It had a regular, gradually rising bottom, deep water at the entrance, and at the head a shelving beach of sand and small stones, yet steep too enough to allow the cutter to float with only her nose aground. Not a trace of swell, an ideal boat harbor. As it had no name, and is today undefined in the Admiralty plan of Braithwaite Bay, we christened it Cruising Club Cove, dropping the royal for the gain of alliteration. As we lay off the entrance, waiting for the whales to shift, many and varied were our speculations as to what the white object, previously referred to as situated at the head of the cove, could possibly be. Not till we were close up did we make it out. It then proved to be a red-painted boat covered with a white sail. Now a dry torrent bed forms the head of our little fjord. The detritus brought down by the torrent is spread out as a small, flat, channel-cut plain that meets the sea with a fan-shaped border. Onto this flat, the mystery boat was hauled up, but only to just above high water mark. Close to her side was a grave with wooden cross. From her bows hung a bottle closed with a wooden plug and sealed with red paint. Keenly interested in it all, we disturbed nothing so that we might the better be able to piece together the evidence after gathering all we could. She was evidently laid up, practically new, 
amateur built, her material New Deal house flooring boards, flat bottomed, sharp at both ends, dory type. Left as she was, the surf of the first gale from the south would lift her. They must have been either weak-handed to leave her close to the water's edge like that, or else they had been in a great hurry to get away. No painter and anchor was laid out to prevent her floating off. No seaman would leave a boat thus unsecured, for there was cordage in her. Her sail was cut out of an old sail of heavy canvas belonging to some big ship. They had ship's stores to draw upon. Casting around, we soon found a track running through the sage bush scrub. Following this trail for a few yards, we came to a large flat-topped rock beside which it ran. On this rock stood conspicuously another bottle, sealed. The path now began to rise sharply, wending betwixt large rock masses. Then it suddenly terminated in a rift in the cliff face, which formed a high but shallow cave or grotto. Rough plank seats and bunks were rigged up around, fitted under or betwixt the great rocks, some berths being made more snug by having screens of worn canvas. In the middle of the floor was a table, and in the middle of the table stood a sealed bottle and a box. The box was a small, square, round-cornered, highly ornamented biscuit tin of American make. It was three parts full of loose salt, bone dry, and on top of the salt was a wooden box of matches, bone dry and striking immediately. We emptied the salt onto the table, nothing amidst it. We broke the bottle and we found in it a scrap of paper. On this was written in ink a surname, the day of the month and year, the full initials of the writer, and these words. Look at our post office here. We then returned to the flat rock and broke that bottle. The message was the same. Then to the boat to find the message in its bottle was identical in terms, but written in pencil. Look at our post office. But where was the post office? Or what was the post office? The fragments of the broken bottle lay glittering on the grave at our feet. Was the grave the post office? We had most carefully examined and sounded the cave, and after our long experience of this class of work on Easter Island, felt fairly satisfied that the post office was not there. Every fire site we had suspected and inspected, every sinkage of the surface. Now we had to decide about the grave. The character of the vegetation showed that it was old and had not been disturbed within the date stated on the letters. A Spanish inscription in customary form, cut very neatly into the arms of the wooden cross, gave simply the name of the dead man and the date. At one time, the cross had been painted black. The point, however, that determined us to accept the burial as bona fide, and not to exhume it as a possible cache, was the fact that the sharp edges of the carving of the inscription were smoothly rasped away by the driving sand of the shore, in the direction of the prevailing wind, and to a degree commensurate with the date incised. And we were right in our surmises, Sufficient now to say that he whom the writing told to go to the post office was already lying in his own grave elsewhere, with his boots on, and no cross at his head. Life is held cheap in Mexico. End of section 26. Read by Carolyn Seifarth, April 2023.